Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Just a second. I'll, uh, uh, let me think. Stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? All like this. Okay. I'm not sharing anymore, right? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm not sharing. You can see me. Okay. Um, so we're here. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone. A special greeting, greeting to students who are attending from Ireland. Given today, 17th of March is St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> My name is Vanda Balzano and I teach in the Department of Women, Gender and um, Sexuality at, at Wake Forest University. Welcome to the 20, 2023 International Student Research Symposium on Gender and Sexuality, which this year <clears throat> has the official name of No Turning Back, the Future of Feminist Politics and Social Justice. As members of the organizing committee, we wish to express much appreciation for all the participants, moderators, special speakers, and attendees of this symposium, which this year is in its 11th year. Student research and participation in symposiums is, <clears throat> is meaningful for several reasons. Um, it provides students with the opportunity to develop critical thinking, research, presentation skills, it allows students to showcase their research and creativity to a wider audience. It fosters a sense of community among students and encourages them to engage in interdisciplinary conversations, which can broaden their perspectives and knowledge. It can help advance the field by introducing new ideas, approaches and perspectives. We are therefore grateful uh, to students over the years for their dedication and contributions, which have been instrumental in keeping the tradition of the symposium alive. So I will ask my colleagues and co-organizers to introduce themselves and say a few words, but I would be remiss if I didn't thank um, the sponsors and supporters of the symposium, which are growing in number and in solidarity every year. So this symposium was born out of a collaboration uh, between the Divinity School uh, and the Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, which was a program uh, at the beginning at Wake Forest. And during the isolating period um, of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we realized we could collaborate. This is the silver lining. <laughs> we could collaborate with institutions outside of the United States via Zoom. So this year, um, we, you know, we've, we collaborated with the Santana Institute in Sorrento. And then this year, we also invited the Institute for Women's Studies at the University of Georgia to join us. So we have a lot of supporters to thank. First and foremost, much appreciation goes to the Humanities Institute at Wake Forest. Their support, which was made possible by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, has been consistent over the years. We also want to thank at Wake Forest, the Smith Reynolds Library, Eureka, the Program for Leadership and Character, and the Interdisciplinary Arts Center. We always cherish the support of um, the Anna Julia Kuber Center and greatly value all the individuals who are behind and at the forefront of these institutes and programs. The symposium is a labor of love, and uh, I want to express gratitude to all the generous colleagues who have worked hard also to publicize the event, in particular Shelley Sizemore and the women of the Women's Center and Amy Mepham of the Humanities Institute of Wake Forest. Special acknowledgement also goes to Preston Neal for the technical support. Kimberly Thornton Shaw uh, from the Humanities, Humanities Institute, who is helping us create and maintain the last 10 years of symposia archives. 
I'm grateful for my colleagues in the organizing committee. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I will ask uh, Marco Marino from the Santana Institute to introduce himself. Thank you very much, Wanda, for uh, this introduction. My name is Marco Marino. I'm the Vice President of Academic Affairs at the Santana Institute in Sorrento, Italy. We organize uh, study abroad programs in partnership with many uh, US schools. Uh, and for sure, Wakeforest is one of our main partners. In the past, with the Italian Studies Department, and now with Gender Studies and English Department. In particular, uh, we organize uh, a faculty program in the summer with uh, Vanda Balsamo and other colleagues called uh, uh, Learning Under Vesuvius, so LUV in acronym. And uh, gender, for sure, gender studies, for sure, they represent a strong component of this uh, uh, program. So thank you, Wanda, again for inviting me. And uh, we are very happy and proud to support this initiative. We organize, co organized with Wake Forest a couple of very successful edition of this uh, uh, symposium in 2021 and 2022. So we are very happy to be here again in 2023 to support this uh, initiative. Also because, you know, gender studies and human rights represent uh, very strong areas of interest for us and our academic offerings in terms of classes and leadership for credit as well. So thank you again, Wanda. Thank you, uh, Wake Forest, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for this uh, event. I said all these wonderful things, but I was muted and you did not hear them. Um, I'm Jeff Solomon. I am an associate professor of English and Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Wake Forest University. It's been my great pleasure to assist um, my colleagues here in putting on this fantastical um, symposium. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the feminist art shelf this is the first time that we've had a feminist art shelf at the WGSS Symposium. It is a newly designated space featuring art, all kinds of art forms. The conference program has created a digital folder to showcase these submissions with the aim of fostering creativity and sparking discussions among attendees and beyond. This initiative provides an opportunity for young or youngish artist pra art practitioners to gain exposure. In collaboration with the Wakefield Arts Festival, the Feminist Art Shelf is currently accepting submissions for the entire month of March 2023. If any of the symposium attendees would like to participate, they need to send their submissions to the organizing committee's email at research symposium 2023 at gmail.com. And I will um, put that address in the chat. On that note, um, my name is William Boyce. I'm the Faith and Health Postdoctoral Teaching Fellow and Scholar at Wake Forest University. I'm located in the School of Divinity and also working on a project with the Faith Coordinating Center funded by Gilead Sciences, um, looking at health inequities and destigmatization of HIV in the American South, particularly among communities of color and those who've been underserved historically by the medical system. Um, I suppose, Wanda, I could begin by providing an introduction to um, our esteemed keynote morning speaker, <clears throat> uh, Ms. Um, Eric Erin uh, Adamson. So let me read the bio that I have here. Erin <clears throat> Adamson is the Associate Director of, of Leadership and Character in the Professional Schools. Erin is a highly relational educator and project manager with eight years of experience in teaching and facilitating programs for diverse audiences in higher education and nonprofit organizations. <clears throat> Prior to her current role, she served as interim director of Wake Forest Women's Center, where she oversaw the operational, programmatic, and advocacy initiatives. She earned her BA in Spanish. Uh, from Spelman College and her MA in English Linguistics from North Carolina State University. Erin is an empathetic leader with passion and a firm belief in social transformation through educational experiences, um, which 
says it all. So on that note, um, and with much gratitude for your um, participation uh, um, this morning, we'd I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much, William. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am excited to be here, and I'd like to offer my own welcome to you all um, as we start this 2023 Wake Forest University Symposium on Gender and Sexuality. Um, we are in the 11th annual year, and it's worth noting, um, as Professor Balzano mentioned, some exciting changes. Um, this year, we get to be virtual intentionally. Um, we're using the digital technology at our fingertips to work collaboratively and to unite around subjects of gender and sexuality from global perspectives. Um, Wake Forest has partnered with the University of Georgia and Santana Institute in Italy, and I want to extend a warm welcome to all representing those institutions. I would also like to acknowledge all the work of the organizing committee members, so Wanda Balzano, William Boyce, uh, Marco Marino, Patricia Richard, and Jeff Solomon, uh, none of this would be possible without you uh, to have a symposium of this scale and of, of this level. Um, the, this year's theme, No Turning Back, the Future of Feminist Politics and Social Justice. Um, I wanted to really explore what does that relationship mean? What is the relationship between feminist politics and social justice? Um, Bell Hooks reminds us that a genuine feminist politics always brings us from bondage to freedom, from lovelessness, lovelessness to loving, and there can be no love without justice. She reminds us that our political orientation correlates with our external environment. We must be earnest in our pursuit of feminist politics because therein lies the path to freedom and justice. And there is no path to feminist liberation that doesn't involve the dismantling of systemic oppressions. Therefore, this year's theme, No Turning Back, the future of feminist politics and social justice serves as both an anchor to ground academic pursuits, but also a rallying cry. If within feminist politics lies the key to justice, we can't turn back, not in the face of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, not when successes of the LGBTQ plus movements are under attack, not when we see the faces of our sisters in Iran fighting for women's rights, and not when human rights violations in Russia flood our TV screens. In the face of continued racial injustices, gender-based violence, and sexual exploitation, we cannot turn back. For we know that injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere, and we must march forward. But what lies ahead? What is the future of feminist politics? I will tell you honestly, I don't know. I only know that our continued investment in social justice provides a brighter future than accepting the status quo. We must continue asking questions, interrogating the social, political, and ethical foundations of our lives. We must continue reflecting on how to create and cultivate new systems of growth and care. We must continually be attuned to our own positionalities as we sit at the intersections of social justice, international development, and our own personal development. And today, we will practice some of that work by exploring ethnographies of the self while singing reclamations of our language, history, and well-being. We will reject stereotypes and follow in the examples of feminist resistance. We will embrace women in positions of leadership while advocating for reproductive freedoms. I know to reach a place where justice reigns, we must work in partnership. Today, I stand before you representing one of the co-sponsors of this event, the Program for Leadership and Character. The Program for Leadership and Character inspires, educates, and empowers leaders of character to serve humanity. Through innovative teaching, creative programming, and cutting edge research at Wake Forest, we, um, cutting edge research, we aim to transform the lives of students, foster an inclusive, inclusive culture of leadership and character at Wake Forest, and catalyze a broader public conversation that places character at the center of leadership. The program is committed to developing leaders of character to carry us to a more just future. Through funding for the program, um, we've had law professor Abby Perdue design a new course, Women Leadership, Character, and the Law. And another law professor, Megan Booth, created a class called Reproductive Rights, Leadership, and Advocacy. Previously, a, a program's a postdoctoral fellow, Stephanie Moda Thurston, designed and taught a course in the Divinity School titled Character in the Good Life, 
negotiating questions of race, class, and gender. And just last month, at the annual Law Review Symposium, we hosted a panel, Women Leading in the Law, that examined the distinctive opportunities and challenges women leaders face in legal professions. We, as a program, are honored to be co-sponsors to today's event, and we are excited to continue supporting this important work. And while we must continue working and striving forward, we cannot neglect ourselves. We must make space and room for rest to restore and create. I would be remiss if I did not honor the feminist art shelf, as, as, it, as it already has been mentioned, a digital space for viewing and discussing student art inspired by the theme of the conference. Revolutions are sparked and also sustained through creativity and inspiration. Before I go, I hope you all will indulge me in a brief centering activity. Place one hand above your heart and close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Um, connect with the one within. With each breath, say the name of someone who inspires you to keep going. Say the name of someone who reminds you that turning back is not an option. Say the name of someone who is relentless in their fight for social justice. And then remind yourself that you are all of those people and speak your own name. Go ahead and open your eyes. It has been a true privilege to address you all today. I look forward to all the exciting presentations our students have prepared. They are setting the tone for our collective future. And I know we are in capable hands to lead us where we all will go next. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful introduction. Um, really practicing presence and, and gratitude and leadership. Um, and on that note, it's a beautiful introduction to the rest of, uh, of the symposium. Uh, really reminding us that we can't go back and we must go forward with the symposium as well. Thank you so much, uh, Erin, for this wonderful uh, introduction. And so we will, uh, um, we will uh, close this session because these are linked, these are windows <clears throat> into the symposium. And so we will uh, connect again at 9.30 with the other link. Thank you so much. That's a very beautiful introduction. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Hello, Nathan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, Nathan, I really like that. Oh, thank you. The uh, last seminar didn't start. Oh, hi, Rocco. Marco, may I present Nathan Thomas, who is our um, host? Hello. Nice to meet you, Nathan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, thanks. Hi, Gabby. Finally, we meet in person, even if online. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, of course. Gabby, where are you joining us from? Sorry, I was getting set up there with pulling up the presentation. I'm on campus right now, so East Coast time zone. Uh, see, here I was expecting you to be from Malta or <laughs> somewhere interesting. So no. but I'm, I'm happy to speak to someone on campus. <laughs> Mark.
Marco, how long have you and Vanda been doing the um, seminar? Uh, with Vanda, about this uh, uh, specific event, we started in uh, April in 2021. But before that, we organized many joint activities with the uh, Wake Forest and Santana. Uh, not symposia, but colloquia in uh, gender studies, not for students, but for uh, faculty. Yes. So if you are from North Carolina originally, or? Oh, no. I, I didn't mean it like that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually was um I actually was brought up on the East Coast, but I ran away and kind of lived in Los Angeles from gosh, the age of 20 on. So I then was there for like 30 years or however old I am, 20 years. So hmm. Is he frozen for everyone or just for me? Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Do you guys know each other? Yes, actually. We took an anthropology class together last year. Yeah. Oh, cool. What anthropology class was that? Culture. Uh, oh, sorry. Linguistics, yeah. It was actually a culture and nature class. Oh, Dr. Dr. Sorry. oh I guess we were in... Were you, were, were you in vendors, culture? language and culture? Yeah, okay. I guess yeah. we had two classes. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wonder how many of my professors from college I would actually remember by name. <laughs> I have kind of like a picture of some of them, but their actual names is long gone. So. <laughs> I'm sure but you that, remember your favorite classes. I'm kind of a trauma-based person, so I more remember the classes that were not my favorite. <laughs> no, of course, I do remember. I do remember my favorite classes. <laughs> Hello, Professor Balzano. Hi. <laughs> um, trying to see. <clears throat> Let me see. I'm meeting. Sorry, I'm here, here again. Some uh, just some uh, connection issues. Are we all here? Let me see. Please check. I think we're waiting for two panelists. <clears throat> Rachel, yeah, I think um uh, uh, yeah, I think Matteo Botto won't be able to join us, unfortunately. Hmm. Yes, so it's correct. We only have uh Rachel and Gabby. Waiting for Rachel. It's always effective to make everyone wait for you. I always do that. So, see you. Mm. So Marco, I think you were telling us how um, you and Vonda got started working on the colloquia together when, when the connection issues phased out. Uh, yes, we started in, in, with that in 2020. Remember, Vanda? With the first, uh, we were in the mid, in, yeah, 100% in the middle of the COVID pandemic, and it was the only way to survive you know, by organizing uh, joint activities online. You remember the first colloquium, Vanda, in uh, uh, July 2020? <laughs> Yes, I do. Sorry, I was I had to unmute myself very well. But um, it's both, uh, you know, 
this COVID days, I mean, it's both far and close. I don't know, it's strange. Let me check if uh, Rachel sent an email to us. One sec. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, great. So this panel will have um, um, I mean, I trust the moderator will announce the panel, and I'm grateful for the moderator. I only want to say that um, Matteo Botto from the University of Genoa, unfortunately, can't join us. But uh, also uh, the other thing, logistics. Maybe when the speaker, the you know, we will uh, mute. I mean, we will mute ourselves and uh, take the screen off. I mean, the, turn off the video when we let the speaker talk. Um, that's what we we are going to do, but um, so we have more time, and then there will be you know time for questions. But then we are done when we are done. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Nathan, you can uh, proceed. All right. Thank you. Um, well, welcome. This is session one: ethnographies of the self, deconstructing the mirror and the gaze. Uh, we will, it goes from uh, 9.30 to 10.30, over the course of which we'll have two presentations of 10 minutes each. After each presentation, we'll have five minutes for questions. Um, our first presentation is, can pleasure activism be a solution to the incel crisis, given by Gabriela Valencia. Gabriela Valencia is a senior majoring in anthropology and minoring in Latin American studies, English and history at Wake Forest University. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, so I'm going to get set up here, sharing the screen. Is it looking good from your guys' end? Awesome. Okay, so yes, as Nathan said, hi, I'm Gabby, pronouns she, her, senior at Wake Forest University. There we go. Today, we're going to talk about the incel crisis, and we're going to consider Adrian Marlene Brown's pleasure politics as one solution that tackles at least one specific angle of the crisis. So as a brief introduction, incels or involuntary celibates are found on forums like Reddit and 4chan. They tend to be cis heterosexual men who use these platforms to voice their frustration at women for refusing to have sex with them. These forums often radicalize men to the point where they sometimes even enact physical violence against women. The original incel platform was originally formed by a progressive bisexual woman named Alana who was not given her last name to most media outlets for privacy presentations, but she formed this platform in 1993 and intended to create a forum for lonely people who struggled to initiate romantic relationships so that they could connect and form community. However, over time, it has morphed into one of the internet's most dangerous subcultures and inhabited by tens of thousands of misogynists. So first we're going to talk about some of the ideologies that incels have created in order to have context for the harm that they have enacted. So incels have invented a hierarchy in which sexually prolific men known as chads and attractive women who are referred to as Stacy's are at the top of the social order. Incels are convinced that about 20% of the population is made up of chads and they think about 80% of women are only interested in having sex with men who are labeled as chad. And to account for the fact that most heterosexual men 
end up in relationships, incels claim that about 20% of women will consent to sex with the vast majority of men known as betas who fall somewhere in the middle of this attractiveness tier that they have created. They, incels claim that women pursue a mating strategy known as alpha fucks in which women desire alpha chads, but they use betas for financial stability. Women in relationships with betas are perceived to be typically unfaithful. And so the core of this absurd hierarchy is that incels have placed themselves at the bottom of the social order. They see themselves as so intrinsically, fundamentally undesirable that they can never convince any woman to have sex with them. And this causes extreme rage and frustration. So obviously this ideology relies on the premise that all women are cruel and shallow. Incels blame their inability to get laid on unchangeable physical features like their height or facial structure rather than their rampant misogyny. So additionally, yeah, women are viewed as caricatures, sex crazed narcissists rather than people with actual desires for respect. Incels even call women femoids to make them sound more robotic rather than people. So clearly incels believe that women do not deserve any autonomy over their own bodies. They resent feminism because they view that movement as they see any female empowerment really as emasculating. They want complete control over women's bodies in the name of their own personal pleasure. Some incels go as far to call for state mandated girlfriends as solutions to their loneliness. So unsurprisingly, this violent ideology results in physical violence. So two particularly heinous examples were well, one, it has to do with Elliot Rogers, who was a 22-year-old man who killed six people and injured 14 others with two knives, a handgun, and his motor vehicle in 2014 at UCSB, or UC Santa Barbara in California. Before his death, he uploaded a video to YouTube explaining his misogynist motives. He also emailed a 141 page long autobiographical manuscript to explain his deep seated loathing for women primarily caused by his frustration over his virginity. And Elliot Rogers is hailed as a hero within the incel community and his face is often photoshopped onto old paintings of Christians saints. He has overshadowed Alana's considered the true founder of the incel community in its current form. Rogers has inspired other incels to commit similar acts of violence. In April of 2018, Alec Minician posted on Facebook, the post that you guys see here, the incel rebellion has already begun. We will overthrow all the Chads and Stacys, all hail the Supreme Gentleman Elliot Rogers. Shortly afterwards, he drove a van down a crowded street and killed 10 people in Toronto, Canada. So even though incels tend to be some of the most privileged members of society, they feel like they are marginalized. Although they live in a society that exists to benefit them, they still feel like they are oppressed because people refuse to sleep with them. Since incels perceive themselves to be undesirable, they feel like they are less confident, they are less confident than the cis white heterosexual men they feel like they're supposed to be, and they blame other people for this feeling of patheticness. They because they are, they feel like they are denied what they owed that since they are the most privileged members of society and believe they are entitled to these things, they are extremely angry. Like in the video before that Rogers posted before his massacre, he used terms like crime and injustice over and over again to describe his 
situation. So Rogers has convinced himself that he is enacting a warped sense of just or yes, justice. Okay, so now we will talk about pleasure activism and the ways in which this can be one framework to tackle the ideologies that incels have adopted. So incels look to alt-right forums to convince them of their worth as people instead of just accepting the idea that all people have inherent dignity by virtue of the fact that they are people. They treat sex like something they are owed rather than a privilege that is earned and believe they are entitled to women's bodies. So these forums encourage incels to channel their anger against women rather than the patriarchy, which is what creates these pressures for men to live up to in order to feel masculine enough. So obviously like getting off these platforms is the first step, but I think Adrian Marlene Brown's idea of the pleasure politics needs to be more pervasive since sexual desire tends to be what most people focus on when they're talking about desire at all. And it's a framework that should be more present in the media and therapy and households when raising children. So essentially, Brown argues that pleasure is something everyone has access to, and people become more liberated when they claim this pleasure. Brown underscores that pleasure is generated internally rather than, yes, rather than being something that is contingent upon access to other people's bodies. So yes, people, all people are deserving of pleasure, but it must be a pleasure that exists outside of infringing upon other people's autonomy. Desire must be decolonized. And it is important for all people to know and truly believe that they can obtain pleasure in a way that is both conducive to them, but also not harmful to others. So first, pleasure even erotic pleasure can exist outside of sex is something that Brown argues, like one quote from her work, pleasure politics, the politics of feeling good is that there are many activities that make people feel good, such as drugs, fashion, humor, work, connection, reading, cooking, eating, music, and other arts. So people can use these types of activities as healthier avenues of building communities and com com <laughs> confronting loneliness. Pleasure brings people contentment and fulfillment. So it is important to find pleasure in other activities aside from sex. And once people can rely on themselves for satisfaction, they're likely to have healthier, more positive relationships with others. So those are the main ways that I feel like it is applicable. But I also really want to mention that this is an extension of Brown's ideas. She coined the term like pleasure activism to discuss the ways in which fighting oppression should be pleasurable. So she really wanted to center people of color. But it's something that is definitely beneficial for everyone to adopt. Even though like in the original sense, it was mostly used to indicate that people of color do radical work when they claim pleasure in their own daily lives. And that is it for me. Here's some of the references that I use. Do any of you guys have questions? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Gabriella. Um, and yeah, if there's any questions, now would be the time. Yes, Rachel. Um, hi, thanks for a great presentation. It's super interesting. Uh, makes me want to read the book um, that you mentioned. 
Um, I was wondering um, with the incels being a pretty privileged group in society, how, in your opinion, how do you convince them that they can achieve this sort of liberation independently of any other outside interactions? Yeah, I, obviously it's like definitely a community effort. I feel like a lot of, okay, sorry. So to rephrase your question, are you like asking how to convince incels to adopt pleasure activism or like? Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. I think like if there's different focuses maybe like in the media and like music and stuff of like other types of fulfillment rather than focusing on the importance of sexual pleasure. That might be something that just changes general cultural attitudes. I think it's important to like talk about in school and a lot of people who interact with children, teenagers, people, like when they're raising them, like these are important types of conversations to have. I don't know that fully answers. No, that was good. Thank you very much. Also, if anyone from the from the audience uh, um, would like to ask a question, we can uh, uh, have it in the chat. I see that Jeff <laughs> would like to talk. When does Jeff not like to talk? Um, so my question is, so, you know, Amiya Srinivasan writes that beautiful The Right to Sex article about the Elliot Rogers case, which I recommend if you haven't taken a look at that. But, yeah. you know, one of the horrible paradoxes of um, incel culture is that these are men who are really oppressed by the patriarchy that is uh, making them be such horrible people, you know, and that Elliot Rogers, you know, himself is kind of like a, a mixed race effeminate man is really kind of tortured by the fact that he doesn't have access to these women that he feels are on the, the top of like the desirability hierarchy at the same time that like, he himself is, is, is ranked very low on that kind of patriarchal desirability hierarchy. And she points out that, you know, what would really have helped Elliot Rogers would have been feminism, as opposed to, you know, signing up for like a standard of values that he was not going to do well on. And I was just wondering, I mean, I know that pleasure activism is really, you know, is to an extent aimed at women of color, but it's also meant to kind of apply to everyone. So I wonder if you've thought about how would one bring like an insult to pleasure activism because they certainly need something because they're violent, terrible men, but they're also like violently unhappy. And it's true that they're not having any sex. So is there a way that kind of you can put these two groups together in a productive way, do you think? Hmm. Well, I guess like, obviously, yes, our step is getting off the platforms, like people can like somehow block that stuff. But I think, I guess it is kind of hard to push people to take that initial step of adopting or like trying to find pleasure outside of sex. But once like people are at least willing to try, I feel like some of it sort of takes care of itself if you're able to find fulfillment in other hobbies or maybe like framing it in a way where it discusses how or where it's clear that this could be a benefit to you, like bring you the contentment or the satisfaction that you are lacking. But yeah, no, I agree. It is it is hard to convince incels who are so deeply entrenched in these spaces and ideas to begin to deconstruct that and look to an alternative. Are there any more questions? 
All right. Um, and we'll move on to the next presentation, which is Authenticity in Art History, an Epistemic Consideration of, of Female Self-Portraiture, which will be given by Rachel Lisinski. Uh, Rachel Lisinski is a, recent, is a recent graduate of St. Louis University with undergraduate degrees in studio art and political science. Her artwork has been showcased internationally with features in the St. Louis University's home campus and satellite campus in Madrid, Spain. Her academic pursuits focus on the political dimensions of peace and the significance of memory and culture. She has presented research at the 2022 Notre Dame Peace Conference and the 2022 St. Louis Central Slavic Conference. Additionally, her participation in Alzheimer's advocacy and fundraising efforts since 2018 have shaped her, her, her artistic worldview. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, thank you for your time and showing up today for these um, lovely talks. I'm going to get my presentation set up in just a second. Start screen sharing. And then you guys let me know if you can see this. Good? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, let me get myself just a little bit more set up. So today we're going to be talking about authenticity in art history. Um, like I said, it's a an epistemic consideration of female self-portraiture. My name is Rachel Lisinski. Um, as a painter and political scientist who identifies with the female experience, the act of self-representation is paradoxically empowering, challenging, and very political. Um, and um, just as a quick uh, note for the presentation, I'm going to make a pointed effort to credit and cite artists and artwork as they uh, show throughout the presentation. So this is Self-Portrait in a Straw Hat from 1782 by Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun. The thesis is that female self-portraits are evidence of feminist disruption of hegemonic male status quo an aim to correct epistemic and hermeneutical injustices. Um, this is a self-portrait as a lute player by Artemisia Gentileschi from 1616. Um, later on, after the theoretical foundation, sorry, there's some sounds in my house. <laughs> um, there will be two different analyses of art. Um, one is going to be a study of allegory um, as interpreted by female um, Renaissance and Baroque artists. And then there will be a comparative analysis of biblical paintings through the lens of both the male and female gaze. So um, epistemic and hermeneutical injustices. Um, there, um, these uh, come from the theories of Miranda Fricker. Um, Concepts of epistemic injustice are concerned with an attack on an individual's competence and authenticity, um, and hermeneutical injustice fails to make sense of a certain marginalized social experience. So there is a limit to um, to both crediting someone and understanding someone's experience. And these are two different um, types of injustice, according to Fricker. Um, as along with Fricker, I stand on the shoulders of um, Haraway, Harding, and even Laura Mulvey in the, the theories that I will be citing in this presentation. Um, the self-portrait here is Adelaide Libiel Guillard, self-portrait with two pupils from 1785. Um, a theory of aesthetic authenticity. Um, authenticity in relation to art history, art historical representations of femininity are concerned with male power and the ignorance of men in relation to the reality of the female experience. Haraway insists um, in her theory that vision is always a question of power to see, and there is inherent violence in the hierarchy of power that comes with visualizing practices. Um, and then Di Carlos in the theory about aesthetic authenticity um, posits that art is created and assessed both out of a reaction against ignorance and particularly when it comes to depictions of the feminine and female representations in art history, particularly classical art history, there is no real um, understanding of what women were going through. And most of the time they were done by men. But here we have a lovely self-portrait of Frida Kahlo self-portrait with thorn necklace and hummingbird from 1940. I tried to get a good hundred, few hundred years of range in the artworks that are throughout the presentation. Um, so concepts of self and agency in the arts. Um, self-portraits are not only an avenue for active participation for female figurative painters, because um, 
especially pre uh, um pre the modern period it was not socially acceptable for female artists to utilize uh models of any gender so that really the only material they had was the paints and themselves so it was really resourceful for them to do self-portraits but also very political um the self should be an active agent in its own creation particularly when it comes to female uh participation in the arts and haraway um insists that there is no view from nowhere um there is no unmediated view especially in bodies of masculinity like the like the academies of science or the arts um this is a self-portrait um in the lower corner by judith leister a self-portrait from 1633 um and here we're going to start some painting interpretations um so we're going to start with the allegory of painting um there used to be a a picture of Cesar Ripa, who is the quote on this lower section, but I'm trying to exclusively show female art um, in this presentation. So um, and the allegory of a, in painting is an artistic personification of her human virtues like painting, poetry, or justice. Our focus will be allegory of a painting um, done by various artists in the following slides. And in the time of the late, um, the the early Baroque period, Cesar Ripa, an Italian icono iconographer and painter and theorist, claimed that the allegory of painting could be characterized by a woman whose mouth was tied, and that's the only time a woman could be depicted as allegory of a painting. So that shows in the time period that we're going to be uh, focusing on, which is about like the 16-1700s, women were meant to be seen and not really heard or understood or valued for anything they brought, more than their visual beauty. Um, and that's a lot of what the epistemic injustices we we're trying to fight in this presentation. Um, so the first set of paintings we're going to compare is Allegory of Painting by Jacob. Oh, there's missing an O in that name, Trovillet. Um, this is Allegory of a Painting from 1675 to 79. And then on the other side, we have an Artemisia Gentileschi self-portrait as Allegory of a Painting from 1638. Um, so just first off, we're going to compare and contrast these paintings just a little bit. Um, in the male, uh, the male depiction of femininity, the female is not actively painting. There's not actually a painting that she's working on in the composition that I can tell. Um, it looks like there's maybe some work in the background, but she has a book open and her paints are kind of set aside and she's not holding any paintbrushes and she's looking to her male counterpart for some guidance and he's showing her the way on the globe and teaching her the way and she's very clearly submissive and taking his guidance and not an active agent, uh, at least not a sole active agent in this painting. Um, on the other hand, Artemisia Gentileschi's self-portrait is active. She is not facing the viewer, nor is she even interacting with anybody but the canvas in front of her. You can see that she is actively putting paint to canvas and holding the palette hard at work. Um, Artemisia Gentileschi, her work alone is so very valuable in its feminist um, interpretations. There are many ways to interpret them, but I feel like at least to mention Artemisia Gentileschi's um, elevation as a fourth wave feminist icon in recent years has to be part of this conversation. Um, I'm not going to focus on her history. Um, it's it's very interesting. And if you feel so inclined, I can suggest books and podcasts that will, will get you into it. Um, but she is well known as a sexual assault survivor and the injustices in the time period that followed her throughout her life because of this are understood to make appearances as allegories in all of her paintings. So this um, is one of her uh, one of her works where this this tale of her own sexual assault and the references to it is pretty much absent, but in the rest of her works that we'll be talking about, there is um, some some spice added to that, given her um, history. Um, so now we're going to be looking at biblical stories, um, the biblical gaze, the male and female gaze. Um, this is another Artemisia Gentileschi work. This is uh, she did two versions of Susanna and the Elders. This is the later version will be um, analyzing the earlier version in the next slide. Um, but the male gaze was coined by Laura Mulvey in feminist film crit criticism and entails the commodification and possession of female bodies, um, usually for the benefit of men, whether it's for erotic pleasure or 
um, capitalist gain either way. Um, and representat representations of women's bodies are utilized for erotic conception within paintings, and they're usually in most art historical um, circumstances are enjoyed and created almost exclusively by men. Um, and their value is given uh, by a male um, industry. So it's there's a lot of gender politics when it comes to art history, but this is the very specific case that we're gonna be focusing on. So this is a comparison between Susanna and the Elders. Susanna and the Elders is a very popular biblical story and was painted a lot um, in, this um in this period because it allowed for a female nude in a common setting so Henrik Henrik de Klerk Susanna and the Elder she's leaning towards the man that's trying to take advantage of her she's not really trying to cover herself up she seems sort of passive doesn't really seem like there's a lot of conflict meanwhile in Artemisia Gentileschi's from 1610 there is a clear division between the men who are trying to antagonize her she's trying to cover herself up she's clearly upset and this um, this painting has been debated on whether or not it's a self-portrait of Artemisia. I am not going to claim that there is, but um, it's, uh, I think there's a clear distinction on how the, the female protagonist is interacting with the male antagonist in these works. Um, the second is my favorite, um, Judas Lang Hall Fernies. Um, the one on the left is by Peter Paul Rubens um, from 1616, and the one on the right is Artemisia Gentileschi's from 1612. Um, Rubens is clearly fleshier. The female protagonist is leaning again towards the man and the or towards the is that a man or a woman I don't know towards the aid in the scene and she's not looking at her attacker that she's trying to assault. She's looking at the viewer. It seems very sultry, not not focused on the work that she's doing. Meanwhile, um, in Artemisia Gentileschi's, both of the women are active. It's bloody. They're not concerned about how they look. It's very, very centered on the act of violence that they're um, that they're exerting control over. So there's a clear difference in these. And this Artemisia Gentileschi is one of my favorites. Um, so standpoint theory and self-portraits. Um, there's a lot that could be said, uh, but I know I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna try to keep it brief. Um, the significance of a female standpoint in art history not only challenges the one-dimensional idea, ideal of femininity, it also fights against the erasure of feminist participation in the arts by the exclusion of women by men um, throughout art history. Um, this is one of my favorite Angelica Kaufman pieces. Um, it's self-portrait of the art, artist hesitating between the arts of music and painting, and it just, this painting particularly shows that women artists, in fact, were trying to give themselves more agency. Um, in conclusion, self-portraits by artists who identify and portray themselves outside of the traditional gender binary, regardless of the time period, reveal the specific power of self-portraiture as a force to correct multifaceted injustices connected to processes of knowledge production, communication, and representation. Um, this is my question slide, and you are more than welcome to ask some questions. This is a my last self-portrait, um, and it's um, Elisabetta Sirini from 1658. So thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. Thank you, Rachel. Um, thank you very yeah. much. If there's any questions, uh, sound off. Well, I thank you guys for your time. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. Jeff, please take it away. <laughs> This is kind of a, this is a tough question, but um, so, you know, I, I really loved your presentation and I love seeing a lot of those works again. And um, you want I to love how Rubens makes, oh, I'm muted. No, I'm not. I love how Rubens makes the killer totally only interested in how she looks. Isn't but um, <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, I think you're, it's just totally clear how you're talking about these artists are working against the various expectations of their time period in terms of gender. And I wonder how you think that a female artist would do that now, now when feminist art is so kind of politicized already. And it's hard to say, you know, to like, to create an overtly work of feminist art as a, 
as a painter is de rigueur. It's almost kind of canonical. It's what you're supposed to do. So where do you see that same spirit of resisting kind of resisting contemporary, resisting cultural standards at the present moment since I'm about to repeat myself. So I No, I'm to... super jazzed that you asked this question. I am a painter myself. I try to keep my, my finger on the pulse of contemporary art as well. I can think of I can think of modern artists who I could do the same presentation with off the top of my head, and it could, would be a completely different presentation, but it would say the exact same thing. Um, female artists today are fighting the art establishment, so fighting the male gaze in the art establishment um, by being successful artists independent of a lot of uh, male-dominated institutions. Um, Female artists are working with smaller galleries to exert some more control over their work. Um, and they're actually like jumping out of the rat race, trying to get into like big museums like MoMA and stuff like that, because there is so little female representation, even after all these years, that artists are sort of taking back their time, taking back their energy, focusing on art that they want to create rather than what collectors want or what institutions want. And I think that's super empowering um, for a long time. Even in this time period that I'm talking about, even the best artists had to cater to patrons, had to cater to the nobility of the time, whoever had the money. And with the change in um, particularly the internet and with the change of exchange of um, arts materials, but also like media, when it comes to like paying for subscription services or classes or like online um, online interactions, um, female artists are not only like choosing to depict themselves in ways that they want, but being represented in the art world in the way that they want. So it's it's radical in a completely different way because women have so much more economic agency. Um, I could talk all day about this though. So like, I hope I answered your question. I could give you a whole list of artists if you're interested. I, yeah, I'm super thankful that you asked this question. Also, I would like to uh, bring attention to uh, Sue North. We have a question from the audience. Sue North uh -huh. asks, do you see anything uh, liberatory in our era of the selfie? So we're talking about social media. Yeah, she, yeah. Says, she says, I don't, but I would like to. <laughs> what do you think? I I very much understand that the selfie is kind of a conundrum. You know, there's a lot of pressure for women to look nice. There's a lot of pressure to like be a, to be within a certain beauty standard and the selfie puts a lot of pressure on the individual to to execute. Um but just like female painters, just like um really women in any period, you have to just take as do as much work as you can personally to detach yourself from those standards and embrace yourself as you are. I know that sounds like some um, self-help uh, guru stuff, but it really is how these painters, it's how they do this work. They work through the beauty standards. Um, and I think there really is a liberatory value in the selfie, whether or not um, whether or not an individual has done the personal work to examine the pressure of beauty standards on themselves. I think um, it's an avenue to work through a lot of that stuff. Um, Cindy Sherman's self-portraits are a wonderful example of the transformative power of a selfie. You know, there is um, there's a lot of power in choosing how you present yourself to the outside world. And I think the selfie is certainly, there's room for it to grow into more liberatory practice. I actually like the idea of what you're saying, that there is room <laughs> to grow. It's not perfect then, yet, yeah. <laughs> because it's a constant working towards, in a sense mm -hmm. that uh, even in the paintings <clears throat> that you showed, I mean, even this painting we're looking at, even the Artemisia Gentileschi, the way that, uh, I mean, the, these women are portrayed. Maybe it was the dresses over the time, but if you go back, the, Susanna and the elders, she's always portrayed as naked. Always. And there's always a case. I mean, somehow that's the hard part of these women who uh, were already tr trying to break um, the canon and be inserting themselves into the category of the canon of painting and they had to adopt the same um, standards in many ways, the same canon as the men. And they tried, I mean, in a way it was hard to do so many things. Already they weren't even taught, they had to be self-taught or even someone who would teach them. But yeah. uh, 
but they paint in a way you say okay but she's naked anyway i mean and again this is the male gaze but you know in a way um so you look at the posture you look at the body language so i'm thinking about the same way the selfie um today probably is a way of working towards questioning oneself and saying am i taking it in you know what is the gaze what is the gaze that i'm trying to tell if we question ourselves as we i mean i'm not an artist but i'm thinking about social media what is the way that we want to be portrayed and how empowering is that to me or how much i'm am i mimicking other uh ways of seeing that um you know, are represented in the male gaze, for instance. But it's uh, honestly the selfie can't. What is it? In a second or two, <laughs> takes place. So that's an interesting concept of the the liberation. In many ways, it is. There's the. You know, I can do that in a second. I don't have to be to to take a lot of time to create it. But how we want to portray it, that's another matter, and maybe that's something that we want to work towards. Or I know, think developing to the male, female gaze is how we'll get there. I think the male gaze is the norm right now, and developing a widespread female gaze will give women the agency that they need to just be who they are without worrying how anybody's interpreting it. I do hope. That's my hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate this. <laughs> um, we have another question in the chat. Uh, uh, an, an anonymous attendee asks, would you say that there are any connections between the pressures exerted around femininity depicted in art and social media today and the underside of it represented by resentment of those standards among incel folks? Ooh, that's an interesting connection with the last presentation. Um, I really, I think, I think femininity is such a weird amorphous concept that there has been so many artistic representations of it throughout time and the irony in this presentation is that most most I like if you think of an artistic representation of femininity nine times out of ten if it's in a mainstream museum it was made by a man and that's the conundrum of all of it the definition of femininity was not made by women it was not made by people who identify with the female experience they're not it, it was made by the male interpretation of what femininity is in um in relation to male power um so i really do think that um particularly art historical representations of femininity still impact how people understand feminism today um there's this um, back in the good old days kind of attitude about like how women used to portray themselves and how women used to act in society and they they enjoyed this marginalization they were protected by society, even in the paintings they look grateful. Well, of course, they look grateful they were painted by men. They didn't have any agency on how they were portrayed in literature and painting and society in any way. Um, so I really do think there is a connection between old school representations of femininity and modern misinterpretations of feminism um i i think there's i think there's potent questions to be asked there i wish i wish i had an hour to talk about this stuff i really do all right um are there any other questions just right. was wondering if uh gabby has anything to contribute to this particular question I'm open to any additions. Hmm. I guess I could see how the way, like even with the conversation of selfies, how we were discussing, and I agree with both Dr. Balzano's and Rachel, your take about how there's like a long way, or not a long way, but that selfies can be used in a liberating way, but also can be like still be constructed in relation to the male gaze so that there's still work to be done. But I guess like the pressures around performing beauty can contribute to like incel ideas about 
Can I take, can I take some agency on the incel side of things? I don't know uh, as much as you do about incel culture. I'm sure you are the expert. Um, but I know that there is, at least from my own experience out in the internet, of some negative feelings from men in particular about when women display their sexuality in a selfie, whether or not it's for private or public domain. Um, there is this weird sense of ownership over sexualized images of women. And whenever they exert control over how those are distributed or produced, there's a weird power imbalance that is working towards a more just situation, but makes some men really uncomfortable. So I think it has to do with the controlling of the female sexuality from the standpoint of a woman that makes men uncomfortable particularly in the case of incels, but that's that's my understanding with a very limited in, insight on incel culture. So take it away if you have anything else to add. That's a really good point. I agree. Thank with you. Just, yeah, the general ownership of women's sexuality and bodies. All right. Um, are there any other questions? Um, if not, then I think we can uh, close. Uh, thank you both for your wonderful presentations. And thank you to everyone who's asked questions. Um, and yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, um, so welcome everybody. I'm your moderator. My name is Naomi. I'm a junior here at Wake Forest. I'm an English major. Um, this should be a really interesting panel. We're talking about reclaiming language, histories, and well being through creative care. We have a lot of really interesting people coming to talk. We have Matt Heelman from the University of Notre Dame, Holly Thompson from Wake Forest, Geneva Hutchinson, also from the University of Notre Dame. Um, so yeah, it should be a really interesting discussion. Um, we're going to start off by talking to Matt Heumann about queering care by queering data, a mixed, me a mixed methods anal uh, analysis of LGBTQ plus health data production. So a little bit about Matt. Matt Heumann is an undergraduate senior currently attending the University of Notre Dame and majoring in neuroscience and behavior and gender studies. Throughout his time at university, he has been extensively involved in Notre Dame student government and the Gender Relations Center on campus. In addition, he is currently on the he is currently the president of Irish Reproductive Health and is on the board of directors for the AIDS Ministries and AIDS Assist uh, and AIDS Assist in South Bend, Indiana. In his free time, you might find him reading a book in the most random places or spending too much time at the on campus art museum. So, super excited to hear from him. So, let's give the floor to Matt. Awesome. Thanks so much, Naomi. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. Uh, okay, it says the, the screen sharing is disabled. William, I think as host, you need to allow him. Ah, lovely. Okay, thanks so much. Um, All right, can y'all see that? Lovely, all right. All right, all right, awesome. All right, hello everyone. Uh, Naomi introduced me already, so I guess I'll just uh, skip that part, but I'm here to talk about my senior thesis research project, uh, which is titled Queering Care by Queering Data, a Mixed Methods Analysis of LGBTQ Health Data Production. So first and foremost, I want to introduce you to two different concepts that are pillars and foundations to my project. Uh, these are the discourses of queer health and queer data. Um, first and foremost, I want to draw attention to the fact that there's no singular definitive meaning to either of these terms. Um, 
And uh, it's all completely dependent on like the history and the context within which you're asking these questions, as well as who you're asking them to. So for example, if you were to ask a public health scientist, what is queer health? Um, they might refer to the unique care needs of LGBTQ populations uh, as observed through top-down public health surveillance programs. Um, if you were to ask a queer health activist that same question, you might get a very different answer, one that might uh, refer to the more radical relational understandings of community-oriented health within many queer communities that explicitly try to find solutions through peer-to-peer -peer support and not through the state. Um, likewise, if you were to ask uh, data scientists and critical data studies scholars the question of what is queer data, or like the question of what is good data, uh, you might get very different answers, which the, with the former um, potentially uh, fitting normative ideas around uh, what is good data that we learn within academic settings in a variety of disciplines, and the latter potentially challenging that idea. Um, I also want to draw attention to two different meanings of queer data. Um, it can mean data about queer people, queer in this case, meaning LGBTQ, um, or it can also mean like queer data, which is uh, taking a queer theory approach that more broadly uh, refers to data that is challenging um, normative narratives uh, in hierarchy uh, within a given discipline. So just to summarize, uh, these are two different components of both of these discourses. Uh, they're the product dis of discourse and debate between the state and the local, between the expert and the advocate, and they challenge normative conceptualizations of health and data, respectively, um, especially those ideas around these two terms that have been prescribed by those who may have more power uh, within a given discipline. Um, these two terms are querying the discourse, as one might say. So how are these two discourses intersecting? Um, like I said, intersecting discourses. Um, so the data collection, data collection is an essential part of the healthcare setting and the care experience for people accessing healthcare, um, especially for LGBTQ individuals. Um, by putting current practices, current data collection practices in conversation um, with health histories and the histories of collecting data about queer population within the healthcare setting, um, we can highlight how different ideas about queer health um, involve pra actually practicing data collection in different ways. Um, and these different understandings of health and these differences in data collection can actually be seen within the practices of community health organizations today, um, which is something I'm going to touch on later in this presentation. Um, so in order to actually put current practices in conversation with uh, histories of these practices, I have to talk about the histories themselves. So I'm just going to talk briefly here about the histories of queer health and queer data in the United States, and then I'm going to narrow it in to South Bend, Indiana, which is where I'm located and which is where most of my research occurred. Um, so in the 1970s, we see a lot of different localized origins of um, the ideas around queer health and gay health within gay health clinics around the country. Um, these were um, these organizations and the care that they were providing for LGBTQ populations within their given space um, evolved within a lot of different unique circumstances. Um, some of them were very explicitly connected to the radical politics of the gay liberation movement from the 1960s, um, as well as other uh, like civil rights movements within uh, earlier time periods. Um, while others were concerned with more localized struggles um, between neighborhood organizations and capitalist development projects, um, it really just depends on the urban setting that you're looking. Um, Regardless, a lot of these institutions had complicated relationships with the state. A lot of them came from anti-capitalist roots. Um, a lot of them were trying to provide free and or low cost health care to both the LGBTQ populations that they were serving and the larger populations that they might be serving. Um, yet they also were like weirdly reliant on uh, state services that were being provided for free. Um, like for example, you know, you can't provide venereal disease testing for free without utilizing the um, lab testing programs that a lot of states had that were uh, uh, freely um, accessible at the time. Um, so this like starts this is the start of like a very tenuous relationship between these clinics and the state. 
Um, and then uh, as the 1970s went on and into the 1980s, we see um, an increasing push for standardization in a lot of different ways. Standardization of employment practices and employment hi and hiring practices, standardization of care practices, standardization of funding structures. Um, and this was all being pushed by the state and state health departments. Um, and this led to a lot of these clinics breaking with their radical roots. Um, and we start to see this, uh, this divide between those who are seeking to provide LGBTQ healthcare within the state and those who are seeking to continue finding solutions outside of the state. Um, data collection practices actually mirror these changes. So during earlier times when they're trying to provide free and low cost healthcare, there wasn't as much data being collected Collected about the people who were accessing these services. Um, they were more accessible to the general public and the average person seeking care. However, um, these standardization practices ended up requiring more and more data to be collected about those who were accessing care. Um, and then a lot of these trends in health and data histories can actually be seen in the localized, uh, on the local level uh, here in South Bend, Indiana as well. So to transition over to the other side of my research, um, I wanted to look at examining how meaning and language about health and data was created and transformed across different stakeholder groups in healthcare settings. Um, and more specifically, I was trying to look at data collection methods being used by different community health organizations serving LGBTQ populations in South Bend, Indiana, and the broader Michiana region. Um, I was taking a mixed methods approach, so I was doing ethnographic observation within a lot of these settings, and then I was supplementing that with open-ended ethnographic interviews. Um, so just to talk a bit more about this setting, I know we have people from all over the place here. Um, so Michiana refers to a region in northern Indiana and southern Michigan. Uh, it's in the red here in the top image. Um, it has a population of around 860,000 people with over 300,000 of those people in the South Bend Mishawaka metro area, which is at the center of the bottom image. Um, so my field sites were primarily in South Bend with a couple exceptions. I was looking at community health organizations serving queer populations. I also was engaging with the local county health departments in the area and the Indiana Department of Health, as well as different representatives from community impact divisions within the local health systems. Um, and I think this is a really like special place to be looking at this because not only is it a, a place that has a unique contrast between or a unique um, presence of rural and urban healthcare in like a very like close setting. Um, but it uh, also is worth noting that 4.5% of the adult population in Indiana is estimated to be LGBTQ. Um, and that translates to almost 15,000 people in South Bend and Mishawaka alone. So there's a lot of queer people here if that if that statistic holds. Um, and I, there's a lot of uh, potential in this space to be doing research on queer people and their healthcare needs. So I was collecting data from September to February. This was mostly done in person with some Zoom meetings and interviews as needed. Um, crazy time in the COVID pandemic. Um, and uh, I was taking a twofold approach. I was doing ethnographic analysis and then I was uh, supplementing that with the work that I was doing and the research that I was doing on the within the broader literature about LGBTQ health histories and data histories. Um, and then I uh, was transposing my field notes into narrative formats uh, and after, um, after going to these meetings and conducting these interviews. And then I also was doing close readings of specific anecdotes from those field notes so uh, uh, that I could make meaning of them. This is just kind of an illustration of my workflow. You know, so I was attending organizational meetings within these community health settings. Uh, I was conducting follow-up interviews with representatives of the group present at those meetings or the people who I was recommended to. And I was also conducting additional research on things that stood out to me during that meeting that I needed to understand more. Um, and then I was transposing those into narrative format and synthesizing them. Um, so these are just some of the conclusions that I have drawn from that phase of the project. Um, so I noticed a lot of disconnects between state and local health departments and um, community health efforts. Um, there was a lot of subjugation of local knowledge and input that was occurring within these organizational settings. Um, there also was a lot of leaving questions unasked um, when uh, the state was running uh, public health surveillance programs um, on queer populations. Um, that was leading to misinformation being uh, or information being misrepresented later on um, down the line when they're conveying this information to stakeholder groups. 
Um, I also found that inclusive care practices for, was really, really important to a lot of the providers in the area on the local level. Um, and this involved actually minimizing potential harm and potential discomfort within the care setting via limited data collection. So you can kind of see this tension here between the state and the local at work. Um, so just summarize that, you know, the state both benefits and restricts care collection or uh, care and collection practices, you know, so it can help standardize approaches to different health issues affecting the queer community, but it also can inhibit the ability for local actors to take the efforts that they believe that they need. So just to close off my presentation here, I'm going to leave you with two remarks. Um, so first, their solution for this is not conclusive. You, um, if you asked state practitioners what the solution is, they would maybe say that it's just to collect more data, more better data. Um, but if you were to ask uh, LGBTQ health advocates and health activists, they might say, well, we don't need to surveil the queer population even more. Um, that's going to cause problems. Um, so there's not a conclusive solution to this. Um, but I think it's worth noting that as we move forward into a new age of data collection practices um, in the evolving landscape of LGBTQ rights and LGBTQ healthcare in the US and around the world, um, including these local histories of data collection practices and care provision in our conversations about LGBTQ health literacy is essential. Thank you all so much. Great, thank you so much, Matt. That was super interesting. Um, I'm going to open up the floor now to Q&A. Um, I can start by taking questions from the hosts and the panelists, or I can start with my own questions, whatever um, the rest of you would like. But I'll leave it open with questions from you guys. Anybody? Anybody? I have a question. Okay, great. Um, oh, I just feel like I zoomed out really rapidly. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, <laughs> but Matt, I really, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and I was wondering, um, when you were conducting interviews with um, queer people in the area who were um, talking about their healthcare experiences or what they need, I was sort of curious about what their affects, their demeanors were like. Was there a lack of trust um, in the healthcare services available? Was trust good? Was there anxiety? Um, just sort of curious about the, the attitudes, the feelings around healthcare. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I was actually, a lot of the people I was interviewing were actually people that were representatives or care providers working within the institutions providing healthcare. So uh, the lack of trust that you mentioned is actually a big point that continually was being brought up by care providers that I was interviewing as something that they is a big concern for them. Um, and it's something that they have identified through and so, uh, surveys of the people accessing their services um, as like a big concern in the area. Um, so I was hearing about that from the like healthcare professional organizational side of things. I wasn't necessarily hearing that from people themselves because I was working like one degree removed from the actual clinical setting, healthcare setting. Um, but yes, I think that like that is definitely something that, especially in this area, was something that care providers were identifying as a big concern. Um, and like part of what I was uh, like trying to get like look at was how data collection kind of fit into that lack of trust. I mean, I think like you know, data collection in a lot of ways is an act of surveillance by people who are trying who are requiring um, different data to be collected. Um, so like the state requires different things to be collected and then organizations have the ability to add on to that or not add on to that and for a lot of these care providers you can we can kind of see like um this trend at least within the ones that i was looking at here in this area of um, them not like trying to tack on any as uh them trying to not tack on additional data collection because they don't want to increase that like lack of trust or that discomfort um, by being surveilled the moment you enter the care setting um because that was something that they were noticing a lot of um, so great question. Yes, although I was hearing about it from like a different angle. Thank you. Great, that was a great question. Um, does anybody else have any any questions for Matt? Nope. Um, something that I was wondering after Holly's question was, how did you try to establish trust with people when you were interviewing them? Like, how did you try to connect with them on a personal level and kind of make them understand that you, you know, um, were somebody that they could trust and they could talk to openly and candidly. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of the organizations that I was connecting with, like I was uh, utilizing connections through the Department of Gender Studies and different uh, organizations that I'm a part of here on campus. Um, I'm already kind of involved in this like healthcare, this like uh, local healthcare advocacy space through some of the organizations that I'm a part of. Um, so I was able to utilize some connections to kind of like to rely to rely on those connections that I are in that working relationship that the organizations that I'm a part of um, already had with some of these institutions to kind of get the in. And then I was kind of like using like a snowball sampling like uh, beyond that where like um, I was having people like in conversations, they would reference a different organization and I would be like, and they would be like, oh, you should talk to this person. Or I would be like, oh, I would like, like, I'd love to hear their perspective on this topic as well. Um, so I was kind of using the connections between all these organizations to uh, connect with these organizations and that kind of built like a foundation of trust. Um, also, I think a lot of these organizations, especially the ones that are not necessarily like uh, like not like the state department but the ones that are like local nonprofits and stuff like that like they are very very interested in like um this conversation of around data collection practices and like uh, building uh comfort within the care setting through data collection or the lack thereof um so a lot of them were really enthusiastic about meeting with me and having conversations around this um and so i never really ran into um barriers uh with the people that I was interviewing who uh in terms of like people not wanting to talk about different things I also like when I was um going like in you know starting off like my little spiel that I would give at the beginning of an interview um I also was made it very very clear that you know they don't have to talk about anything that they don't want to uh and nothing that would jeopardize their position or their jobs or the care that they're providing um, like I made it very clear from the get go in my initial script that I would start any interview with or that I would send in the chat or would say at the beginning of an organizational meeting. Um, I made it very clear in that script or that little blurb that I would uh, that I was like, you know, not trying to impose or like make anyone uncomfortable or um, have them say anything to answer a question that I was asking that they felt uncomfortable answering as well. So I think that's just a really important part of like interviewing and ethnographic observation, like regardless of what you're doing. But that was something that I took very seriously. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a really great, very savvy way of going at it. Um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I think it's time to transition into our next um, panelist. Um, let me pull up my papers. All right. So now we have um, Holly Thompson from Wake Forest University. The title of her talk is Audrey Lore, Speech, Speech, Speechlessness and Autistic Cognition. Holly Thompson is a first year master's student in English at Wake Forest University. Her primary interests are in poetry, critical theory, and medical humanities and critical autism studies. As a neurodivergent woman, she is passionate about bringing neurodiverse perspectives into literature. All right, you have the floor, Holly. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, may I please receive permission to uh, share my screen? Oh, here we go. All right, I'm in, okay. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, um, and can you guys hear me okay? All right, um, so I'm Holly. Um, I'm glad you guys can be here today. I'm very excited to talk to you. Um, as Naomi told you, I am a bit of a poetry gal. I'm a bit of a disability studies gal. Um, and I've been meditating on this connection that I see between the corpus of Audre Lorde and autism studies. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, so Audre Lorde, was a 20th century American writer, um, primarily known as a poet. Her work was political and radical. She was an advocate for marginalized groups and a large body of her work explores her own identity as a black lesbian living and working in a culture that was so largely dominated by white patriarchy. She, I think really reflects the axiom from second wave feminism that the person is political 
Her work is very introspective, but she's also always probing at the circumstances that shape our mind and that color how we interface with the world. In 1982, Lord published um, what's sometimes called a memoir, um, Zami, a new spelling of my name. But Lord calls this text a biomythography. She is combining the presumably factual genre of biography and then the crowdsourced and protean genre of mythology or mythography. The biomythography is narrated by Audrey as the writer and the protagonist. And it spans from her childhood into her early adulthood. Um, the text primarily follows the thread of her formative relationships with other women, and it largely deals with finding your people when you are in circumstances that are constantly making you feel othered. I'm going to take us for a second to chapter three in Zami. Um, because Audrey is about five years old here. And she tells us something that kind of astounded me because I can't seem to find anyone really making connections about this. So she says, I learned to read at the same time I learned to talk, which was only about a year or so before I started school. Perhaps learn isn't the right word to use for my beginning to talk because to this day, I don't know if I didn't talk earlier because I didn't know how, or if I didn't talk because I had nothing to say that I would be allowed to say without punishment. Self-preservation starts very early in West Indian families. And then she tells us about speaking for the first time in a public library because she's excited to read a story. And she says, even one intelligible word was a very rare event for me. And although the doctors at the clinic clipped the little membrane under my tongue so I was no longer tongue-tied, and had assured my mother that I was not, she still had her terrors and her doubts. So I spend an inordinate amount of my free time reading and thinking about autism. And you likely know that a common experience of the autism spectrum is delayed speech. When speech is present or does develop, it's often responded to in many of the ways that Audrey observes her own speech being responded to by others in Zami. It is considered too loud or too much or not relevant or not appropriate to time or place. I see parallels. And I want to back us up for a second because I want to reiterate that it's important to remember that the territory that we're treading here is the territory of biomythography. It's the restructuring and the mythologizing of her life. And it's equally important that we listen carefully to the qualification that the Lord gives us about her speech, she really doesn't know what her potential for speech production was like. She just knows that she didn't speak. And she does identify an important possible reason for her speechlessness, which was a fear of getting in trouble with her mother. She had a very challenging relationship with her, and certainly she could have been responding to that relationship by shutting down. So I am not here to start leaping to diagnostic conclusions with impunity at all. We are not performing a psychological evaluation of Audre Lorde on this day. But once this connection took root in my mind between her work and these childhood experiences that resonate with autism, that connection began to grow. Because I realized something, I realized that the genre that she named biomythography may well be a budding popular genre amongst the autistic community. I have a particular interest in researching women who are colloquially described as high functioning autistic. Um, functioning labels are recognized as fairly pejorative in the autistic community, so I'm going to use the preferred term, which is low support needs. Um, so know that when I say low support needs, I am referring to what you've likely heard called high functioning autism. There's been a phenomenon in the past 10 to 15 years where psychologists, academics are realizing that autistic women, particularly women with low support needs, are an under-identified population. Autism has traditionally been thought of as a predominantly male condition, but clinicians who work regularly with autistic women are observing that they are much more real and much more common than previously thought. 
And these women tend to be very good at something called masking, which is the practice of hiding one's autistic traits by suppressing them or by mimicking the speech and mannerisms and actions of others. Autistic women with low support needs tend to be high maskers, very good at disguise, and it's often not until adulthood that they are identified as autistic. And so here's what happens. I have seen hundreds of women describe these experiences on all kinds of different digital platforms. An individual thinks that she might be autistic. She has a very focused, very detail-oriented mind that tends to And she starts to find that she's identifying with what she's reading and she's recognizing herself. And so she starts collecting information and she gets an appointment for an evaluation and she comes in with a folder of this information that she's collected. Or she comes in with a binder of this information that she has collected of articles and lists and anecdotes from friends and family. And she has gone through her childhood with a fine tooth comb and she has cross-referenced with 80 years of autism research, which is often mysterious or inconclusive, really wacky and wild at times, uh, changing constantly, now crowdsourced often by autistic people. And she starts to rebuild this narrative understanding of herself that coheres by asking herself not who or what she is, but why she is and how she is. So she starts to construct biomythography. And this process of self-discovery necessitates that you go back in time because the medical paradigm puts a lot of emphasis on the fact that autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. You're often obligated to go on a kind of expedition through your past to confirm and understand the presence of autism. And it also necessitates that you cross-reference with so many additional texts that span different genres, the DSM, studies, personal narratives, and so on. And I find such striking similarities between Lord's biomythography and the narratives that autistic women are telling themselves or telling others to understand how they are, who they are, and how their identity is constructed. And I think that Lord is a wonderfully accessible writer for autistic women to see as a kind of touchstone because of her orientation towards justice and her divergent ways of thinking. There's a lot of conversation amongst the autistic community about representation in fiction. And I think that continuing to approach texts that are not explicitly about autism with creativity and with open minds can provide the kind of fruitful and rewarding and empathetic reading experience that we are all hungering for when we want to see ourselves reflected in the texts that we read. And that's why I have made this connection between Lord's biomythography and the autistic community. And I hope to continue to investigate Lord's voice in this memoir, yes, but also in her poetry and in her essays, um, because I can see potential for applying new lenses of autistic poetics to Lord's work. Hopefully this research would benefit both the literary study of Audre Lorde and the study of autism and the autistic community. Thank you very much. That's the show. That's what I have for you. Wow, that was really powerful. That was amazing. Yeah, snaps to that. That was great. Um, so I'm not going to open it up to the Q and A from the panel. Um, uh, anybody have any any questions for Holly? I have a question. Um, I'm. I guess it's kind of a two part question. Um, so I think I think Naomi said you're in your first year of your master's. So I'm curious. Like, did this connection come just? like aha moment where you like super excited and you had this like oh my gosh like exciting moment and then you discovered this and then you like started investigating it deeper or was it kind of a longer process um and then you touched on it a little bit like where you see the work might be going you know digging into more of her work um but I'm curious if you have um like more details on that like what you're excited about kind of going forward with it because it's really exciting research 
Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so I was reading Audre Lorde a lot last summer, um, just for my own amusement. Um, and I was reading Sister Outsider, and there's an interview that she does with Adrian Rich in Sister Outsider. And she has these really interesting comments where she talks about learning how to identify nonverbal cues from other people as a teenager. And I thought that is so interesting. That sounds like the kind of experiences that I've heard from a lot of neurodivergent women, this kind of conscious realization that, oh, there are other things that I am kind of expected to be doing to understand the social interactions that are happening. And so I had that kind of tucked away in my mind. And then I took a literature class last semester where we read some more Lord, And I encountered that biographical piece of information that she didn't begin talking until she was about four or five. And I almost fell out of my chair. And I said, why is nobody talking about this? I will become that person. Um, so that's where that excitement started. Um, I am really interested in the way that Audrey talks about speech in her essays, in her speeches. She often associates it with this kind of affective quality. I feel speechless or I feel like I need to speak. And that idea, that tension between the feeling of speechlessness and the feeling of desiring to speak up, that's very interesting to me and something that I want to continue thinking about and writing about. And the kind of isolation that she felt as a child, really throughout her entire life, but especially when she was growing up, that's also very interesting to me um, and something that I want to consider as well. Yeah, what a wonderful question. That was really was really great. Um, does anybody else have any any questions for Holly? No. Um, anyway, a question that I had was, um, I guess, the connection between Audre Lorde and autism. Where do you see, like, how do you see that? Um, like, where do you see that going? What do you want to do with that connection? Do you want to write? Do you want to talk about that? Like, I, I just, you know, wondering what you want to do with this, with such a powerful connection that you made. Thank you. I would love to write a paper on this. I need to carve out the time to write a paper on this, but ideally I would really like to spend um, a good portion of my summer continuing to research um, and starting to try to compose something about this that I could submit for publication. I, I actually wanted to um, add a question that dovetails with, with Naomi's, which is that there's some uh, friction in the way that the story of Audre Lorde is presented vis-a-vis -vis Mary Daly and kind of womenism versus feminism. And that kind of test case or case study is often deployed. Of course, later after Lorde passed away, the letter that Daly sent to her was discovered and was annotated such that there is some kind of charge of hypocrisy sometimes or a kind of unfair um, attack maybe against uh, potential allies. But I wonder whether or not this lens, uh, critical or kind of biomedical lens of autism might help us understand the social cues that might have been missed in those communications and what that could aid for a more sympathetic reading of that exchange. I think that is a lovely, lovely observation. And I think that you're right, particularly because Lord, we know that she read the letter, we know that she annotated the letter, I imagine that we can find quite a lot of um, sort of uh, primary source material to think about her state of mind, because it's difficult to speculate on somebody's psyche or their psychology via their, their poetry, their memoir. Um, but I tend to think that sort of personal writing, marginalia, I think that's very reflective of present tense cognitive action. Um, and I And I do think it is important to try to understand where some of her um, sort of heated reactions came from. And I, I do think that there's probably a connection to um, maybe a, a condition like neurodivergence um, and as well this like this persistent kind of loneliness and sort of defensiveness that she put up because of that, which may well be related to neurodivergence. Okay, great. That's um, about all the time we have for questions. So let's move on to our next panelist, um, Geneva Hutchinson. Um, one moment. 
All right, so the title of her talk is Restore and Reclaim, Navigating the Complexities of Purity Culture, Sexual Trauma, and Spiritual Abuse. So Geneva grew up in the South and has, had, uh, and has used her upbringing as a Southern pastor's daughter to inform her artwork. She uses found objects, such as domestic objects and textiles, to create a conversation about the daily oppression women face, including in the church and home. She works in a variety of mediums, such as photography and installation, and most recently has begun using embroidery as a traditional gendered labor, as a small way to honor the women who have gone before her. Geneva is a current MFA candidate at the University of Notre Dame and received her BFA in printmaking and BA in communications from Clemson University. So take it away. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, could I also please have permission to share my screen? Visual artist, um, it might be a little rough <laughs> to describe, describe the slides. So thank you very much, perfect. All right, let me just get this. Okay. All right, does that look good for everyone? Okay. Perfect. Well, hi, everyone. So my name is Geneva Hutchinson, and I am a third year MFA candidate in studio art at the University of Notre Dame. Um, so I'm currently finishing up my thesis in like the final five days of it. Um, so you'll see some in progress things, um, but nothing finalized yet because it's not done. Um, but you'll see some of the progress. Um, so today I'll be talking about my thesis project, which is titled Restore Reclaim. And this is a dual thesis, so it's part written, part visual. So I'll briefly be going over a few different facets of my research today, but then also show some of my artwork to contextualize it. So I wanted to go ahead by defining purity culture because that's really where the foundation of my research lies and it might not be a familiar term for everyone. So Emily Joy Allison defines purity culture as the spiritual corollary of rape culture created in Christian environments by theologies that teach complete sexual abstinence until legal monogamous marriage between a cisgender heterosexual man and a cisgender heterosexual woman for life or else. So I was raised in the Southern parts of Georgia and Virginia. My dad has been a Presbyterian pastor since the 1990s. So I grew up attending church, Sunday school, youth group for, all of my childhood and teenage years. So I remember being first taught this idea of purity from a youth pastor at a Sunday night youth group meeting. I was about 14 years old and I still remember that surging feeling of just guilt and shame just shot through my body. Um, I was still considered pure by their definition yet still felt that guilt and shame. Since I was fully immersed in this Christian culture growing up, it wasn't until much, much later in my life that I actually began to process these effects that purity culture had had on me. Restore Reclaim was first inspired by an experience I had in White Sands, New Mexico in December, 2020. So as I began to walk through these pure white sands, I noticed these marks that I was making. I was the only person there. And there was these, it was this beautiful untouched white sand. And I immediately felt like an intruder as I noticed these dirty marks I was making in this sand. And I was just overly, overly aware of my own uncleanliness. So I really just began to think about this idea of purity and it, it really sparked my fascination with researching the effects that purity culture had had on my life, but then also on other women's lives as well. Um, this is a video, so hopefully it works okay. Um, so after my experience in White Sands, I began using art as this act of processing and therapy. So while creating this body of work, I really wrestled with how could I possibly visualize these complex ways that I try to understand my own mind and make sense of it. So this is the first piece I made coming back from White Sands um, as I was beginning this process of unlearning um, the purity culture ideals that were really deeply ingrained within me. I based this piece directly off this real experience of walking through white sand. So I used found domestic textiles, such as bed sheets, curtains, um, which I all pur purchased all of them from secondhand stores. So I wanted to create this immersive installation for the viewer so that they could physically enter the space and walk along the white fabric. 
So when the viewer reaches the end of the installation, they are confronted with this embroidered text that reads, can you even see what you've done? So many viewers, when they entered the installation, kind of reported back to me and said, well, I walked through your installation. And when I got to the end and I read that text, I actually turned around and noticed all the marks that I had made on the white fabric. So I used this white thread so that you had to reach the end of the installation to see it. So it was more of this kind of subtle effect um, so that you couldn't see it when you first walked in, but you had to um, reach the end. So it creates more of a shocking effect for the viewer. While processing the effects of purity culture, I also began researching trauma theory, specifically sexual trauma. So I wanted to read this quote from Judith Herman. Traumatic events call into question basic human relationships. They breach the attachments of family, friendship, love, and community. They shatter the construction of the self that is formed and sustained in relation to others. They undermine the belief systems that give meaning to human experience. They violate the victim's faith in a natural or divine order and cast the victim into a state of existential crisis. So Judith Herman in this book talks about how sexual trauma such as sexual assault makes the victim begin to question their identity and their sense of self. So I was first sexually assaulted at the age of 17 while I was still fully immersed within purity culture. So I was being taught that my entire value and sense of self resided within my pure body. And the church completely ignores the idea that someone's purity could be forcibly taken without one's consent. So misleading young women about the realities of sex and sexuality leads to so many emotional and mental issues, but also physical issues such as STIs, cervical cancer, et cetera. So as I continue to process these effects of purity culture, I continue to use the white found textiles with embroidery in my work, but I also began to use family photographs. Um, and I use this as a way of expressing things that I would love to say to my family, but probably never will directly. And um, this was a really cathartic experience, um, but it was also incredibly personal. So I decided to kind of take a step back and expand my research into a, a larger institutional critique. On May 28th last year, a list was released of 700 convicted abusers who have been involved within leadership within the Southern Baptist Church. So this list includes pastors, youth group workers, and other leaders some of whom are still employed by churches. So while this list was completely horrifying, it affirms that my experience with toxicity within the church was not an isolated experience. So taking this list, I actually um, have fully based my thesis exhibition off of this list um, and thinking about um, what, what is a safe space if a church can't be that for someone? Um, how, do we, how do we help those who have been spiritually or physically abused by members of a church? enter those spaces and heal. Um, but when I first read this list, I felt a huge surge of emotions and I was really overwhelmed and I didn't really know how to react properly. Um, so I just printed it and began to go through the list. Um, and I Googled every name of the abusers. Um, due to redactions on the list and lacking internet presences, I found photos of 314 out of the 700. So those are the faces that you see here. So taking these photos, um, I was envisioning the works of Nick Cave and Jasper Johns and other artists who use this circular pattern. So I envisioned a target or a bullseye and arranged them into this circle. Um, and then I also took hands of some of the, the pastors. Um, when I think of hands of a pastor, such as my father, I think of hands that heal, pray, or worship rather than hands that abuse. Um, I find it very difficult to process that the same men preaching purity culture are the same ones violating it. Um, so these two works act as sketches for my um, final thesis installation. The faces um, existed on my wall for a really long time and I got tired of them looking down on me. So the final piece is actually a sculpture that you look down upon the faces. Um, so I'm excited to be able to stare down at them now. Um, when going through the list, the stories of the abused are really haunting and horrifying. Um, stories of ministers abusing young girls that go to them seeking counseling, pastors raping members of their congregation, covering up scandals to protect their church's reputation are on every single page. So in my thesis exhibition, I will also be displaying about 50 pieces of embroidered fabric in conversation with the photographic pieces. 
So they show fragments of stories from the assault survivors um, throughout the list. So one of the reasons I felt so drawn to working with textiles and embroidery, like Naomi mentioned, um, is because there's this rich history of women's labor within the art of embroidery. But there's also this really deep memory that textiles hold. So Leor Oslander, who's a material culture historian, talks about how fabric holds every trace of every previous owner. So the fabric that I'm using since it's found has been slept on, eaten on, it may have white tears, it may have white sweat or blood. And I love that I'm able to then repurpose it to tell the stories of these survivors. Because I believe that art has the power to heal and create change through sparking conversation. Um, and I may never see the full impact that my artwork has, but I really hope that it's able to reach survivors and help them share their own story um, by seeing that community from other survivors. And thank you so much. And with that, I will open it up for questions. That was amazing. That was so beautiful. It's so incredible to see like visual art go alongside like story and ideas. Um, I'd like to open it up to now Q&A from our panelists. So if anybody's any questions, feel free to go ahead. I have one. Um, that was amazing. That was beautiful. Um, I hope I, you know, I hope I can see it because I'm also in Notre Dame. I hope I can see the MFA exhibition. Um, I guess my question is like you mentioned like I mean, you have a lot of quotes here from like um, different the trauma theorists, just different, uh, the, the different areas of literature that you're drawing from um, in the actual exhibition. Like how, like, are, how do you plan to, like, do you plan to incorporate some of these like quotes in various ways? Like, how are you going to incorporate like a, a written aspect, like into supplementing this, like these visuals that you're presenting here? I'm just curious. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think the main way that the research side of it will be shown is just in an artist statement, like like pasted on the wall. Um, it's kind of MFA is a little bit niche where we have the written thesis and the visual thesis. Um, so it's a little bit of a strange concept, I think. Um, and then as far as like actual text with the embroidery, um, so I didn't have any images of the final ones because they're not done. Um, but it will, um, it'll be the white on white and these kind of long white columns and they'll have these kind of fragments or small sentences um, kind of alluding to the sense of something, something's going on or something's in question, um, something kind of ambiguous. So like one of them says she was 12 and then you might move to the next one that says, um, do you feel powerful? And there's kind of these little fragments. So you might be a little bit confused reading those. And then hopefully the artist statement can provide some context, if that makes sense. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Um, I have one. I think that was so, so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And I love how introspective and personal the project is while still addressing a much larger scale of social issues. And I was thinking as you were presenting about things like um, like sewing circles or things like women quilting together. And I'm wondering if um, there might be a kind of future for a for collaborative work of this nature, if that's something that you would be interested in, if, if you wouldn't be interested in it. Um, but that, I kept thinking about that when you were. Yeah, thank you. That's a really cool point to bring up. I think something that, um, that's something I've done a little bit more in the past with like more collaboration and even just talking to survivors and hearing about their stories. That's a huge thing we saw with the Me Too movement, right? Was this awesome community coming together um, in a small, part of my paper that I didn't touch on is actually a movement called hashtag church to that started a, a, like a year after the me too movement basically where people said no this happens within religious institutions as well so I think I'm honestly less interested in the creating element of that but more so the sharing element that could happen with women kind of sharing their stories of abuse and hurt within the church um there's some really amazing work um, that honestly started in the 1970s where they had women share their stories of rape 
played those stories on an audio tape while a performance art piece was uh, going on at the same time. And it was beautiful and just incredible and powerful. Um, so I'm really interested in how performance could be collaborative um, and how that could incorporate storytelling as well, because I think they go hand in hand um, really nicely together. Um, There's actually a girl in my cohort in my uh, thesis exhibition who was doing knitting circles as part of her thesis as well, which is super cool that our work gets to be displayed together. So that's a nice like meshing of two worlds, which has been awesome. But thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, anybody else? No? Um, yeah, go for it. No, if you have a question, please, please go ahead, Naomi. Um, more just a comment. I, I saw an exhibition recently. I was in Berlin for a little bit um, from Louise uh, Bourgeois, I think that's her name, called The Woven Child. I was wondering if you had seen any of her art or had any inspiration from her. Oh my gosh, I love her. Um, and wow, she she's amazing. Is amazing. Oh my gosh, she is so powerful. She did this amazing collaboration with Tracy Emmons, who's one of my favorite artists. Um, and she it was a piece about uh, reproductive rights and abortion and childbirth. And it was just really um, stunning. So I actually saw that, I believe it was my junior or senior year of college in New York. And I, I think about it really often. Um, and I have a few of her books. So yeah, she's incredible. A huge section of my paper that I didn't touch on is um, just the history of feminist artists paving the way so that I'm able to freely make the work that I'm making now. I owe a lot to them. Um, and she's definitely one of those amazing artist yeah okay great I, I was wondering if I was sort of just like shooting blind but yeah that's <laughs> awesome I love her too she's she's really really awesome mm -hmm. um so uh William if you have a question well I've now taken in a totally different direction um and so that was a powerful presentation this was a really beautiful panel um and excellently moderated so thank you for your questions um as well but you know I um, I've published a little bit of work on queers who have been impacted by purity culture. And so like, I'm very much vibing with that. And, and I can't help but also notice like your institutional affiliation. So I'm wondering whether or not you are finding compatriots in this work um, at Notre Dame. I know that there's like institutional interest in a lot of the clerical sexual abuse scandals. And so um, as much as there's also some pushback too, but I'm but I'm wondering kind of the the the, the kind of ways in which denominational or theological differences show up in the way that these um, various forms of processes um, can occur, therapeutic, art, you know, historical, um, scholarly, interpersonal, et cetera. Um, and so kind of how, how you found that. And then, I, you know, I was thinking when you said Tracy Mintz, so like, love Tracy. Um, she, she has this really grand um, neon uh, artwork in, installed in Liverpool, the cathedral there. And so, you know, I'm also thinking about one's proximity to and relationship with church as institution and what it means to go back into those spaces and then exhibit for exactly this call, uh, demand of justice. So I'm just, yeah, kind of curious to hear you uh, process as much as my own question is a ramble. <laughs> yes, these are things I think about constantly. And I think Matt can probably agree that doing work like this at Notre Dame is interesting, um, but I'm fortunately a gender studies minor as well, so that's been a nice um, outlet, and um, I'm sure that's helped Matt's work as well. Um, it is really interesting, so I actually began this work, so May 28th, the Southern Baptist Church was released. Um, at the end of June, I went to Ireland, Kyle Abbey in Ireland, where nuns live, um, for an artist residency sponsored through Notre Dame. And this work was like just beginning and ever present in my mind. And I was a little hesitant to start making the work there. And fortunately it was met with nothing but support, um, which was really great to see. Um, so that's actually where I made the circle of the faces for the first time. Um, and it was this really interesting process and it was really great to bring it back to Notre Dame and kind of see how professors would respond to it. Um, and it's been really great and positive. Um, and then there's actually a, a, mo a movement that just started um, through Notre Dame scholars um, about kind of these questions that I'm wondering more about the Southern Baptist Church, but they're questioning it with the Catholic Church of what does healing look like for survivors of assault within the Catholic Church? Um, and what, you know, what does restoration ever look like? 
And I'm, I'm not sure I agree with the solutions they've come up with. I think one of the solutions was like a prayer garden, um, which feels maybe a little bit passive to me. Um, but it's this weird, I call it a liminal space that I live in with my work and my research because in no way am I completely condemning the way that I grew up and the ways that I was raised to believe because um, I still think of my father as one of the good ones. I still think there's a lot of beauty in Christian rituals and Christian worship, yet I'm questioning things and I'm challenging a lot of things. And so it's this weird space of honoring my spirituality, yet questioning my spirituality that I think my work lives in. Um, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. I have a lot of queer friends that feel the same way where they say, well, this is where I want to be welcomed. And I want to attend a religious ceremony and I want to attend worship. Yet if I'm not be being welcomed by other congregant members that go there, are we really worshiping the same higher power? Um, so I think I could go on and on and on for hours, as I'm sure um, you could as well, William. And it's, it's just, yeah, it's things I sit with and meditate with. Um, and there's, I'm fortunate, there's a lot of really cool Christian feminist theologians who have gone before me and kind of done some of this questioning work in a scholarly way. Um, Beth Allison Barr is the first one that comes to mind. Um, and she wrote a pretty awesome book that's helped my research. Um, and so that's good to see that I'm not the only one, right, questioning things and seeing this community kind of form. Um, but it's interesting, right? Like my family's going to come see my thesis show. I have no idea how, what that experience is going to be like. Um, but yeah, yeah, thanks for your thoughts and <laughs> meditations on it. I'm, I really could talk about it for, I think, hours and hours. Wow. That was a really, really powerful presentation. Um, we're nearing the last minute of our panel right now, which is sad because I wish we had more time for a greater discussion, but you know, we were having such interesting questions, so I didn't want to cut it off. Um, but it's been really amazing hearing all of you speak. It's been really, really interesting. Um, all of you have done really incredible jobs. So I'm really um, like feeling lucky to have watched it all and witnessed it all. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for organizing this. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Take care. I'll see you at the next panel. Bye-bye. <laughs> Jackie is a second-year graduate student in the Communications Master's Program at Wake Forest University. She is also pursuing her graduate certificate in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. The paper she is submitting is part of the research she's conducting for her thesis project. The professors she has worked with on this project include Dr. Wanda Valzano, Dr. Ron Von Berg, Dr. Woodrow Hood, and Dr. Philip Cunningham. Jackie's research is entitled Female Rage, the Monstrous Feminine, and Objection, and Neil Marshall's The Descent. The floor is all yours, Jackie. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ashley. Um, I'm going to figure out how to share my screen really quickly. So I, we're all on the same page. If you hear uh, my dog licking in the background. I apologize. I gave him something to distract him. Um, so hopefully that will work. <laughs> so I'm very excited to share my project with you all today. Um, it's entitled Female Rage, the Monstrous Feminine and Abjection in Neil Marshall's The Descent. And I wanted to begin with a introduction of the text. And so um, the Descent is a horror film that comes out in 2005 on the heels of horror's most iconic and controversial era, the slasher film era. Um, and it featured something pretty revolutionary for its time and still even to this day, uh, an entirely female cast of characters. Um, and to give a really brief synopsis of the plot, The Descent follows our protagonist, Sarah, who recently lost her husband and her child. And as a way to reconnect with her best friends, she goes on a spelunking trip in the caves of North Carolina um, and they wind, wind up trapped underground. And they find out that um, they're not alone down there and there's some monstrous cave creatures um, who have evolved underground as the kind of perfect killing machines. Uh, so it's not a good time. It's not <laughs> a good place to be stuck in as they quickly discover. 
And so the first question I think most people have with something like this is why study horror films using feminist criticism? Why is this important to do? And I think Lazard says it best. And so I want to read their quote here. So they say that fictional representations of femininity are sites within which audiences negotiate understandings of gendered subjectivities. Specifically, horror fiction as a site where such negotiations take place is interesting precisely because horror has often reproduced problematic gendered relationships. And this, again, harkens back to uh, horror films that have notoriously featured abundant an abundance of violence against women, um, while also featuring a majority of female protagonists. So it's this kind of interesting dynamic where feminist film critics have asked the question, is this furthering patriarchal ideologies on women by featuring so much violence against women um, in such horrific, gory kinds of ways? Or is it transcending uh, patriarchal ideologies by featuring female protagonists that can survive the horror and eventually emerge victorious over their um, over these monstrous figures that are featured in horror. And so what this study specifically sought to do um, is expand upon the ideas of previous feminist scholarships and analyze the 2005 horror film, The Descent, to understand how the film utilizes its visual elements and subject matter to both subvert and enforce the Madonna whore dichotomy, to highlight female rage as repressed, and to provide insight into the fear behind the abject female body as it is depicted as a physical place of terror and monstrosity. And I used two methodological frameworks to study this phenomenon, it's particularly feminist criticism and psychoanalysis. Feminist criticism is understood as a tool to assess the influence of patriarchal ideologies on, in, on any text. Um, and in particular, I'm looking at the Madonna whore dichotomy as it's reproduced in this film. Uh, the Madonna whore dichotomy refers to society's rather reductive view or tendency to view women in a rather reductive way as either virginal uh, maternal Madonna figures or seductive provocative whores. Um, and I wanted to study how that's uh, kind of represented in this film. Psychoanalysis is employed particularly utilizing Barbara Creed's notion of the monstrous feminine. And to give a very brief description of the monstrous feminine, uh, Creed identifies this as the phenomenon of female monsters and pays particularly pays a particular importance to gender in the construction of her monstrosity. Prior to Creed, uh, feminine or film critics typically looked at horror films uh, by studying women as victims, and Creed wanted to expand on this view by looking at women as monsters. Uh, Julia Kristoff's notion of abjection is also employed in this study. Kristeva terms abjection as the things that do not respect borders, position, rules, and disturbs identity system and order. The abject is the place between humanity and monstrosity, the place between life and decay. And I'm using this particularly to look at the setting of the cave itself. And so to begin our discussion on um, the Madonna whore dichotomy, which is particularly noticeable in Sarah and Juno. Sarah is our main protagonist and she's immediately identified as the Madonna of this film. She is a wife and she is a mother, which fits into this heteronormative patriarchal ideal of a woman in society. Um, she exemplifies a lot of the traits associated with the Madonna and Juno is are her best friend who quickly is identified as the whore. She's having an adulterous relationship with Sarah's husband. Um, and so she's then typecasted as this adulterous, provocative whore. Um, and this is furthering the notions that Madonna equals good and whore equals evil as Sarah is the one who is betrayed and Juno is the betrayer. But then we have this interesting role reversal at, at about the midpoint of the film, when at the start of the film, Sarah loses the things that make her the Madonna. Sarah loses her husband and she loses her child in a car accident. And then when the women get stuck underground in the cave, Sarah gets separated from the rest of the group and she's forced to survive on her own, while Juno takes on this kind of nurturing maternal protective function as the leader of the remaining group of women. And Sarah is 
left to kind of only care for her own self-preservation, while as Juno is unwavering in her dedication to the group, um, particularly in getting Sarah out of the cave alive. And then there's the scene where they finally meet here, um, and we can see how different Sarah looks compared to at the start of the film compared to Juno now, and she's quite shocked by her appearance. And in the film's climax, Sarah actually debilitates Juno and leaves her for dead and makes her own way and makes her escape. So there's this role reversal of the Madonna Horde economy happening by the end of the descent. And furthering that is this notion of Barbara Creed's monstrous feminine. And we have a lot of parallels between the monstrous cave creatures featured here on the bottom right. So they're, that's what they look like. Um, and with Sarah, and when she's separated, she has to survive. And she ends up taking up a lot of the mannerisms of the cave creature. She begins crawling on the ground like one, even the way she fights them off, she uses her teeth to rip out the throat of one of them, which is the way that they've been shown to kill the other members of the group. Um, and I think if we kind of examine this from a larger understanding of societies and Hollywood's traditional aversion to showcasing this kind of female rage, um, I, uh, academics and perhaps most notably from pop culture, Amy Dunn from Gone Girl identifies this phenomenon as the cool girl phenomenon. Um, this idea that women, or sorry, that society and Hollywood likes to showcase sanitized representations of female emotions. Um, and this is in direct contrast to that. And lastly, we have to understand the caves as womb-like in their construction. This is coming from uh, Julia Kristevov's notion of abjection. Um, this is the place where meaning collapses. It's this kind of mutated parallel of the female reproductive system as exhibited through the structures and construction of the caves. We see these long winding tunnels that evoke images of the female reproductive system. We see these huge vats of blood, which might call to mind images of menstruation, violent birth, even castration, as Barbara Creed and Julia Kristevoff would argue. Um, additionally, if we understand the caves as kind of functioning as this archaic mother, in that she is the bringer of this monstrous life, the cave creatures become the offspring of this monstrous womb uh, that are meant to maim and destroy all who enter, um, effectively castrating them when they enter the womb. Um, and Thank you so much for the time update. I really appreciate that. Um, and then, yeah, then Sarah kind of ends up being a production of this as well. She ends up being an offspring of this monstrous womb. And that's kind of where our film ends with Sarah still stuck in the cave, um, alive, but still trapped. Thank you so much for listening. Um, that's the end of my time. So I'll end there. I'll figure out how to stop sharing. Thank you so much. That was that was very interesting. Um, I'd like to open up the floor for a couple of minutes for attendees or other panelists to ask a couple of questions. Um, I believe the attendees can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and I'll read off the questions if you all have any. So, <clears throat> <laughs> Hi, Jackie. I was wondering if you could, uh, um, if you could elaborate on how, you know, this cave, I mean, obviously it's blurred, you said you may, you bring Kristeva to the fore and therefore there's a lot of blurring of uh, the margins between states. Um, so would you go for a positive reading of you know of i mean is this film empowering in the end do you think or does it leave gaps mm. for uh crit critique i mean of even feminist f feminist uh, achievement I and mean, obviously when was it made 2000 and i mean it's very recent in uh mm -hmm in terms of uh, the history of feminism. So just to give us a little bit about your read. 
Yeah, that's a really great question. Honestly, I haven't come to a complete conclusion on whether or not I think this is an empowering depiction of a of, of feminist representation as seen on horror films. And I think this is something that feminist critics critics, I'm sorry, my dog is whining in the background. I think this is something feminist critics have kind of struggled with with horror films, whether or not to see this as something that's empowering or or not. Um, and I think in the descent, it's interesting because while they're able to kind of step away from a super reductive view of women as either Madonnas or whores, they end up kind of falling into that same trap. I mean, a lot of the plot of the film centers around these two women's relationship to a man who, while he's deceased throughout the entire film, his presence kind of haunts the film like a ghost. He's kind of the driving force behind why they're even in the cave, why there's conflict between the two women. And so then in that way, even though it features a completely female cast, all of the events of the film are centered around this one man and his sexual relationship with these two women. Um, so I would say it's a complicated uh, relationship. Obviously, the all-female cast isn't enough to make it a feminist film, but it's certainly something that I think we'd like to see more of <laughs> um, in horror films even today. Um, but yeah, that's it's a complicated answer. It's a yes and no kind of answer. <laughs> All right, and we have an audience question. Awesome. Are there newer horror films that feature only women? And if so, has the formula changed at all with the horror slash temptress and virgin archetypes? It, sorry, the question was if there's new contemporary examples of this all-female cast? Yes, it, it's what it appears to be. Okay, great. Um, I can only think of a couple, and there might be more out there. Um, I think of Annihilation, uh, particularly, which featured a, a cast of all-female scientists venturing out into this um, abject, unknown environment. Um, and in the end, it kind of ends up very, quite similarly to The Descent in that all the women end up deceased except for our female protagonist. So it still falls under this idea of, um, I guess, this final girl theory that Carol Clover talks about in the slasher genre as only being able to, only one woman is able to survive by the end of the film and all of the other women are rendered kind of their survival as unimportant to the ultimate conclusion of the story. Um, I missed the second part of the question if there's a second part to that. Um, yes, it asks, has the formula changed at all recently with the whore slash temptress and virgin archetypes? I would like to think so, but I would probably say no. A lot of our understanding of women in horror films is still rooted in that. I think there's been a contemporary example that kind of seeks to defy that a little bit. Um, the, the new movies, I think, are called X and Pearl and Maxine is coming out recently. This is a trilogy by Ty West, where it features actually a sex worker as our main protagonist. So it's kind of going totally against this idea of the virgin whore dichotomy and only the pure virginal Madonna can survive by the end of the film. Um, and so that would, I, I would say that one kind of defies it, but in general, we're still seeing this as like the final girl who's able to survive embodies characters of the virginal Madonna and therefore is kind of understood as worthy of survival in patriarchal societies for what we understand women's value to be. Thank you so much. Um, we're out of time for questions. So we're gonna move on to the next panelist, but there'll be more time for questions at the end if people are still curious. Awesome. Thank you so much for listening. All right. Um, our next presenter today is Shoya Yang. Shoya is a junior at Wake Forest University, majoring in women's gender and sexuality studies with minors in East Asian language and culture human health service, and studio art. Shoya's interest in Asian American feminism focuses on Asian American parenthood, queer media, queer culture, and transnational food culture. Shoya's other research interests include gender representation of transnational women in manga books and their readership. 
Shoya received the Richter Scholarship last year for this research. As a proud queer Asian American feminist, Shoya believes in the power of people standing together with those who need allies. Shoya's research is entitled American, but not too American, Asian American Parenthood and Beyond. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley, for the introduction. And now I'm going to start the, um, the screen share. OK, so good morning, everyone. So today, uh, I'm Xiaoya. I'm, from, I'm junior from Wake Forest University. And I have major on women's gender and sexuality studies. And so today, I'm going to talk about Asian American parenthood. And we have our title, American, but not too American. And I will talk about this title a little bit later. But like now, I want to in invite you all of you to imagine a character for this presentation. So who comes to your mind when you see the phrase Asian American parent? Uh, let me think. So let me guess several possible uh, characters that may come to your mind. So first one, absolutely, is Amy Choi, who is so famous as her title as a tiger mother. And another two possible characters may be Constant Wu and Michelle Yang. Both of them cast uh, a, another two tiger mothers in a sitcom and also the film Everything Everywhere All at Once. And we will talk about this film a little bit later. So from all of these three images and examples, we actually has an image of the stereotypical Asian uh, American parents. So they are absolutely firstly, they're absolutely gender. We always think about like mothers, but it seems like those fathers, Asian American fathers, they are like invisible and disappeared. And also they are mothers in their thirties and forties. So which means they are middle-aged women who are not the hypersexualized um, East Asian woman stereotype, but they are more like the stereotypical motherhood role. And also they have long and black hair. And to some extent they fit into the stereotypical image of an Asian woman. And more importantly, they fit into the model minority. Um, they are like very hardworking and seems like they want their children to be like them. And because of this, they have a very strict and stubborn parenthood that seems like they oppress their children and they are really bad educators for many people. So like why this stereotypes exist and why the society's belief in these stereotypes? I want to introduce the first reason, which actually is educational, cultural, and racial anxiety from American publics. So there are so many critiques, even attacks to Amy Choi and other Asian American. But actually, this critique demonstrate Asian American, also like American society's fear of Asian American groups who would rob social resources from Americans. However, in this discourse, we can see like real privileged groups who hold the most abundant educational resources. They are invisible. They leave Asian American parents at the tar as the target for criticism and or even attack. So the second reason is the cultural essentialism. So people are tend to attribute top education as an Asian or Asian American culture while ignoring the complication behind. But we all know that is not simply a cultural issue, but more like a social structural issue, right? So the third reason is a condescending comparison. So the long lasting comparison between European American uh, parenthood and Asian American parenthood depicts Asian American parenthood negatively. We can see like how only dominant educational groups, dominant parenthood, they has the right to define what is good parenthood and what is bad. So we can see like, deeper reasons that the limited educational resources left for the Asian American family made them to make their own choices. And under this limited uh, resources, those stereotypes and also the pressure of assigning nations, uh, we can see there, they have their special strategies in education. So the sociologist, Dr. Uh, Pei Chia Lan, she showed us this um, complications with her model of the spectrum of Asian American parenthood education strategies. So on this spectrum, we have two sides. 
On one of the sides, we have a strategy named Assimilating Middle Class White Families Education. So these parents are always middle class Asian American parents. They shun away from traditional Asian American education style like physical punishment. They want to be love expressing and open minded. They encourage their children to be themselves and encourage them to engage in very like elite work like golfing and skiing to some extent. They want to make assimilations to the middle-class white families' educations, the elite educations. So we can see their effort that they want to be American and they want to make their children to be American. On the another side of the spectrum is always the strategies for working class Asian American parents. They want to enhancing ethnicity strengths. They want to, because they are so worried about that their children are not competitive enough to compete those limited education resources with other children. So they encourage their children to like um, work more hard on their academic. And also they encourage their children to learn um, East Asian, especially cultural skills like Chinese yo-yo. So we can see like how these parents really want their children to become not too American. But actually most family, their education strategies sit in somewhere between this spectrum. And we can see like no matter where their strategy seated, there's a double standard for them that they has to be assimilated, but they also has to be very hardworking. So now we can see like how their parent, the, East, uh, the Asian American parent who an education strategy, they fall into what Malaka said in her memoir of experience as an Asian American girl. That's like those Asian American parents, they want their children to becoming American, but not too American under this structural. Um, pressure. So if social inequality and Asian American parenthood's education mutually affect each other, which forms an enclosed tragic circle. So can we challenge it? And of course we can. So this is, this is why I have this presentation, right? We can see like queerness in parenthood, especially queerness in motherhood in films and documentaries really challenge those stereotypes. And I will use three works, two films, and one documentary to explain this. So first, we have the very cute animation film from Pixel Art st uh, Studio, The Turning Red. So in Turning Red, queerness is shared oppression. In Turning Red, the second generation Asian American teenage girl, Mei Mei, will turn into a red panda when she is outraged. But the society expects Asian American women to be quiet, controllable, and virtuous. So May's mother internalized these expectations. Not only does she conform to these expectations, but she also projects the same expectations to Mei Mei in order to protect Mei Mei from potential punitive consequences. So with this like educational and racial anxiety, Mei Mei's mother suppresses her own red panda power and also Mei Mei's red panda powers. So we can see like how in turning red, the red panda power symbolizes queerness as power and as isolated experience of Asian American women, while the suppression of the red panda power symbolizes white supremacy in reality that oppresses Asian American women groups and also the entire Asian American groups. But the interesting is actually in the end of this film, Mei Mei not only embraces her own queerness power, the red panda power, but she also, and they, she also wants to rebel the social norm. And further, she facilitates intergenerational solidarity among women in her family. So we can see in this image there like Mei Mei, her mother, her grandmother, and also her aunt. So within these solidarities, this woman recognizes their shared power and powerlessness. And more importantly, the social oppression that suppresses their power. So we can see in turning red that Asian mother is not only oppressor, like in the stereotypes, but they are also being oppressed. The, the break and the, the broken image of the stereotypes and the reverse um, images that we make the audience to think like if Asian American mothers, Asian American parents are not real oppressors to their children. So who are the real oppress oppressor? that oppressing Asian American women and also Asian American children and the entire groups, right? And also we can see the reversing mother and doctor role in this like um, film. We can see like actually Mei Mei is one who can like save her mother out. So it's reversed like 
the power dynamic between the stereotypical mother and doctor relationship in Asian American America. So then we have our very famous film, um, Everything Everywhere, All at Once. And in, in every, All at Once, queerness is a shared weakness. So in All at Once, the mother, Asian American mother, Evelyn, and her doctor transform as different self in different universe. So their pan ethnicity identities actually complicate Asian American parenthood and family relationship. So they try to reject the monolithic stereotypes to Asian American parents, mothers, and also doctors. And we can also see the reversing parental relationship in all at once. So the mother looks like a live in a little bit messy situations, like deal with her uh, the work and education, and she to some extent is a little bit innocent uh, compared to her doctor, who is more like a devil like uh, role and act like a boss to the role. And so we can, but all, both of them actually show their weakness. The mother showed their weakness to dealing with the messy life and the doctor showed their weakness to deal with um, the pressure of her identity issues. So with this shared queerness of weakness, the mother and doctor lead, has their reconciliations. So you may ask like, so both of those films seems like they depend on the supernatural powers for reconciliations and actually they are not in reality. They're all fictional films. So is this possible in reality that we can challenge the stereotypes? So the answer actually is yes. So in Grace Lee Project, we have the Grace who she and her friend Koi formed their special family as a lesbian existence to fight against the patriarchal family structure. Grace identity as a Korean adoptee actually empowers her to challenge the traditional family structure. And further, her hearing special need builds a new way for her to communicate with her son, which enriches their relationship. So her family is diverse and her motherhood is supportive and full of communication, which challenge our stereotypes. So in the end of the, um, my presentation, I want to highlight um, a quote from Christy Guo, who is the stand up comedist and also a filmmaker, which I have heard her words just like the day before yesterday. And she said, racism, white supremacy, and systematic oppression are not the sharks, but the water, which really reminds us like to think about the issue of Asian American parenthood, that we, this discourse are lack of the white voice, but we also need to think about how the white supremacy power play in this discourse. And thank you so much for listening and please send any of your question and comment to my email. And I think we will have a question discussions uh, session and please ask your burning, uh, sh share your burning thought and your questions uh, with me. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, do we have any questions from the audience or other panelists? I would like to uh, ask Shaya if, um, Shaya, do you think that the representation of uh, the stereotype has changed? I mean, somehow I'm thinking we have in Western society, it seems that there is, particularly in terms of, I don't know if, I mean, we hope that things are changing um, you know in progressive ways certainly the representation seems to be changing uh, generally so i was wondering mm -hmm. if uh, you think that um, you see some kind of encouraging signs for the future from now on you know if there anything that you expect that certain things are going to change and this representation is particular of you know say Tiger moms, if it's going to be, you know, presented in a more complex and complicated way. And also, um, I was wondering if the image of this power in, you know, it's a little bit troublesome to have power that is there, but in another universe. So, you know, it's almost as if it doesn't exist, or, mm -hmm. you know, if it's not in this universe, but in another how empowering is that? And so, I don't know. Um, actually, I haven't watched the film yet, so I, I can't tell, but I, you know, I, from what you were saying, it seems that 
um, if queerness is associated with weakness, I mean, is queerness going to be associated with weakness or with strength in the future? That's what I'm thinking. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Brizano. And so I think your question is about like, how does fictional or to some extent the change of representation in the film can like affect the reality and is there any possibility of change um, in the reality, right? I just want to make sure. Uh, Dr. Bazzano, I think you mute yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I just said that uh, I lost you somehow the connection, even I'm away for us, but the, the connection doesn't seem to be <laughs> working well. Uh, if uh, in your in your knowledge, seeing some films and, you know, even 10 years ago or even films now, maybe in the future, if there's some perceived change, maybe more attention to say, to, compl to, to present a stereotype that is not like, you know, the black and white stereotype that we've seen, but there are a few things, obviously the queering, uh, but in the future, what's going to happen? That's what I was trying to, to mm -hmm. see what you imagine for the future. Ah, okay. So actually, I think my imagining of the future actually at first is everybody's recognitions of the stereotypes. Because I think like the recognitions and acknowledgement of the stereotypes and the power dynamic behind the stereotypes is a beginning point for us to actually change our perceiving and interpretation of Asian American parenthood. And so that we can facilitate like for example, real political change of it. And because actually this issue is to some extent becoming a glo globalized issue. For example, me as a mean, like a chi Chinese uh, people, my parents always sh also share with this anxiety and stereotypes. So as more and more people like share this anxiety and more and more people recognize this anxiety and the op real oppression, so I think it will be, can facilitate a change. But actually, I also need to uh, say, to be honest, that it's very hard also for me to imagine like what it would be look like if we don't have this stereotype, we are we overcome this stereotypes in our educational system, right? But thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that's the end of the Q&A for now, but if we have more questions at the end, we can always come back to them. Um, all right, our final presenter today is Gabriela Valencia. Gabby is a senior majoring in anthropology and minoring in Latin American studies, English and history at Wake Forest University. Gabby's work is entitled Healing Through Beyonce's Use of Counter Narrative and Lemonade. All yours, Gabby. Hi, I'm Gabby. Thank you for the introduction, Ashley. My pronouns are she, her. I'm going to get all set up here. With the screen sharing, everyone can see. Yes. yes. Okay, great. All right. Cool. So today I'm going to be talking about the ways in which Beyonce uplifts community healing and solidarity in her visual album, Lemonade. I'm going to specifically focus on the ways in which she celebrates femininity and blackness. So for those of you who are interested in watching the visual album, you can stream it on Tidal. Some portions of it are available for free on YouTube on Beyonce's official channel, but these music videos unfortunately miss the transitions and poetry by Warson Shire in between the songs. Anyways, Lemonade tells the story of a painful reconciliation and reparation of a broken marriage. Simultaneously, it addresses the ways in which Beyonce as a Black woman is healing from oppression and generational trauma. The album follows an arc of intuition, denial, anger, apathy, emptiness, accountability, reformation, forgiveness, resurrection, hope, and redemption. And these are words that show up in between each of the songs. So first we will talk about some specific things that Lemonade reclaims. And rage specifically is a perfect connection to something that was mentioned in the past two presentations. So 
Black rage is typically weaponized. As Audre Lorde explores in her paper, The Uses of Anger, Black people are perceived as dangerous when they express their anger, even though their anger at a system that continuously exploits and subjugates them is undoubtedly just. Many activists have been told to make their expression of anger more palatable to the public in order to enact change, even though, as once again, Audre Lorde puts it, can't use the master's tools to dismantle his house. Nevertheless, within Lemonade, Beyonce turns the trope of the angry Black woman on its head. She is not afraid to be shown indulging in her anger. In the song Hold Up, she gleefully attacks private property with a baseball bat and laughs at its destruction. While holding up two middle fingers and sorry, Beyonce snubs the respectability politics she is expected to acquiesce to. Additionally, there's a lot of reclamation of the Black body as well. As we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation, Beyonce celebrates her own sexiness within the album. By embracing and even challenging, championing the sexuality of Black women, Beyonce transforms the Black woman's body into a side of pleasure rather than a side of domination and subjugation, which is the result of current systems, sure, but is also the result of the trauma of enslavement. And this brings me to my last point on the slide, which is that Beyonce reclaims antebellum history through her use of counter narrative within this visual album. The Southern Gothic atmosphere sets the tone for much of this album and Beyonce really effectively blends the horrific with the beautiful to create something that simultaneously acknowledges black trauma and celebrates the beauty of the black experience. See, there are various points in which Black women are showcased thriving within plantation mansions. Some of the Black women are even wearing the hoop skirts associated with the era. Additionally, there are pieces of furniture with African designs within the plantation mansions. This is an artistic choice that reinvents antebellum history and spins it in a way in which it celebrates rather than diminishes Blackness. It highlights the presence of Black people and culture in spaces where their voices and stories have been and still are silenced. Even when people visit plantations in the United States now, the suffering and resilience of the enslaved people that live there is erased. Their stories are never centered, but in this visual album, Beyonce flips the script so that the presence of Black people and their culture cannot be ignored. So, Lemonade also highlights other pertinent issues to the Black community, including environmental racism and police brutality. Right before the song Love Drought, Beyonce lays in New Orleans Superdome, where many Black folks took refuge during Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina was an example of environmental racism because a majority of the people impacted were working class Black people and the natural disaster was also really detrimental to members of the uh, Black members of the middle class because of the destruction of businesses. So Beyonce also addresses police brutality in the song Formation where she sits on top of a cop car that is caught in a flood. During a powerful moment in the song Forward, the mothers of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and Eric Garner hold up pictures of their boys. This is a tragic moment where what is lost is deeply acknowledged, but Beyonce later paints an image of what the future could like. Going back to formation, she offers a positive counter narrative within the song because there is a moment in which a young black boy break dances in front of a row of police officers and in response, they hold up their hands and surrender. So within this specific counter narrative, black culture is allowed to flourish without intervention. So now we will talk about how it is impossible to watch Lemonade without recognizing its celebration of black femininity, especially when you look at the fashion. So Beyonce encourages members of her community to embrace their distinctly black features. This is evident in some of the lyrics of formation that I have attached on this slide. Beyonce fully embraces extensions and jewelry in spite of a society that devalues femininity, especially Black femininity. Additionally, many of the background dancers are wearing traditional African attire, such as a nakra, which is a style of clothing and fabric. Beyonce clearly demonstrates, oh, and a picture of that is what Beyonce is wearing. Um, Beyonce clearly demonstrates pride in the cultural heritage she inherited from the Euro 
tribe of West Africa. The body art the women wear in sari, which is the other picture, was designed by Lalu Simbanjo, and the practice derives from a spiritual Yoruba ritual. So the album has plenty of images of women supporting each other. This is because they share each other's pain and know the best ways to support each other. This type of understanding is indicated in the song, Sorry, where Beyonce includes a voiceover from Malcolm X. And in this voiceover, it's the Malcolm X quote of, the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. But Lemonade focuses on how black women have conjured beauty out of circumstances that were supposed to create pain. Lemonade promotes intergenerational healing. This is especially obvious in the clip that Beyonce included of Jay-Z partners grandmother saying, I was served lemons, but I made lemonade. And this quote obviously looms over the entire project. So this specific intergenerational healing applies to cheating within interpersonal relationships since lemonade was a response to an affair, as well as dealing with institutional oppression. So Clearly, Lemonade seamlessly blends the personal with the political. While grappling with the betrayal of her husband, Beyonce quotes the Somali poet Warson Shire. Beyonce echoes, am I talking about your husband or your father in regards to infidelity? And even though Beyonce's father cheated on her mother, which is pretty well known, uh, she continues to deeply love her father. There's a song on the album called Daddy Lessons which showcases how she recognizes her hum his humanity. Likewise, she understands her husband's fallibility and still considers him to be her soulmate, and they resolve to make it work. But that isn't to say that it excuses the like, pain inflicted. Beyonce clearly knows her worth, and this is like an arc that is also very present in the album, like especially evident in the song, Don't Hurt Yourself. She resolves to repair the relationship with her husband, but she will no longer pretend to be like, quote, prettier or softer. She will not let any man quote, for, make her forget her own name. She will re-enter the relationship on equal standing. Now that her partner realizes that, this is another quote, that she is the most bomb pussy and understands that he loves himself when he loves her. She refuses to be walked over, which promotes a healthier relationship since love demands respect. Love prompts healing. After the song, Sandcastles, one woman asks, so how are we supposed to lead our children to the future? And the response is through love. In Lemonade, Beyonce fiercely loves herself and fiercely loves the other black women in her community. She uses is her art to convey the message that healing and self-growth are impossible without love and forgiveness. So here's some of the works or the references and I will be taking any questions now. All right, do we have any questions for Gabby specifically before we move on to the general questions for the entire panel? Well, well, I'll give them a moment to think and type. I was wondering what drew you specifically to um, this visual album? Like what's, what piqued your interest? Yeah, I was actually assigned it for class and I hadn't really been like a big Beyonce fan before. Like obviously like I liked the singles that were popular and stuff, but I was just struck by how beautiful and well-crafted this album is. And just in general, I'm pretty drawn to visual albums. And like the Southern Gothic style of it was really interesting to me. And I wanted to think more critically about it. 
Thank you. Any other questions before we move on to the general Q&A? It doesn't appear so. All right. Um, well, I'll give you all a moment to, to enter your questions for the entire panel, but I'll start off by asking, how do you think representation through images can help toward the progress of social justice? Is imagery less important than words in activating change? And whoever wants to take it can go ahead. Personally, I think that both are just as effective because they're both mediums of conveying stories and stories to help people build compassion in, general, in whatever form they take. Right, and actually to some extent, I think um, image and words, they cannot work separately. Because for example, when we are talking about it, even, even though like when we are just like having this conversation, actually to some extent what I said in words, to some extent will transform as an image in others' mind. I don't know if this makes sense. Like actually when we're doing the, our language communication and when we read literature, when we see the words, actually sometimes we also have images in our minds. And to some extent, when we see an image, we can also translate it into a word. So I think there actually, there isn't a very clear boundary between them two. And as different, to some extent, different media, I, I want to say that I think image has, um, it gives to some extent different word like extra stimulations to us. And when we see the images is will give us um, maybe more impressive impressions especially when we talk about, um, for example, feminism or like queerness, I think there's a nature for queerness is to some extent is the colorful, the color scheme and also the chaos, the atmosphere of it. And so I think to this extent, the images, they contribute to build our um, understanding and perception about the idea of queerness or to some extent feminism, we also have some special colors as a very um, symbolized of feminism groups, right? Yeah, I absolutely agree. You guys said it really well. Um, I think that especially given how predominant the entertainment industry is in America, representation ends up being really critical um, and seeing, you know, representations of people of all kinds is like crazy important um and you guys summed it up really well so i won't take up any more time but i just wanted to say i agree i have a, <clears throat> a small question i want to be um, looking at the time but i i was wondering for the three of you um when you you know you're doing research on uh, film on uh, stereotypes of um you know, ethnic stereotypes, or uh, or even discussing the um, you know empowerment of you know black women. So, how much when you do this kind of research? How much of your how much are you aware? I mean, how much do you project yourself? And while doing that, you're aware of where you are, you know, and and perspectives usually. Um, I don't know if I, <laughs> geographical, culturally, everything. I mean, how, how do you do this work, you know, as a student researching these things and positioning yourself and, and thinking about that position? I think that's a great question, especially when in academia, you're kind of like presented as like the most pure form of research is objective research, according to traditional um, academic understandings of what how, how knowledge is produced. And so I think the field of um, women's studies and the field of, and I come from communication as well, um, is kind of starting to bring in subjective experience to research to understand how our unique and individual perspectives shape how we view research. And I think it's been, um, definitely 
put in a position of being more highly valued than it was. Um, so I think it's an important addition to have in research today is understanding where people are coming from and how they arrive at specific conclusions. Um, yeah. Well, I, I totally agree with Jackie and, and really think this subjectivity to some extent is overlooked in academia to some extent. And actually, I think this is what makes feminism studies very like special and important because to some extent it's embraced and encourages subjectivity. And from an individual or like personal perspective, actually when I'm doing my research and when I was writing this paper, I cried a lot. Because when I saw like the stereotypes on the Asian American parent or something like that, I also felt like my parents actually are facing the same struggle. And to some extent, I it's not very good. To some extent, maybe, but I will sometimes I also project myself off it. But I think another way to under this projection is standing with. So to some extent, even though I'm not an Asian American um, children or Asian American woman, but to some extent, I stand with them, stand with this group because of our sharing like oppression or feelings and all. So maybe because of the projection. So I think like to some extent the projection during the research and study actually help us to has the power and the ability to stand with certain groups. And actually the experience of standing with with certain groups creates or emerges, make us have new knowledge or and new feelings about this entire discourse. And now when I share my this this of my abundant feelings with with you, with of our part participant, and to some extent we has, I don't know, maybe a new knowledge or a new experience in this discourse. I think like this subjectivity is very beneficial to our study from this perspective, right? Yeah, that was a beautiful point about like being transformed as you do this type of research, research. <laughs> but anyways, I, yes, I agree. And I just wanted to echo like everyone's thoughts about like the importance of acknowledging one's positionality and how you exist, like in relation to the content that you are thinking about. All right, we're, oh. Go ahead, Dr. Bazzano. I just said thank you and then I mute my, <laughs> I had to unmute myself, sorry. Um, we're almost at time. So if we have any more quick questions, we can probably squeeze them in. But if not, um, I would like to thank everyone on the panel and the audience members for attending today and for provoking some really good questions and, and you know, thoughts. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ashley, for moderating this session. Thank you. Um, I think that we have a break for lunch and then we'll resume at 12.15. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bozzano. Thank you. Hey. hey. <laughs> For a second, I thought I'm alone here. Is this the right one? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like the background of the, the <laughs> Eugene. Oh, <thanks. laughs> Charisma messy house. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's nice because we are this year, we are co sponsoring with um, UGA. Mm -hmm. We are in a practice session, so I'll start uh, the webinar maybe in a minute just to 
give ourselves the time. Let me see. Uh, we are miss. Oh, Elizabeth, you're there. Thanks for being there. <laughs> Ariella, you're there. Cassandra, waiting for Jane. Okay. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Ariella, I actually have a question for you. Would you mind reading the title of your presentation so I can try and get the pronunciations correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, so wait, what is it called? Let me see. Um, okay, so yeah, so it's a genealogical reading of Jin Jian Azadi or Women, Life, Freedom, uh, Gina Amini's death and the role of women in the Kurdish liberation movement. Perfect. I was trying to find pronunciations online and I could not. So thank you. <laughs> uh, no, no worries at all. Thanks for clarifying. Um, <clears throat> okay. Hopefully, uh, hopefully Jane will come. If she doesn't come, we can do the order and then she comes at the end but uh if she comes later uh because i think that uh she was maybe in a classroom or something but i'll um it's, i'll start the webinar now and then we can miss it okay oh there it is hi jane <laughs> so we are ready we're ready to go and we can just uh, one minute and then uh, Elizabeth, you can start. <clears throat> Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Um, Alyssa, I have like one slide. Am I able to share my screen? Okay. I think you're you're already able to. But okay. If not, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have some great panelists that are really excited to present uh, their research today. So first up, we have Cassandra Dodd. Her presentation is titled Understanding the Sex Exploitation of Black Women and Girls Within Human Sex Trafficking Through a Black Feminist Lens. Cassandra is a PhD student at the University of Georgia. She is a licensed clinical social worker with 16 years of experience in the her primary research explores the intersection of child welfare and the oppressive exploitation of youth with critical and feminist theories. So Cassandra, take it away. Okay, um, so I'm gonna share a conceptual framework I've been working on is very much a work in progress uh, while I speak and just kind of talk about how I got there. Okay. Can you all still see that? Okay. So again, I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Cassandra Dunn, and um, as was mentioned, I'm a third year doctoral student here at the University of Georgia. And in my former life, as also mentioned, I was a clinical social worker in the foster care system in Washington, DC. And that has very much influenced my research and brought me here today as to where I am. And my research focus is the intersection between child welfare and human sex trafficking in the United States. Now, as how I got here, I very unexpectedly become an anti-trafficking advocate. Um, that was not my ideal even attention while I became a social worker. Um, when I became a social worker first out of school, I did not even know or understand the extent of human sex trafficking in the United States, um, especially with child sex trafficking. And I didn't realize that until I started working with children in the foster care system. 
Um, my first caseload was teen moms. Um, I thought I'd be working with babies and mothers. Um, all of my clients were African-American. And I also found later that most of them were being sex trafficked. So I kind of found myself scrambling, trying to find resources um, to help them. And a lot of the complex issues they had was complex trauma, uh, substance abuse, involvement with the criminal justice system, as well as being sexually exploited. Um, over time, I did kind of align myself with allies and got information, but there wasn't anything that was strongly evidence-based or anything really structural to kind of help the providers really help people or the, the girls who were being trafficked. So that frustration actually kind of led me back to coming back to graduate school after a significant amount of time and doing this research. And even when I started my research, I found that there wasn't a significant amount of information that looked at trafficking through a theoretical lens um, from a cultural basis. A lot of it was individualized. It was still very much victim blaming. Some of that is evolving, but a lot of it still has not evolved. And for me, it really didn't look at the structural, oppressive structural undergirdings as to why trafficking happens and why it's still happening, especially particularly in the United States. So with all my digging and looking at statistics, what I didn't realize is that 40% of African-American women are the primary group being trafficked in the United States, while they only make up 13% in the population. You couple that with the alarming high rate of Black women and families who are also involved in the child welfare system. So you're looking at some really high intersections and statistics as to what is happening with Black women in the United States um, within all these structures. So again, looking and digging, I didn't see a whole lot of theoretical frameworks that really spoke to what was happening and why it was happening. So I started learning about Black feminist theory uh, through Patricia, Patricia Hill Collins. And Black feminist theory is a social critical theory that really looks at and explains the lived experiences of Black women in America. And so what you see on the screen is my random thoughts and lines of trying to deconstruct um, human trafficking for African-American women from a Black feminist lens and really looking at why this is happening, why it continues to happening, happen, and why it keeps being perpetuated within our society within the US. Um, so you can kind of see on the screen, looking at exploitation of Black labor, starting from enslavement, um, controlling images of Black women um, that's still in within social media, um, political oppression and where I kind of am, the contribution of African-American intellectuals and how we can kind of look at this and, and really understand it better. So my ultimate goal with this, um, and I'm still very much in the research phase, is to continue to dig through this, continue to look at these concepts, but to also do my research uh, working with women who are doing the work with survivors of survivors who've been trafficked in the child welfare system, but also speak to those women and girls to get a better understanding of their experiences and how we can potentially with this research, look at our culturally based interventions that can kind of provide better supports for them. Um, I do want to give the disclaimer that uh, trafficking impacts everyone from different demographics, genders, et cetera. Um, but because of certain vulnerabilities through um, racial oppression and structural racism, there are certain groups that are more vulnerable, um, such as indigenous women and as well as people within the LGBT community, community. But it just so happens that with my particular research from the population I used to work with is focused on African-American women. But the, I say that to say there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, so that kind of concludes where I am with this concept map at the moment. Great, thank you so much. So now we're gonna open up the floor for a few questions. Um, if anyone wants to drop them in the chat, I believe that's how we're doing. And then I can ask Cassandra for you. As we wait for the first one to roll through, I actually have a question to kick it off, if that's all right. Okay. Um, I'm curious, as you speak to these survivors, um, have you started speaking to them yet? Have you conducted those interviews? Do you have like a game plan for how you do that? Sorts of questions that you ask them. I would just love to hear a little bit more about how those go. Yeah, I haven't started a process yet. That will probably be my dissertation. 
Um, so I haven't started that process as of yet. I did do a pilot study with African-American professionals who work with, with survivors to understand their perspective and what they saw in the field um, as women of color and as women who work with um, survivors. And they gave me some really good insight as to um, the lens they work from, but also kind of similar frustrations to clients as far as barriers they even had as women of color and, and getting resources to, to be able to do their job. So it's on different levels of um, looking at how this affects uh, Black women. Thank you so much. I will leave the chat open for another minute here, maybe, with questions. I have a question, maybe someone else uh, will, but I'll jump in. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, I have a cold. <laughs> I didn't jump in at the right moment. Um, I'm thinking about <clears throat> generally in the mind of, uh, I don't know, say, uh, maybe the general public, I'm thinking. When, I think, when one hears sex, sex trafficking, one thinks about, I don't know, some um, maybe outside of the United States. That's um, the main misconception. And so I'm a particular appreciative of uh, your talk because obviously, by speaking out, you're going to, you know, that's what I always tell my students by bringing, I mean, obviously we can't make, we can't solve all the problems, but the first step towards solution, obviously you're doing something more than the first step. <clears throat> the first step is to bring uh, awareness. And uh, how much has been done, or do you think how much is going to be done that you think that something is moving in this direction? And if not, would you think that you're a PhD student? And so some of it will be, obviously you're working from all land in different ways, but would you think of uh, even a documentary about this? Or even partnering with <clears throat> an activist of the image to bring um, you know, uh, an issue such as this to uh, uh, the wider audience or wider audiences? Um, I had not thought of a documentary, so that's a great idea. Um, but I am planning to partner uh, with people who have lived experiences in survivors. Um, and I have actually a couple of shelters in mind that I am thinking about partnering with because I don't have that lived experience per se. I just work with survivors, um, but you're absolutely right. People hear the term and they think about, you know, what's happening outside the United States. So they think about what they see in a lifetime movie and that's not what's happening. And when you dig through it, it really goes back to um, social economic oppressions that's been happening in our country for a long time and who was happening to within those groups, but they don't always necessarily correlate human, tra human sex trafficking along with that, but it's very much happening. So um, like you mentioned, awareness is one, but most definitely uh, partnering with um, survivors and, and ideally a, a shelter that can help, you know, help me do the work. And a documentary is a great idea. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your work on this. All right, so it's looking like we don't have any more questions. So thank you so much, Cassandra, for your presentation. Um, absolutely incredible, and thanks for your work. And we will move on. Elizabeth, I don't know, do other people hear? Seems it's, uh, it's very muted. Do you all hear fine? Um, it's going in a little bit, in and out a little bit. Mm. Maybe if you can uh, get closer to it. <laughs> yes, yes, great, <laughs> thanks. Perfect. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thank you again, Cassandra, and we'll move on to our next presentation here. So our next presentation is called Black South African Women's Opposition to Passes Under Apartheid. Uh, it's by Jane Flint. Jane is currently an undergraduate student, um, history major at Wake Forest University in her junior year. Her historical studies are wide ranging as she is taking classes in African, Russian, and United States history. She studied abroad in Sorrento, Italy last summer. She took a women's gender and sexualities class while staying with a host family and the class and the experiences that came with it opened her mind to looking at the world through a different lens. She is currently taking a women's gender and sexuality studies class as well as a history research seminar titled Gender and Sexuality in World History. So Jane, floor is yours. All right, thank you for that um, introduction. I'm gonna pull up my slideshow really quick. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jane, as um, Elizabeth already said, and I'll be presenting on Black South African women's opposition to passes under apartheid. Um, this presentation is based on a curated source collection of primary and secondary sources that I created last spring in a class covering um, African history since 1850 with Dr. Nate Plademan here at Wake Forest. Um, to get started, I'm just going to provide some historical background. The era I'm looking at is the apartheid era in South Africa. Apartheid is the Afrikaans word for separateness and it spanned from 1948 to 1990. It was a time of severe segregation between white Europeans and black Africans living in South Africa. Within apartheid society, identification passes were implemented to enforce the separation of races. Um, passes were first implemented for men and later required for African women as well. And these passes provided police information about where black Africans were living and were required to leave um, black res residential areas. If Black Africans were caught without a pass, they could face imp imprisonment and possible punishment. In 1953, the government announced that passes would be extended to include requirements for Black women a few years later in 1956. Black South African women resisted the pass implementation because it would restrict their mobility in an apartheid society. However, women were not allowed into anti-apartheid groups organized by men, or if they were, they were not equally represented. These women did not feel that their concerns and demands such as past implementation were being heard. Therefore, Black South African women organized resistance to passes on their own terms. Although passes were eventually implemented for Black women, I would like to argue that their efforts and voices contributed to the overall anti-apartheid movement. And this can be related to today's political and social movements and that they um, may not immediately end in results, but um, are still significant in broader movements. So the first um, thing I'm going to start off with is an example from a woman's experience under the past system. And later on, I'll focus on resistance to um, the system by women. Under the past system, women were defined in their relationships with their husbands. And due to this, um, Black women were disproportionately affected because they were typically in their houses when um, police would come and check for past identification. Um, Rita Mfike was an unmarried Black woman who was arrested multiple times for not having a pass in her hometown. Upon the extension of the pass system to women, Mfike was um, forced to find her husband again, whom she had divorced years earlier. In this way, the pass system affected um, Black women in different ways compared to Black men. And I'm just going to read an excerpt from a book that outlines Mfike's experience under the pass system. Um, in Cape Town, if you were divorced, you had to have a pass. Um, but then in 1969, I had to go back to Middlesbrough because I was running away from the police. Um, 1967 was when we got divorced. That's when I was worried about the pass. Her encounters with the police had a familiar yet distressing pattern. They would take me to jail, they would catch me, and I would stay in jail and then come out again, and they would catch me again, over and over again. If I came out, I would get a very nice job, and I and then I had that job and they would catch me and then I would go back to jail again. Um, that the years on the run from the authorities had affected Rita's um, psych was clear. I was living a terrible life. When I see a police van, I think I'm going to be arrested. You cannot eat properly. Your children also suffered as a, con as a consequence. Um, she went back to Middle Drift in 1969 with her children. In 1971, she returned to Cape Town, but stated that the police were chasing me they were chasing me everywhere. Um, so this is like just kind of an example of what life um, under the past system for women was like. Um, and now I'm kind of going to um, transition into some of the resistance that they had. Um, so Lillian Goyer was a leader in the female resistance to apartheid. She was the first woman to be elected to the executive committee of the African National Congress, um, which was most it was male dominated. So that was like a really big deal. Um, in the following speech, Ngoye references the Women's March of, of August 1956, which is one of the largest political demonstrations in South Africa, and in which 20,000 women showed up to resist past implementation. She provides a call to action to women in resisting past laws and draws inspiration from the, past, the passion from pre previous events. In the interconnected world we live in, we should be building off one another's movements and successes, as Ngoye highlights here. 
Um, so here's an expert excerpt from one of her um, speeches. The principal and most pressing task of the Women's League at the present moment is to mobilize all the women of South Africa to fight against the extension of the passes to African women. The pass law is the basis and cornerstone of the system of oppression and exploitation in this country. The issue is perfectly clear. The government has decided that we shall carry passes. Must we accept this deception? Definitely not. To do so would be to expose the African women to all the evils that we have referred to above. We will lose our honor, betray our comrades at Winburg and Leitenburg and in numerous other towns and villages throughout the country where the daughters of Africa are being put up, are putting up a glorious struggle in defense of their rights. Only direct mass action will deter the corpsmen and stop it from proceeding its cruel laws. Um, so that's just a really powerful kind of um, example of how black women were um, speaking out against this injustice. Oops. Um, so now I'm gonna kind of talk about another resistance, which was um, Cherry Stefana Mgolo um, Sibeko. And she was a member of the Federation of South African Women, one of the female groups that was formed due to women's exclusion from male dominated anti-apartheid organizations. Um, her writings follow other large, another large demonstration of October 1958. And she highlights demands of black African women under apartheid, specifically the demands of mothers like earlier on in this speech. Um, black Africans as mothers was an issue that ANC and other male groups did not consider. So women have to take this issue upon themselves. Um, and here's an excerpt from one of Sebeko's writings that she submitted to a newspaper to be published. Uh, must an African woman really suffer the same as men? Why, must an African man really come home to find his wife has been arrested because she had forgotten to hang her passbook around her neck when she went to, sh to the shop or to call a doctor? I only wish the government of this country would go forward for peace, not only for whites, but for all South Africans, and especially the Africans who are the producers of all the wealth and happiness of the white people. African women do not want passes, not even the identity card. The identity card would will still be severe and will not solve the misery of the past. I call upon the government to stop creating unnecessary trouble and to leave the African women alone. Um, so now I'm just gonna kind of go into a few takeaways um, from like what I've just talked about. So black African, black South African women's resistance to passes is significant even though they had to endure the past system eventually. Um, since women were not allowed into the anti-apartheid movements dominated by men, their resistance overall is significant because they organized as women among themselves. Um, these women arrived at a point of not turning back from the politics of passes. Even after passes were implemented, they continued to resist them um, through different movements and even burning their passes at times. Um, and applying the women's anti past movement to today, their hard work and the eventual extension of the past system to women may seem insignificant. However, I argue that their demonstrations and resistance aided the overall anti-apartheid movement. Even when we think our actions are hopeless or um, not um, helping in any significant way, we can still spark others to take action and further a larger movement. Um, thank you for your time. And um, if there's time for questions, I can take any. Yes, once again, we'll open up the um, chat function for questions if anyone wants to send some in there and then I can read them aloud to Jane um, to kick it off as we wait for some to roll through. Um, I would love to hear about how you came upon this topic, why you chose to research this and present on it. Yeah, so um, I was really interested in kind of learning more about the apartheid era and I was um, really interested in looking at how it affected um, women as a group because they are um, one of the most, they are the most oppressed group in the apartheid era because they were black and they also were women. So um, I just kind of wanted to see like how they resisted against apartheid and how that was different than men. Cause it was just like really, um, they had their own demands and it was really interesting to me. Great, thank you. Your presentation was fantastic. I'll leave the Q and A open for another minute or two to see if any of has any questions. And then if not, we can move on.
So Cassandra had said she didn't realize this had happened. Do you maybe want to talk about why that might be, why it might not be uh, this well-known thing to everyone? Yeah, um, thank you for that, Cassandra. Um, it's um, a lot of like women's resistance to apartheid are kind of like overlooked in favor of the male movements that were going on. I like the African National Congress or the ANC is like a pretty well-known um, historical group um, along with other um, groups that were created by men. So like kind of my goal in creating this project was to highlight women's voices in the apartheid era that um, probably weren't really and still aren't really highlighted in ways that they should be. Um, so I think it's um, something that we need to work on overall in like history, like kind of making sure we get a more diverse perspective on different um, situations. Definitely, thank you so much for that answer. Let's see if we have anything else coming in. All right, I think that's it for our questions. Oh. Yep, Dr. Balzano agrees with you that definitely many more issues need to come to the fore. Um, so thank you again, Jane, for your presentation. It was fantastic. Um, and we will move on to our next presenter in this session. So our third and final presentation is titled A Genealogical Reading of Jin Jian Azadi, or Women, Life, Freedom, Gina Amini's Death and the Role of Women in the Kurdish Liberation Movement by Ariella Patchen. Ariella is an activist, artist, and PhD student in the History of Consciousness Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her work explores the role of women's autonomous organizing and anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, and anti-statist alternatives. In particular, Ariella has focused her research on the women's movement in Chiapas, Rojava, and Palestine, as well as on abolitionist organizing and mutual aid global solidarity networks. Her work draws on decolonial feminist theory, ethnographic methodologies, and activist community-based research approaches. So Ariella, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen if I can get that to work. Can you see that? Okay, awesome. So um, my presentation, a genealogical reading of Jin Jian Azadi, Women, Life, Freedom, Gina Amini's Death and the Role of Women in the Kurdish um, Liberation Movement. Um, in September of this year, headlines across the international news scene were filled with the name Masa Gina Amini, a 22-year-old woman whose brutal murder in Tehran by the so-called Iranian morality police for wearing an improper hijab would spark new waves of feminist protests across the globe. As coverage detailed the large-scale uprising against the patriarchal regime in Iran and the push for gender equality, what many outlets failed to cover was the fact that Masa, who I will refer to by her given Kurdish name Lujina, was a Kurdish woman born in the city of Sakez in Rojalat, or Eastern Kurdistan, or Iranian Kurdistan whose identity as such was virtually erased in the midst of the uprising. As women in Iran and around the world took to the streets, Gina's image littered posters and banners and circulated across social media, though typically referring to her by only her Iranian name of Masa. Moreover, protests of Gina's death um, openly popularized the Kurdish phrase Jin Jian Azadi, or Woman Life Freedom, without acknowledging that the slogan itself stems from a long legacy of Kurdish struggle and more particularly Kurdish women's struggle. In the erasure of her identity as a Kurd and the disconnect of the slogan from the Kurdish freedom movement, Gina's murder would thus not only materialize the need to address femicide and patriarchal domination, but also to recognize the violent legacy of the colonial suppression of Kurdish identity, culture, and life. With this in mind, my presentation attempts to understand the meaning of Jin Jian Azadi within the wake of Jina's murder and also within the larger context of the Kurdish movement and more specifically the organizing of Kurdish women. I draw on Foucault's genealogical method, which can be, um, you, which can be understood um, as a method of problematizing the present through analyzing the past. Foucault's genealogy acts as a way of understanding how power structures and dominant ways of knowing in the present are related to multiple moments in history that have enabled the possibility of such material, ideological, social, cultural, and aesthetic hegemonic conditions. 
We are to take seriously Foucault's push towards seeing the interconnectedness of past and present, what changes in the histories that are told and the actors that are emphasized. In the case of the slogan, Jinjianazidi, I use genealogy as a way of understanding how disconnecting the slogan from its specific socio-political history not only removes the Kurdish struggle, question, and identity from the present moment of feminist uprisings, but also from the long history of Kurdish women's activism and achievement. My presentation will thus explore the ideas of Jin Jian and Azadi as it relates to how the Kurdistan Workers Party or the PKK's political ideology has shifted to censor women as critical actors in revolutionary struggle and democratic social alternatives through analyzing the theoretical work of PKK leader Abdullah Ajalan and the participation of women in political, economic, and social life in the autonomous administration of Northeast Syria or Rojava. Jin, woman. While Kurdish resistance has always been active in the face of violent repression and assimilation, the 1971 coup in Turkey led to the establishment of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK, in 1973 by a small group of young lower class students in Ankara who sought to challenge Turkish state ideology, which targeted and discriminated against Kurds. While the PKK drew on Marxist-Leninist ideology of proletariat mobilization, it's important to note that it also target its, to, its target support base was the disadvantaged sections of society, the working class, peasantry, women, and youth. Though women's liberation was not initially a center point of the PKK's early organizing, women were present since its conception, as the PKK's earliest founders included two women. Traditional gender ideology would still remain present as some men challenged women's participation and saw it as hindering the party's success. Such challenges, however, would become less common, particularly in the face of extreme state repression and violence, as the state did not discriminate based on gender, as seen with the mass imprisonment of PKK organizers in, 19, in the 1980s, in which both men and women would be subjected to brutal violence of being held in Diyarbakir prison. Um, these common experience would be crucial to the party shift towards women's liberation and autonomy. In 1993, PKK leader Ajalan would attend a women's conference that discussed Kurdish women's oppression as both Kurds and as women, leading him to see the importance of women's liberation in the broader movement. By 1995, the party's program would officially argue that in today's world, women represent the strongest revolutionary dynamic force in the society making it that women were not only to be represented and accounted for within the movement, but were identified as the most revolutionary force of democratic social transformation. While women had been organizing for the autonomy and rights for decades, Ajalan's support as a leader would enable the movement to connect the women's struggle and the challenging of patriarchal traditions and institution as a way towards building free life for all Kurds. In theorizing the interconnectedness of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy, the PKK's organizing principle was to understand the liberation of women as foundational rather than secondary to Kurdish freedom. Jian, life. Women is life itself. In Kurdish, the words for woman, jin, and life, jin, are almost the same. In arguing that the liberation of women is not only important but foundational to a truly democratic revolution, Ajalan theorized how capitalist modernity has used patriarchal domination to enslave women and reduce their status in society as a way of understanding the exploitative nature of, capital, of a capitalist world system as a whole. Drawing from historical analysis of the shift from a neolithic, a neolithic matrilineal society to that of an oppressive patriarchal society, what Ajalan calls the first major uh, rupture, this shift would be a reordering of social relations that used women's biological difference to justify her enslavement. As it positioned women as inferior, barring her from social, political, intellectual, and economic life outside of the household. For Ajalan, patriarchal social order and the disregard for women's life served as the building box of both capitalist modernity and the nation state as the nuclear family became a space of hierarchical power dynamics that the state would mirror in its uh, governance structures. This would lead Ajalan's theorization of the third major sexual rupture of killing the dominant male, which means to kill the one-sided domination, the inequality, and intolerance, to kill fascism, dictatorship, and despotism, which is only made possible through a radical women's liberation. In other words, the liberation of life for Kurds would be impossible without first liberating the life of women. If women were to live, the dominant male in all of its institutional forms must die. 
Such a principle would serve as a basis for organizing new democratic forms of social and communal life. Azadi, freedom. Gender revolution beyond the liberation of women and towards the liberation of society would lead to the party's program to formalize women's participation in political, economic, and social intellectual spheres. In the case of Kurdish women in Rojava, which is made of communes and councils, all political spaces are mixed gender institution and are required to have a minimum 40% gender quota, as well as a co-chair system in which there is a woman for every position. Moreover, for every institution, there is also a parallel women's structure that has the power to veto any decisions coming from the mixed gender body if it is thought to negatively affect women. To further encourage women's participation in both co-gendered and women's only spaces, Congrea Star or Star Congress was formed as a way of supporting a variety of councils, activities, and committees, such as those in media, education, culture, and art, that support the development of women's autonomy through various civil ser service organization and educational opportunities. Congrea Star has been critical in providing women access to the public political sphere as it represents women's right to participate in the revolution by providing women the spaces in which they are able to challenge patriarchal traditions and create new forms of feminist solidarity. One example is the Malajin or women's houses, which provides spaces for dealing with specific issues relating to women, the treatment of women, including domestic abuse, forced marriages, health issues, poverty, um, in, and using alternative justice practices and collective conflict resolution that focuses on providing women with support, defense, and protection, while also holding men accountable to their actions um, as harmful to not only the individual, but to the community as a whole. Beyond the women's houses, women are involved in self-defense unit at both the local and communal level through the civil defense forces and the women's civil defense forces, as well as the military level with the women's protection defense units and all women's defense unit. The YPJ has been critical in the larger fight against ISIS and the Turkish state, which both threatened to challenge women's liberation and the democratic, democratic principles of Rojava. Women's role in the political has provided them with the opportunity of becoming financially independent through creating women-led cooperatives. Supported by Congress Star, the cooperatives provide alternatives to capitalist economic modes and enable women to support both themselves, one another, and the wider community through providing work in areas of agriculture, food production, um, and textile works. Women's cooperatives not only support women through the economic liberation, but also work alongside the movement's ecological principles that support sustainable indigenous forms of working with nature and the environment. For example, the establishment of the village of Jinwar, or Free Women's Village, which is made up of only women and their children, use traditional indigenous building methods. Jinwar is made of 30 homes that work collectively on communal farms and um, on communal farms and in bakeries, kitchens, and health centers. In creating a women's only village, Jinwar not only becomes a safe space for women suffering from domestic use and traumatic experience, but also as a center for developing models of economy that exist outside of and in opposition to capitalist modes of production. Beyond political and economic spheres, the emergence of genealogy or the science of women create, uh, creates an intellectual space for women. In dialogue with Ajalan, genealogy analyzes the ways in which women were subjugated through patriarchal domination specific to the Middle East by conducting research in fields of history, ethics, aesthetics, demography, health, education, self-defense, economy, politics, and ecology. While genealogy draws on contributions made from feminist theory, it ultimately decenters Western modes of knowledge production through de-emphasizing traditional social science research or positive research methods, and instead adopts knowledges and perspectives that center emotions and experiences and come from women themselves. Genealogy just thus investigates not only how women came to be, but how they were denied their life and what democratic practices must be adopted for women to be free. It also understands the role of Western social science in the maintenance of a male dominated capitalist world system as academia as such is not only insufficient to address the experiences of women, but also is primar primarily built on their exclusion. In Rojava, genealogy has become a part of intellectual life that is taught in high schools and universities. And there are specific genealogy centers and committees dedicated to further researching and hosting workshops and programs that make women's science a part of popular discussion for both men and women. 
as men participate in specific political education that center around gender equality and combat patriarchal practices. In this presentation, I've attempted to highlight the critical role of women in the Kurdish movement through offering a genealogical reading of the slogan Jin Jiyar Azidi in the wake of Jina Media's murder. By drawing on the history of women's participation, the ideological and theoretical work of Ajalan in theorizing patriarchy and the importance of women's liberation and the ways in which women practice their freedom in political, economic, and social spheres in Rojava. I have aimed to understand why the slogan must be contextualized within the broader history of the Kurdish movement. Without connecting the slogan to its roots and the subsequent achievements of women's activism within the movement, the slogan is not only severed, but also severed from its long history, but also from the radical social transformation that have been unique to the Kurdish movement. Thank you so much. That was so informative. Um, do we have any questions? I think the Q&A chat is open and the chat's obviously open too. Um, I guess I can start it off too, Ariella, by asking you the same question I asked Jane about how you came to this topic, um, what that process was like, why you were interested in it. Yeah, so I had been involved in um, different kind of social movements and social sp well, movement spaces um, that were emphasizing anti-statist alternatives and radical forms of participatory democracy. And so the Kurdish movement has had a long history of implementing um, alternatives to the current um, modes in which we are existing and how we relate to one another. Um, so getting involved in uh, Kurdish solidarity um, support within the US and kind of abroad um, contributed to my, you know, not only my work as an activist, but also academic work and thinking about like new feminist ways of living and organizing. Wow, that's so great. Very interesting. We also have a comment that the subject hasn't been highlighted in the media as it should be. If you want to talk about that, um, possibly maybe some ways that we could or should move forward um, highlighting events like this in the media. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you, at the, in terms of the question in the Q&A? Or... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just in, in the sense of um, kind of a similar thing that we also just went through with Jane, where events like this just aren't really spoken about very often. Um, any think, com yeah, comments about that? Yeah, I think the way that, um, you know, this event has been circulated, especially in the wake of Gina Mini and the misuse of her name um, or the total erasure of identity as a Kurdish woman um, is really important to think about within this longer history of um, colonial violence, specifically in Iran, uh, Kurdish people aren't allowed to use their Kurdish names and must have in uh, a Persian name. So in thinking about how we tell people's stories and how we react in terms of a feminist solidarity, it's important to think about the moment as not just a specific one-time event, but rather a long tradition and a long arc of oppressive, um, you know, the oppression of life and the suppression of identity for Kurdish people across, um, you know, the four spaces of Kurdistan. Um, in terms of like the question asked in the um, chat, I think, yeah, definitely Western feminists um, would benefit from, you know, interacting with Ajalon's thought and specifically, um, there have been a lot of connection between the two. Um, Ajalon draws heavily on social reproduction theory and Marxist feminisms. Um, and a lot of the time isn't taken seriously as a scholar um, because he's writing from an imprisoned condition where he has been held um, in, since 1999. So in terms of like citational politics, it's really important to think about, you know, what the lack of access means to someone who is imprisoned and also what is the on the ground experience that I think Western feminisms has often you know, been centered on a specific feminist politics, which is a white woman's feminism. And I think that, yeah, that doesn't fully engage with the multiple experiences, um, and especially of women um, without a nation state, um, who don't want a nation state, and um, are also interested in larger social transformation. 
And for anyone in the audience, the question that was asked, because I don't think everyone can see it. Um, so that answer was to the question, do you think Western feminists would benefit from engaging with Akalan's thoughts? And what is an accessible way to engage with his theories? So thank you so much for uh, that answer to the question. Do we have any more questions before we end this session? Um, I just had a question that I was thinking, the three uh, papers um, engage with resistance in different ways. Um, and I'm thinking of the fine line sometimes when, um, you know, this, uh, it concerns a group of people and this group of people has an internal <clears throat> coherence or, you know, resistance, obviously. Uh, because they've been targeted as that group of people. So how much, Steve, any movement is like that, but how much does one, <clears throat> I'm thinking about particularly Ariella's uh, idea of, I mean, the, uh, what you said about the, uh, the fact that these women um, try, are trying also to detach themselves from the Western, <clears throat> um, patterns and trying to create a form of resistance that is uh, in their own terms. Sometimes it's a very fine line. It's not hard to negotiate because um, when, when do you think is possible to say, well, I actually need the Western ways as a platform? you know th there are ways in which sometimes one cannot be totally isolated when resisting and so when how does one negotiate that <clears throat> whether it's for um you know the you know the, the movement you were talking about or even in terms of uh, cassandra's idea of okay you know let's organize and open it up to others or even in Obviously, it's uh, you know in South Africa it's different. So I, I just I'm moved by the idea of internal versus external um, forms of solidarity. Yeah, I think that's something that comes up a lot in my research as well, and thinking about like what solidarity means um, when you're taking seriously positions of and and a politics of feminist organizing that takes into consideration difference um, rather than a homogenous feminism so i think that there in terms of like thinking through the importance of western feminisms there has been a lot of contributions that have come up within the movement um, and then there's also experiences that just can't be understood within this framework so it's not a matter of disregarding you know, Western feminism and how academic, fem you know, feminists have taken up different kind of lenses, but also engaging with the on the ground experiences that are particular to Kurdish women and their geopolitical position. And also the fact that they're, you know, building a life outside of a nation state, um, which, you know, is, is a pretty, I think, difficult concept to grasp in terms of like a liberal feminism and I think you know in other cases of social movements I think in a similar case would be Chiapas the Zapatista movement um thinking about the similarities of really seeing what happens uh when we're engaging with feminist organizing that is engaged in a larger social transformation not just the end of patriarchy but also the end of capitalism the end of colonialism um so I think there's an important thing to be discussed that comes out of the Kurdish movement as well that is saying like, don't copy us because you can't. It can't be replicated across the globe because it's not, you know, it's not a, a way of, you know, structuring all forms of life because of the geopolitical um, specificities. So I think that there are things that, that can be taken from, you know, the Kurdish women's organizing and the you know foundational analysis that the liberation of life as a whole is is based on the liberation of women um and in thinking about how to apply it to different movements um means being flexible with it and engaging with all kind of histories and theories um that relate you know both the experience of one who is participating and also Kurdish women um but yeah I think the 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 move here towards a politics of difference in terms of engaging solidarity forms is really, really critical. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
and I don't see any more questions. So I do think that this wraps up this session. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. I think the next session is at 1.30. Um, and the topic for that one is advocating for reproductive freedom and autonomy, which is sure to be another great set of presentations. So I encourage everyone to go hop on that one. Okay, hey, hello everybody. My name is Charlie and with me today is Zach Jackson and Tania Del Morel. And um, this panel is about women's leadership shaping the future by rewriting the past. Um, our first attendee today is Zach Jackson, who is a second year student in the Master of Divinity program at Wake Forest University. As part of his studies, he is also pursuing a graduate concentration in women and gender studies. Previously, he completed a Master's of Science and Education degree at Baylor University, focusing on a higher education and student affairs administration, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Geography at Georgia College. Zach has served in various positions of higher education leadership, including Director of Student Engagement, residence director, adjunct instructor, and graduate apprentice for spirituality and public life. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I will be uh, sharing a paper presentation today over a text I've written titled Southern Baptist Gender Politics and the Woman's Missionary Union. Uh, I uh, I'll be reading portions of the text, and I also anticipate summarizing portions. Um, if at any point there uh, uh, is additional context that might be needed or uh, clarifying questions uh, may emerge um, from among those of us gathered, I'd be really happy to entertain those at the conclusion in our uh, Q&A portion. The Woman's Missionary Union, founded in 1888, uh, as an auxiliary division of the Southern Baptist Convention, began as an important avenue for women to find themselves in religious leadership in their denomination. Over time, the WMU grew to become the largest Protestant missionary organization for women in the world, having more than 1.5 million members. In some ways, the WMU has always been at odds with its denomination because of the way the WMU has envisioned and embodied different notions of gender politics throughout the years. Simply put, the WMU found a way to see women rise to roles of leadership with craft and acumen in a denomination which has never truly valued the leadership of women, especially over men. This elevation of women to roles of leadership was seen by early WMU leaders as necessary because men either could not or would not tend to the needs of women and children in their missionary efforts. So women carved out their own space to conduct women-led missionary efforts, and they placed themselves in charge. Key WMU leaders such as Annie Armstrong, Fanny Heck, and Lottie Moon led the charge in early women's missionary efforts and in the establishment and sustaining of the WMU. These women and others defied traditional gender stereotypes in specific ways, while embodying others with precision, and the SBC has taken liberties over the years with how it selectively remembers and tells the stories of these women and others to fit overarching denominational narratives about the role of women within family and church life. This paper will briefly explore the historical context of Baptist life in which the WMU was formed, will work to tell more complete stories of early Baptist women missionary leaders, will reflect on ways these women and others were actually quite thoughtful in the ways they strategically honored and defied various expectations of their gender to achieve shared goals within a denomination dominated by patriarchy. And finally, we'll attempt to explain why the SBC has continued to champion the stories of these women within a denominational context in which women cannot be ordained to gospel ministry. While women have often not enjoyed equal status in the history of the Christian church, they've been particularly pushed to the margins in Baptist life. The sad truth is that across time, women have had little voice in Southern Baptist Convention affairs. Despite this, women have persisted in going to the mission fields, often in the face of fierce opposition. Southern Baptist women also fought to establish their own organization in 1888, 
This organization, the Women's Missionary Union, would go on to claim a long list of notable contributions to a denomination that had reluctantly consented to its founding, had intentionally sought to downplay its efforts, and finally had relegated it to the periphery of the convention as one of many ministry partners. Close historical analysis has revealed that Southern Baptist women have made significant strides despite the odds, and that their own history closely approximates the experience of women in broader circles of social life. However, the experience of Southern Baptist women and their beloved WMU is perhaps a helpful case study in more completely understanding wider national trends of women's slow and incremental empowerment. <clears throat> In some ways, WMU programs reinforce gender stereotypes by embracing notions of true womanhood, ideology, and its insistence that women are innately pious, pure, and domestic. However, WMU programs also empowered and educated thousands of young women who would eventually step out of traditional gender roles to claim newfound roles of leadership at home and abroad. Interestingly, traditional gender roles for women were embraced but they were broadened in their scope to mean that, for example, women's commitments to caring for the home and children meant that they had an obligation to care for all homes and children. This expansion of the realm of home represented the embrace of home without walls ideology, which blurred the lines between public and private spheres. Convinced that women were innately more caring and pious than men, WMU women carved out a distinct social space for women to lead increasingly outside the oversight of men. As their commitments to private motherly work mixed with public Christian mandates to house, clothe, and clothe and feed the sick and poor, WMU women came to develop and justify an ethic of far-reaching social responsibility. And they saw themselves as the ones best suited to organize and carry out social ministries. So in a roundabout way, the WMU's embrace of traditional gender roles within the realm of private home life resulted in their taking quite seriously their responsibility to care for broader society. This meant that Southern Baptist women began to occupy roles of public leadership, which were all but closed off to women just a few, few short years before. The establishment of the WMU was fraught with conflict and controversy. Despite common patriarchal readings of this history, which emphasize the kindness of Southern Baptist men in allowing women to lead within the denomination. The conflict and controversy present at the founding of the WMU has in fact persisted across time. The Southern Baptist Convention, which has nearly always been controlled by powerful men, has never known what to do with the semi-independent WMU. In no, spark, in no small part because the, of the organization's embrace and perpetuation of the social gospel. Such ideas were given voice and disseminated by WMU leaders, but little evidence exists to suggest that many of the most progressive agendas found traction in the level of local WMU societies. WMU leaders, though well-educated and trained in progressive era ideals, believed they had to use more traditional language around gender norms to spur on the involvement of women at the local level. But the unfortunate reality was that these kinds of narratives limited the divine imagination of women to envision a world made more right. Despite this, WMU offered many women leadership in a denomination dismissive of their full participation in church life and lasting contributions from WMU exist within the realms of social work and ministries focused on foreign missions today. Across time, Southern Baptist women have embodied a complex, sometimes conflicting, gender ideology. On the one hand, WMU leaders work to expand the rights of women to serve in broader public realms of influence. On the other hand, these efforts required Southern Baptist women to adapt traditional gender norms and narratives to their own needs, which severely limited the true liberation they could see in their going public. Southern Baptist women have almost always embraced notions of traditional gender norms per their conservative theological commitments. Despite progress and jumps and starts over the years, their embrace of these norms has not allowed them to truly disrupt instances of gender discrimination and patriarchy within Southern Baptist life. In fact, the expansion of Southern Baptist women's realm of influence to include responsibility for all families the world over might even be seen as burdensome 
and a step backward for Southern Baptist women writ large. The formulation of Fanny Heck's Home Without Walls is explored next, as are its implications in both the enfranchisement and disenfranchisement of Southern Baptist women. Then the stories of Annie Armstrong and Lottie Moon are likewise investigated for their own complexities related to gender ideology and Southern Baptist life. And for the sake of time, I will condense the stories of these phenomenal women um, and illustrate the ways in which they bucked common historical trends for their gendered roles in their Christian uh, tradition. Uh, th there are three primary women that I'd like to, um, to share about today, Fanny Heck, Annie Armstrong, and Lottie Moon. Fanny Heck served as president of the WMU for many years, and she offered uh, a, a real contribution to this area of scholarly research um, via her book of history about larger Protestant women's missionary movements. And that work was titled In Royal Service. And what this book offers us to understand a nuanced picture of gendered dynamics going on here uh, is the idea that Fanny Heck and women like her in the uh, Women's uh, Missionary Union understood that, understood that they were being almost inscripted into royal service. And this meant that they saw themselves working for God and not for man. And what that meant for the way that they interacted along gendered lines was that uh, they were they found themselves more emboldened and willing to uh, buck the whims of male leadership uh, within the Southern Baptist Convention because they saw themselves as being ultimately responsible to um, a higher calling and uh, a higher calling which men did not dictate. And so Fanny Heck, uh, with her in royal service, offers us also this idea of the home without walls. As I mentioned previously, this is an idea that <clears throat> captures the traditional idea of women as homemakers and casts women as homemakers of the world over. They are, uh, it, it uh, casts their realm of influence into broader society. And so this is a contribution from uh, Fanny Heck, which lays the groundwork for the kind of ideology that uh, resulted in the formation of the Women's Missionary Union. Annie Armstrong was a master of communication and public relations. If, uh, if other women were out on the missionary field, Annie Armstrong was making a way for them to do their work here at home. Uh, she uh, established a vast publishing empire that blanketed the South with missionary literature um, and that um, encouraged many thousands of women to get involved in uh, giving financially to the cause of foreign missions. Uh, along gendered lines, what I want us to know here is that Armstrong might not be considered a vocal advocate for women's rights but she believed that women should develop their skills and take themselves more seriously. She envisioned a future in which increasingly more thoughtful women would take the gospel to the world, taking responsibility for their own lives and affairs. Armstrong believed that women had been conscripted into royal service, and this meant that God had called women to specific tasks, thinking, working, planning, and organizing to raise money and go to the ends of the earth on God's behalf. The third woman I'd like to offer up to us today uh, uh, has an important, uh, perhaps the, it's the linchpin here in this story. And that's the story of Lottie Moon. Lottie Moon is perhaps the Southern Baptist Convention's most famous and beloved foreign missionary. Uh, she moved to a remote community in China and began working somewhat independently of denominational oversight uh, this lost her funding, uh, and she lobbied male leadership for financial assistance, and they denied all of her requests. And so her call to women to support a woman missionary abroad is what really catapulted her story and her identity as a woman bucking male trends 
uh, and expectations of her gendered role abroad, uh, their expectation of women missionaries was that they serve only women and children. And Lottie Moon found that that meant that her sense of call was severely diminished uh, if that was her only gendered role that was deemed access acceptable in her tradition. And so that lost her favor, but she regained that favor as the Women's Missionary Union uh, captured her story and uh, women uh, began supporting her financially. The story of the WMU is a story of a women's movement within the nation's largest Protestant denomination, which was inspired by an assertive female missionary who ultimately altered power relationships in her denomination and in Southern society. The WMU afforded women the opportunity to learn leadership skills, move into new areas of social engagement, and work toward local reform activities. For many women, religious organizations like the WMU were where they first began to erode patriarchal power and engage in the public sphere. Among Southern Baptists, women like Fannie Heck, Annie Armstrong, and Lottie Moon inspired this kind of social change, and Southern Baptist women are still finding in them models for thoughtful advocacy within the nation's largest Protestant denomination today. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, we're now going to have a brief questioning period regarding um, Zach's essay. If anyone in the audience would like to um, ask a question, please type it in and it'll be read out. And I do have a quick question for you, Zach. Um, I'm just kind of curious. So if the WMU is an extension of the Baptist church, does that follow the like the normal hierarchy in the sense that the pastor role is only there for men or are women allowed to go in those higher roles in WMU? Uh, so the WMU is a little bit unique. Um, a, throughout the history, uh, so many Protestant traditions developed organizations like the WMU, but mm -hmm. the WMU was unique in that uh, uh, over time, largely because men became frustrated with the growing power that these women's organizations were accruing, uh, the women's organizations in a lot of Protestant traditions were absorbed into larger denominational structures. That never happened with the WMU. The WMU always remained kind of a, I used the word earlier, auxiliary. Uh, so kind of, it, it has always remained somewhat independent of the larger denominational structure. And the denomination has thought of the WMU almost as just kind of a ministry partner. Now okay. that has come with, uh, that is that has been helpful across time to the WMU in some ways, because as preserved female leadership of the organization and protected it from being absorbed by the broader denomination. But what it has meant too, is that because it was kind of a, it, it has been viewed by the larger patriarchal denominational network as kind of a tack on ministry. Uh, it, it has limited uh, the scope of, uh, of the work of the Women's Missionary Union. Gotcha. And panelists, if you have any questions, now would be a great time. Yeah, Zach, thank you so much for that presentation. And I think adding a lot of really interesting historical texture to some of these narratives that may or may not be known for certain audiences. So I think that there's um, there's a lot of really rich uh, presentation there. Um, one, one story here is that so much of what develops in the later half of the 19th century um, in terms of uh, religious, um, various religious movements among uh, women's support groups is that this is all on the heels of a kind of cynical fall suffragette movement, right? So this is all kind of cribbing from what's already um, kind of osmotically there for women. And so um, inviting them to something that is derivative in some sense. But I think also naming your figures tells us something about the fact that all of them were born after that, right? So this is not so much that they've just now heard about it and have given themselves permission, but that they're already kind of being born into that melee. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking of contemporary works like Armory Griffith's God's Daughters, which looks at submission cultures in a very a variety of charismatic church movements, denominations, and um, uh, parachurch ministries and the way that submission as a practice 
can actually lead to these counterproductive results of mm -hmm. empowerment for women in spaces mm -hmm. that are hard to carve out, um, I, you know, like any recognition and um, acknowledgement of the uh, of the equality of women. So, so kind of, I'm wondering what are the political advantages for those of us who may not be intimately familiar with the WMU or um, the, the Southern Baptist Convention or these um, late 19th century um, uh, women's missionary and um, uh, you know movement advocates. What we can learn. What are the political advantages of going back to these undersurveilled histories and archives or the ones that we um, are casting as like the discomfortable subjects that we we see in the stories that we tell, if that made sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there is something here. Um, so I find, found myself interested in researching this topic because um, as a uh, divinity student, I'm really interested in the stories that we tell. And um, if I understand gender as uh, as a story that we live into and tell about ourselves uh, made public. Um, I wanted to investigate kind of the intersection of the stories that women had told about themselves um, uh, in the early stages of this Women's Missionary Union uh, movement. Um, and I wanted to understand uh, how women maybe had to be imaginative about how they worked within theological constraints to accomplish mutual and desired goals uh, without throwing away theological commitments, but uh, but reimagining them, uh, recasting them in a different mold in a way that allowed them some agency. And I and I, I'm interested in that because I think that work is still vitally important for a lot of people today. Um, uh, for a, a lot of people that find themselves in religious traditions and communities uh, that have uh, theological imaginations that feel limiting. Um, so I went back to the stories of these women almost as a point of curiosity and but for also also just inspiration for how. Uh, people in a different time had uh, had revisioned and uh, reworked uh, theological convictions that they found too constraining um, and how they had reimagined them in a way that ultimately afforded them some more agency. And so I think that question is just as live and vital today. Um, so we do have two questions shared in the chat and I'm going to try to quickly get through them so we can move on to our next panelist but um, from the audience uh, we have as an addendum what is the imagination we need today to subvert misogynist policies okay I'm I'm uh, <laughs> I'm reading this question here give me just a second uh, okay Yeah, I think so. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shaner, for your question. I um, I think what's interesting to consider here. So, um, if I'm kind of following the trajectory of your question correctly, um, yeah, it's interesting to imagine how some of this research would translate to a different context. Um, and I will say too, certainly, and I don't know if your question even directly points here, but this paper didn't address all of the rampant questions that are out there about the about uh, the scope and effect of missionary work and its colonial in, impact and influence. Um, so th that is certainly that is certainly a, a part of this story uh, that is worth uh, uh, describing as well uh, that just fell outside the realm of this research. Um, but as we think about other contexts, you've mentioned Afghanistan, where women's roles have been severely curtailed. Um, it's, uh, I like to think that the work of organizations like the Women's Missionary Union would, uh, I like to think that leadership of organizations like the WMU would 
uh, feel acutely called to meet these kinds of needs that you're explaining. Uh, my best read um, in some of these traditions that are working from a more theologically conservative framework is that um, that call is not necessarily being heard or heeded. Um, and so it's interesting for me to think about, and I'd have to ponder further, what it would look like for women in organizations like um, the WMU that's uh, using a decidedly complementarian uh, and more conservative uh, conception of gendered relations. Um, I'd have to think more about how that is both an asset and liability um, as the work of organizations like this go to contexts where maybe uh, maybe local co uh, concepts of gendered relations actually aren't that different uh, from the theological frameworks that that uh, American Protestant women's missionary groups are are using and and operating from. Um, so I, I think I think there's an opportunity here, which I feel like is uh, what you're pointing toward, but but I don't know that it's one that has been um, has been quite uh, quite acted upon yet. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you so much for your questions. Um, for time purposes, we're going to move on to the next panelist. And with us today is Tania Del Moral. Um, and she is a fourth year undergrad undergraduate student at Wake Forest University, studying a major in politics and international affairs with a minor in art history and sociology. She is most interested in the intersection of politics and art, specifically how language and aesthetics continue to be impacted by colonialism. As a first generation American of Mexican descent, Tania has always been interested in the parallels between the story of La Malinche and her understanding of Ch Chicanismo. Um, hi, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Tanya Del Moro, and I I wish I could have my my camera on, but um, due to some weird <laughs> some weird things going on with the with the camera, I'll turn it off. Um, but I'll share my screen because um, I have a presentation. Um, let's see if it'll allow me. Okay. Oh. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so the title of my paper is uh, Hija de la Chingada, Visibility and Erasure of La Malinche in Contemporary Mexican Discourse. Um, and so this uh, this research was recognized by Swarthmore College's Undergraduate Feminist Research Journal, and it was included in the first volume publication. Um, I originally wrote this paper for a class called Postcolonial Politics, which taught me a great deal about uh, colonialism's role in our present day politics and applying that to a feminist theory standpoint, um, and specifically with this issue, um, shows me that there, there needs to be um, there's a variety of issues that need to be addressed. So I'm very excited to be presenting my research to you and to hear some feedback from, from audience members as well. Um, and so just to get into the, the, the brief historical background. Um, so when I talk about La Malinche and I'm talking about Malincin, um, there are two different narratives that come with them. So Malincin was a woman who existed in um, the 1500s during the time period of Moctezuma's empire or the Aztec empire, uh, more commonly known. And this was from 1502 to 1520, um, the empire. And this was shortly before Hernán Cortés arrives in 1519. And so Malincín at this age, she's around 14 years old. Um, and she lived in the time of political contention regarding the Aztec ruler Moctezuma who exercised a lot of tyrannical rule um, order over the region known now as Mexico City. And so um, by the time Hernán Cortés arrived, the Aztec empire was already beginning to decline. Um, and so just to backtrack a little bit, uh, Malintzin was um, a chief's daughter and she, um, she grew up in present day uh, Veracruz, Mexico. 
and so um, her her father dies and her mother remarried and, and this caused a, a subsequent shift in the family dynamic. And so her mother sells Malintzin into slavery to keep Malintzin's um, inheritance and even held a false funeral to explain her daughter's disappearance. And so Malintzin is sent to the ruling tribes in, in Tabasco where she practiced various indigenous languages and uh, she's known now as a polyglot just because she practiced um, later on Castilian Spanish when Cortes arrived, but she knew a lot of the indigenous languages of the region. Um, so Hernan Cortes arrives and he arrives in the Yucatan uh, Peninsula. And so he's given 20 young women to serve as domestic laborers, one of these being Malintzin um, after she was sold into slavery by her own mother. Um, and so due to her educated background as a, as a chief's daughter and her polyglot abilities, as I said previously, she distinguished herself from the other subjugated women. Um, and Cortes begins to use her abilities to survey the land and the populations he aimed to conquer. And so one could say that Manincin served as a sort of a cultural diplomat for Hernan Cortes by translating for the Spanish and the indigenous people of uh, the region for over 10 years. And so um, historical accounts specify um, that Manincin warned Cortes of indigenous plots against him and ultimately gave birth to Cortes' son. However, uh, these historical accounts were written by the Spanish and there's not really any native um, perspectives on it. And so historians have tried to weave together various sources, which I've used in my paper. Um, and this leads me to the, the narrative of La Malinche. And so when we talk about La Malinche in Mexico, it's more so uh, a nationalist sort of, sort of imagery of the person who Malincin was. And so she's kind of uh, presented in this binary of either being treacherous for helping um, Hernan Cortes conquer and eventually take down the Aztec empire. Um, and in, in books just uh, such as Octavio Paz's uh, The Labyrinth of Solitude, who was a Nobel uh, Prize winner, um, he describes her as a traitor to her people. And um, on the other hand, we have her as being a heroine um, because she uh, represented resilience by adapting to the Spanish colonization processes. And so, she was a young girl at this time. And so um, it must be noted that she, the only reason maybe that she um, translated for the Spanish was to survive and to, um, to distinguish herself from the other, um, the other natives. And so that's the brief historical background. Um, the argument of my paper or the question that I'm trying to answer is, how has the metaphor of La Malinche been used as a form of abstraction to both uplift and oppress the Mexican woman who is either traditional or sexually treacherous? And so when I mean, what I mean by abstraction, um, this is a theory that I use in my paper. And so um, abstraction is a term coined by um, um, this post-colonial scholar uh, named Sankara and Krishna. And so she defines abstraction as the choice to theory build in international relations specifically, and to create a sort of um, non-tangible uh, theory rather than rationalizing the effects of land, violence, and slavery. And in this case, it was the Spanish um, who brought um, this violence and, and slavery against um, natives. And so I also argue that language is used as an object of weaponization of bridging and um, Catholic conversion. And so these three, um, I guess, um, objects are used against La Malinche and in some cases used for La Malinche. Um, so I will delve in a little bit deeper on what I mean by this. So the first is uh, weaponization. Um, and going back to my title, I can go back to my title, um, Hija de la Chingada, what is La Chingada for my non-Mexican, non-Spanish speaking listeners? Um, chingar is often used as a curse word and it's applied to many different contexts. However, digging deeper into the narrative of La Maniche illustrated that this word has more meaning than I originally thought and had heard in um, other, I guess, like cultural contexts. And so 
um, Octavio Paz, as I said previously, writes about um, La Malinche. And so he writes it from a, I would say a post-colonial perspective. And he uses the, the meaning of the word chingan and connects it to uh, La Malinche. And so um, he says that it's a versatile word. Um, it's used in many contexts and intonations, but overall it implies the use of force enacted on another, whether it be ripping something open, breaking or wounding, um, it also has sexual connotations, um, so it gives it kind of a masculine and cruel meaning um, to the word. And so one of its uses, um, hija de la chingada, as I said in my title, um, may be translated to son of a whore, thereby chingada refers to the mother who is forcibly open, violated, or deceived. And so with this line of thought, Paz connect. Uh, connects La Chingada with Malinsin, who he argues became a figure uh, representing Native women who were violated by the Spanish. And so it's this word is ultimately, this word in contemporary context is ultimately weaponized against Malinsin, who takes the fall for the colonization of her people instead of the Spanish crown. Um, and so furthermore, the usage of the word against women in general serves as an example of this treacherous and traditional binary that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, secondly, uh, how is language used as a bridge? So La Maniche often, um, one could say, crosses linguistic and cultural realms. Um, and so even though she's not biologically mixed with the Spanish, she still does the labor of translating between um, both realms. And so I use in my paper, uh, Chicana scholar, uh, Gloria Anzaldúa to conceptualize, she conceptualizes um, this endeavor as a metaphorical borderland that isn't restricted to physical spaces and encompasses spiritual, sexual, and psychological borderlands. And so, Malintin is the only inhabitant within this borderland and her perspective of language is perceived as um, the link between the old and the new worlds and thus opening her world to foreign influence. Um, and as I said previously with Octavio Paz, he sort of perceives this as being chingada or being forcibly opened. So, so Malintin opens her world to foreign influence, um, which then uh, people can take advantage of. Um, finally, um, uh, Catholic conversion is the ultimate uh, uh, weaponization. And so the Catholic, uh, the final use of language in the colonization process is through Catholic conversion. Um, and so as mentioned previously, or just in my paper in general, Spaniards systematically cleanse indigenous languages to further establish themselves in the territory. and. The prime example is in Anan Cortes using Malintzin to further conquer. Um, however, they also learned, the, uh, the Spaniards learned the native language to facilitate conversion into Catholicism. And so the point of learning indigenous languages was to purify and to sanctify um, um, natives' paganism to figures that were accessible to Catholic figures. And so the best example or one example that um, Gloria Saldúa and Octavio Paz uh, brings up is this image of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And so this is a very common image in, in, in cultural and in popular culture. And so um, the Virgin of Guadalupe was replaced by this Aztec goddess of fertility, of femininity um, uh, called Tonantzin. And so as you can see in the image, uh, Tonantzin is the one on the left and the Virgin of Guadalupe is the one on the right. Um, and so the Spanish kind of transformed her into a more palatable symbol. Um, and this purified image of the Virgin of Guadalupe replaces Tonantzin and, and instead of, um, instead just offers natives so-called uh, protection and maternal affection. Um, and so it's ironic because the Roman Catholic Church later named her as Mexico's patron saint. So as you can see, there is a line of, there's a, a clear line where colonialism follows um, 
um, this trail between religion and crosses into um, feminist theory and, and so forth. Um, and so finally, I discuss in my paper that um, this has a contemporary context. This um, obviously impacts or has impacted um, Mexican popular culture in some way or the other. Uh, currently, there is uh, a rising problem of feminicides or um, uh, gendered violence against women. And so um, there's a statistic that calculates over 60 deceased women at the hands of a feminicide for every month of 2022. Um, so the issue is clearly uh, very, very rampant. Um, and so in my paper, I don't argue that La Malinche's narrative is the sole contributor to the culture of feminicides, but it does entertain the sexist binary that compartmentalizes women based on their utility to the patriarchy and compartmentalizes them based on this treacherous or traditional uh, binary. And so um, I included the statistic where it's, uh, it says 69% of the population believes, population of Mexican population believes feminism has gone too far. 38% um, say that women put themselves in risky situations and that is why they get hurt. Um, and so this kind of culture of uh, objectification of uh, simply just not believing um, women is also part of the problem. Um, and it's what I, I, I discuss in my paper. And finally, I think um, that this has more of a, like I said before, the just the entrenchment in popular culture. Um, the image on the left is an image of a bar in downtown Winston-Salem called La Chingada. And so a lot of people probably don't know the historical context of this, but for someone who's studied this and studied the, the meaning of the word and, and how it affects, how can it affect women, um, it's interesting to see it play out in, in, a, in a literally just a bar downtown um, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, listening to my presentation and uh, I'm excited to hear some feedback if possible. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we have about 15 minutes for a questioning period. So if any of the panelists have questions or any of the audience members want to send their questions into the chat, they'll be read out. Um, <clears throat> I'll start us off. I'm just curious um, kind of what your opinion is in regards to the title. Do you think that there's power in taking back derogatory ter like terms and like using them to like brand or like just taking back the power in the term essentially, how do you feel about that? Or does it play, or do you think that using those terms plays more into misogynistic values? I think it depends on the context. Um, for example, with the bar that I mentioned, um, it's clear that the, the owners, or I mean, I don't know really their history, but don't really know the, the context of it and probably just thought of it as the, there's this curse word that's common in, in Mexican language, we're just going to use it. And that's okay. Um, but I think that it's more about the general culture that's behind the usage of the word um, and how the word chingar can be used against women um, is the problem. Uh, I'm obviously not going to censor anyone or anything like that, but I do think that Overall, this is like the, the main problem of um, the word. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, so what has been the most surprising thing that you learned during your research? Um, I think the most surprising thing that I learned was exactly this, the, the connection between um, language and how language is used, like I said, like I posed in my paper as a weapon, a bridge, you know, as a, I said, a Catholic cross in my, in my paper, um, and how this line of, of thinking can just bleed into so many aspects of Mexican culture, like I said, with the Virgin of Guadalupe, like I said, with the word la chingada. So I think that was the most surprising uh, part of it was just discovering how, um, how it all kind of works together.
Um, I suppose I could jump in with a question here. So um, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And, um, and the PowerPoint was, was excellent as well. The pictures were really interesting. Um, I can't help but think about a trip that I took recently to Mexico um, last semester <clears throat> and had an opportunity to visit the um, Basilica um, for a lady, a lady of uh, Guadalupe. And in the way that you tell the story, there's um, not really, uh, it's not so much syncretism as much as colonialism, I think is the story that you're sharing there. And I, um, I'm struck by one of the stories that they spin out at the Basilica is that this, um, I think you said to Nansen, this idea of um, the replacement of that with Mary, that maybe that term might have meant, and this is, yeah, I, I recognize this could be a bit of spin too, that, that that might have meant something just maternal. And so the maternality that was present in one goddess or many goddesses, maybe even male figured go um, gods, that maternality could also be replicated in other spaces. And so that that's what Mary then comes to take on too. So it's a bit more kind of um, in addition to, not so much as a replacement of. So I'm, I'm curious in your reflection linguistically, but also politically and um, maybe religiously, how syncretism, hybridity, or duality um, uh, is, is factoring in. Yeah, thanks for the question. So I actually um, also consider this in my paper. And so um, I, basically wrote that the purification of Donancy and um, the subsequent just um, coding into um, the Virgin of Guadalupe implies a villainization of La Maniche. So there you have the binary again. And so La Maniche's narrative as treacherous is juxtaposed with the, um, with the projection of the Virgin as a traditional woman. And so in some form or the other, the Virgin is everything La Maniche is not. Uh, La Malinche betrayed her people and opened her world to colonization while the Virgin protects and consoles her children. Um, and so, uh, I mean, Catholic conversion deemed all indigenous deities as works of the devil and exterminated their, their morale. Um, and so that's, that's what I mean with uh, purification. So uh, this binary kind of, uh, like I say, is, um, serves as an example of the colonial discourse permeating into this conception of a woman. Um, so yeah, that's the answer to your question. All right, if that's all the questions, um, I just wanna say thank you to all of our panelists who came out today, wonderful job, very interesting. And thank you to the audience members and for everybody's questions. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you at the next so uh, couple of panels. Thank you. Bye-bye. So hello and welcome to the 2023 International Student Research Symposium on Gender and Sexuality. My name is Claudia Rafa, and I will be moderating today's event titled Advocacy for Reproductive Freedom and Autonomy. Speakers today will be given 10 minutes to present, and I will give a signal when there is one minute left just by clicking the raise hand button. Um, after speakers are done presenting, there will be five minutes devoted to asking questions before the next speaker presents. Once everyone has presented and had the opportunity to answer individual questions, there will be a time for additional questions and discussions amongst panelists. So our first speaker today is Grace Brumage with her work, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale as an ongoing cultural intervention. Grace Brumage is a fourth year undergraduate student majoring in English at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. This paper is a part of her undergraduate thesis advised by Professor Sean Moore. So welcome, Grace. Thank you. I'll just go ahead. Can I share my screen? Okay, so my presentation is Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale as an Ongoing Cultural Intervention. So, Washington, D.C. 2017, a government bill to defund Planned Parenthood. The Senate Office Building 2018 
Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing. Philadelphia 2018 Vice President Mike Pence's visit. In all of these images, women stand in protest, united by their clothing, the red cloaks and white habits of the handmaid from Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. In addition to making a political stand against policies and politicians that would restrict women's reproductive rights, these demonstrations show the continued hold that Handmaid's Tale has had on the United States since its publication in 1985. To answer why the novel still resonates with women today, I want to examine the novel as a prime example of the dystopian literary mode. I read The Handmaid's Tale in high school, but my interest was renewed in January 2022. At that time, the United States Supreme Court was hearing Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization, which was closely connected to Roe v. Wade. As I considered what the rumored overturn of Roe v. Wade would look like, I looked at my bookshelf. I noticed that many dystopian or science fiction novels I had read had a theme of controlling women's bodies and reproduction. I wanted to know how dystopian novels can be a powerful means through which we readers can grapple with women's loss of bodily autonomy, especially now in 2022. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a dystopia is an imaginary place or condition in which everything is as bad as possible, opposed to utopia. Dystopian fiction is fiction that takes place within a dystopia. Although there is debate on where the line is between utopian fiction, dystopian fiction, and science fiction, there are some recurring tropes across both classical and modern dystopian novels. Dystopian novels are typically a response to the history and sociology at the moment in which they are written. They center around character experiences, often being told by a first-person narrator or a third-person limited narrator, which builds connections between readers and the characters. Dystopian societies are usually worse than the reader's own, partly because they attempt to problem-solve societal issues in a way that perverts the possibility of a perfect world. And dystopias typically include a totalitarian government that controls its citizens and represses aspects of individual identity. The Handmaid's Tale tells the story of Ofred, a handmaid in the society of Gilead. Gilead is a totalitarian theocracy in which male commanders hold all the power. Women are banned from reading and are sorted into categories based on class. The wives, who are the wives of the commanders, the Marthas, who serve in the commander's houses as cooks or maids, the aunts, who train and enforce discipline on the handmaids, and the handmaids, the fertile women who live in the house of commanders as forced surrogates for the infertile wives. With the exception of the monthly ceremony um, in which the commander attempts to impregnate his handmaids, the commander's wives and handmaids are forbidden from having sex. Alfred lives in the home of Commander Frederick R. Waterford and his wife, Serena Joy. Although the government seems to exert control over all aspects of its citizens' lives, Alfred meets people who are involved in the resistance group Mayday and the escape route, the underground female road. But what about The Handmaid's Tale in particular has encouraged so many women to protest? I argue that by expanding upon the tropes of the dystopian genre and not branching too far into speculation, I would create a novel that allows readers to recognize the personal ramifications of reproductive rights restrictions. As a form of cultural intervention, The Handmaid's Tale harnesses the power of first-person narrator to evoke and incite action, thereby present preventing a society like Gilead from arising. Maintaining the tropes of the dystopian genre, Atwood draws upon historical events and figures. For example, Serena Joy resembles the real life figure of Phyllis Schlafly, with both women having similar roles and personalities in addition to their husbands sharing the same name. Meanwhile, Alfred's mother and her friends are the 1970s feminist movement with references to their participation in Take Back the Night rallies. Part of the power of The Handmaid's Tale lies in Atwood's vow. I made a rule for myself in the writing of this book. I would not include any detail that people had not already done, some time, somewhere, or that they lacked the technology to do. The Handmaid's Tale closely resembles the reader's own world, making it seem more relatable and therefore more frightening. The Handmaid's Tale is written from the first person point of view of Offred, who speaks in an epistolary tone. 
She reflects on both her present reality and her past, which gives readers an intimate look into Offred's mind, building concern and sympathy for Offred and other women like her. In the last 10 pages, Atwood switches from the narrator to a professor who is analyzing The Handmaid's Tale as a series of tapes years after the fall of the dystopian Gilead. By ending with, the, with this frame, Atwood shows that forms of resistance like Mayday have the power to end governments like Gilead, giving her readers hope and an incentive to keep fighting for their bodily autonomy and reproductive rights. Atwood does not shy away from visceral portrayals of the human body, which forces readers to confront how the dangers of Gilead are as personal as they are political. This concept is well outlined in the ceremony. As I mentioned before, the ceremony is a once a month government prescribed ritual in which the commanders have sex with their handmaids for the sole purpose of procreation. The wives are legally obligated to take part in this event too by holding the handmaids hands to cement the idea that the ensuing child will be fathered and mothered by the commanders and their wives, not the handmaids. Alfred describes the ceremony as follows. What's going on in this room under Serena Joy's silvery canopy is not exciting. It has nothing to do with passion or love or romance or any of those other notions we used to titillate ourselves with. It has nothing to do with sexual desire, at least for me, and certainly not for Serena. The commander, who has been propping himself up on his elbows away from our combined bodies, doesn't permit himself to sink down into us. He rests a moment, withdraws, recedes, zippers. He nods, then turns and leaves the room, closing the door with exaggerated care behind him, as if both of us are his ailing mother. Between the blunt statements in the first paragraph and the list-like mechanical descriptions in the second paragraph, Atwood reminds readers that there's no passion in the ceremony. None of the participants are allowed to feel pleasure, and the commander even takes steps to put physical distance between himself and Offred, even at the end of the intimate act. Reading this scene through the lens of the dystopian genre speaks to the destruction of individuality and privacy. The horrors of Gilead venture into personal spheres, showing readers just how overarching laws against women's bodily autonomy can become. A common criticism of The Handmaid's Tale is a, is a warning for white women alone who have not experienced the reproductive injustices in the same way that women of color have over the centuries in America. While I cannot fully disagree with this statement, The Handmaid's Tale may succeed because the audience is white women. At which does not preach the choir of women who already understand the dangers of laws that restrict bodily autonomy. She instead appeals to the serene joys, the conservative women who believe that the world would be better if women stayed in the home, or the offreds, the women who are ambivalent towards sexism and scoff at feminism, even though it is the reason they have many of the rights they do today. White women also generally are in a place of privilege in which they can speak up about injustices or go to protests, broadcasting at Wood's message even further. I'll end this talk with a final passage from Offred describing her complicity in Gilead's rise. There were stories in newspapers, of course, but they were about other women and the men who did such things were other men. None of them were the men we knew. The newspaper stories were like a bad dream to us. Bad dreams dreamt by others. How awful we would say, and they were, but they were awful without being believable. Offred reflects on how she ignored stories of violence against women on the basis that they were other women and other men. Through Offred's regret, Atwood implicitly asserts that the, although gendered violence does not affect every person, readers have a responsibility to speak out against it, just as many women inspired by the image of the handmaid have done and will continue to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. And at this time, I'll open up the floor for anyone who has any questions or comments they'd like to share. While people take time um, formulating any questions, I actually have one myself, which I'll also put in the chat just so you can read it. 
Um, Atwood's work obviously details egregious violations of women's autonomy and privacy. What would you say is the relationship between the right to privacy and reproductive rights? Um, I think the right to privacy is extremely important to reproductive rights. Um, and I think that Atwood's novel does a good job of explaining that. But I do think that reproductive rights should be a choice made between women and their doctor um, and anyone else who is capable of becoming pregnant in our society um, rather than public politicians. Thank you so much. I think there was a hand raised by um, Rovina. I saw. Oh, okay. But perhaps not. I just saw a little <laughs> modification that came up on my screen. Yeah, I yeah. don't. I think, that the, I think, sorry, I think that the, she needs to put the question in the, um, in the chat because the, the video doesn't come on, unfortunately. Oh, Ravina, we're always making you right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Claudia, I interrupted you. Oh, no, no worries. I just, I can't see anyone else. So yeah, any questions, if they could be directed to the chat, that would be fabulous. Okay. So oh, so sorry. Okay, so Ravina's question is, is Handmaid's Tale about two people in general? Um. Do you mean by that, like, um, two women like the protagonists yes two um, women yeah so i um even though the narrator is just offred um so one woman narrating i thought that serena joy um seemed to be a very significant um figure as well as i was reading it i think that offred um although it's only seen from her point of view i think she does attempt to understand the psychology behind Serena Joy. So even though we mostly see Offred's personal reflections and it is her story, um, I think that both Serena Joy and Offred have things to learn from the story. And of course, there are other women who have their own experiences in Gilead um, based on different positions they have been forced into. But I think that in terms of what we can learn from the novel, Offred and Serena Joy are very important. Thank you. Professor Solomon. Okay. So The Handmaid's Tale, you know, was originally kind of a work of high culture, you know, and she initially like took great offense at it being called science fiction, which was one of the initial scandals about that book. And then it became a TV show. And then it became kind of like a political and fashion statement. And now tons of people know about The Handmaid's Tale who have not, who have not read it. And even more people know about The Handmaid's Tale and what it means that um, have neither read it nor seen the television show. And I wonder how you think that movement from being really a, like a, a high culture artifact to being like a mass culture artifact kind of affects what you've talked about in your paper. I definitely think that like, I think it's interesting because in my research, I found out that even before like um, Trump's presidency and um, the TV show, people still were like talking about um, The Handmaid's Tale in protest. There was actually in California, I think in the 1980s or um, 90s, like shortly after the book was, um, released, there was a uh, spray painted on a seawall that said the Handmaid's Tale is already here. But I think like in terms of what it has become now, like sort of a mass cultural icon, I think it has allowed itself to reach a larger audience. Like it is just people talk about the Handmaid without having known, um, as you said, like without having read the book or even watched the series. And I think that just makes the message like spread by word of mouth and more powerful. Mm -hmm. So I have another question. 
Um, historically, women have been told that their destiny and highest achievement accessible to them is having a child. How do you see Atwood's work confront this idea, either challenging it, reinforcing it, or otherwise? So one thing I think is really interesting is that um, in, I think, 2017 or 2018, Margaret Atwood published an essay which says that enforced childbirth is slavery. And in it, she really talks about how childbirth can very much be a gift and motherhood can be a gift. And I think we can see that in The Handmaid's Tale, um, Alfred chooses to have a child before the events of Gilead happen. Um, and Alfred's mother chooses to become a single mother at 37. And so I think in that way, like motherhood is portrayed in a positive light. And yet at the same time, both of these women protest the idea that motherhood is something can, that can be forced onto them. So I think the overall message of The Handmaid's Tale is that mother should, motherhood is something that all women should have the ability to choose for themselves. There are also um, equally as many women who, in the novel who chose not to have children like um, Mora. And so I think motherhood has to be a choice to be a good thing. Thank you. And there are some more questions in the chat. So from Ravina asks, what are some other takeaways that we should pay attention to regarding reproductive rights from The Handmaid's Tale? I think the two really important takeaways, um, of course, like motherhood should be a choice. Um, it shouldn't be forced upon anyone. Um, but I think also very important is the idea, um, as I said, privacy. I think that Serena Joy and the commander both get extremely uncomfortable by the idea that their sex lives can be dictated in a very structured way by the government. So I think privacy and choice to become a mother, choice about who you have sex with are the most important takeaways from the books regarding reproductive rights. Thank you. And another question, what are your thoughts on the pushback largely from women of color who argue that dressing up as handmaids at protests ignores the history of many women in America? I definitely think that those criticisms are valid. Um, this is just one of the books I'm looking at um, with my thesis. And the second book I'm looking at is Dawn by Octavia Butler. Um, which is written by a Black woman, about a Black woman, and thinking a lot about, um, you know, what are the different effects of slavery um, on America in the 1980s and the 2020s, because it is still something that, whether or not we choose to admit it, is extremely, like, prevalent to our society and to many women in our society, just as after effects. So I think that women of color do very much have a right to be angered and upset that now white women are taking over this movement that has been ignored for them for years. Um, but at the same time, like I mentioned, I do think there is a positive that Atwood's novel has reached white women um, as hopefully um, with white women being able to take up this cause and protest while it does have mixed feelings, um, mixed messages, hopefully they can take the work further than women of color who are in a less privileged um, role in society are able to, and it can benefit all women. Thank you. So the next um, presentation is um, by way of uh, um, video submission. Um, the panelist was not able to join us today. So we'll um, switch over to watching their uh, YouTube video upload and then um, uh, enter into a, a quick time of um, Q&A potentially. Hello everyone and buckle up. Today, we're going to be discussing one of the most prevalent issues that often plagues women all around the world, one that directly affects our bodily autonomy, and that is reproductive rights. We're going to touch on numerous stories that directly detail the struggles with lack of edge contraception, lack of education, abstinence-based education, and the denial of bodily autonomy that often leads to shame and death. We're going to start off by discussing one of this, this one specific piece that embodies kind of all of these things in one. 
The dairy film and video collective Hasha by Baby was, was produced in 1989, and it was first conceived after the 1983 abortion referendum in Ireland. It was also following the tragedy of Anne Lovett, and if you don't know who Anne Lovett is, she's a 15-year-old schoolgirl who died giving birth in a grotto at the foot of the Virgin Mary in the south of Ireland. And if that is not some sort of weird symbolism, I don't know what is. So similar tragedies briefly came to light in the north after this, and it was essentially kind of the same thing. A newborn baby was found dead in a wardrobe, an infant was left on the porch of the Catholic Church, a baby's body was found in the garden, and even there was multiple stories of women who were leaving their kids for dead and dropping them in the sea. They were often getting caught in fishing nets and washing back up ashore, and you could just tell there was this epidemic of women who were unable to take care of their children and having to get rid of them in the most tragic of ways because there was no access to abortion care. Eventually, after these tragedies, kind of the rule of silence returned, and especially with the passing of the abortion referendum and the ban of abortions in Ireland, everything was kind of swept under the rug. These cases were happening, women were dying, babies were dying, and there wasn't really much we could do about it. This film is particularly important because it confronts the audience with the issues by examining the subjective emotions of a young woman forced to contemplate her unwanted pregnancy. Now, in this scenario, it exposes some of the most inaccessible realms of identity and makes visible the way an individual is influenced by the beliefs of a particular community. And in this case, it's the Catholic nationalist Republican dairy. With an opening sequence set to Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Wanna Have Fun, and I will include a little clip here so you can kind of catch the vibes, and I will put a little still of the film so you can see if these girls were really having fun. Of course, it's a great song. So as you can see, based on that music, based on the stills that I'm showing you from the film, it's, the film is clearly placed in the early 80s during the debate of, Republic, of the Republic of Ireland's 1983 referendum on abortion. So it's a pretty serious time politically. The narrative centers around a teenage girl named Goretti who becomes pregnant by her activist boyfriend, Syrian. Before she realizes her predicament, however, Syrian is rounded up by the British army and detained indefinitely. Of course, this all happens before she even finds out she's pregnant and she tries to tell Syrian while he's in prison, but he doesn't want the officials to know or who censored his mail to find out. So hoping to kind of go around this policy, I guess, or hoping to kind of circumvent them, she writes to him in Irish, but this was her first mistake. When the letter reach it, reaches the censor, it's completely destroyed. And since no other language other than English is allowed in, whether in spoken or written form, the letter really comes actually entirely blacked out for him. So he doesn't see anything. So Goretti takes Ceres on knowing silence as a rejection of herself and her baby and her situation. And she's wracked with anxiety and shame. She tries to decide whether to have an abortion and makes many attempts to try to do it on her own. She takes certain medications. She even has a moment where she's going through the pain of what seems to be an abortion working, but all of her attempts are unsuccessful. From beginning to end of the film, the pregnancy is defined by Goretti's fear of condemnation, rejection, and the fear that is shown to be inherent by the tightly knit, highly traditional communities that define much of the Catholic Northern Irish, Irish life. And I feel like a lot of people in a lot of different countries can relate to the same belief. There are so many places where religion is so deeply rooted and conservative beliefs and tradition are so deeply rooted in the culture that an issue like this, especially for a girl that is maybe 14, 15 years old, and we've all been there. It's a very awkward, very weird time. No one really knows what's going on. For the most part, you're kind of going out with your girlfriends, meeting boys, or in general, just living life of a normal teenager. And for something like this to happen, especially in a community that strict and that tightly knit, that conservative, that religious, is very difficult. And we see issues like this happening at a very much more severe scale and a huge scale in so many different countries. And it's incredibly tragic. So you might be wondering, why is it important to talk about this? Well, for me, I am a 21 year old woman in America and why should I even care about something that happened in Ireland so many years ago or could be happening in other countries? Well, in America, the Supreme Court has voted to overturn Roe v. Wade. What is Roe v. Wade, you ask? In the early 1970s, a pregnant single woman who brought in the category Roe, uh, brought a class action challenge in the constitutionality of the Texas criminal abortion laws which prescribe procuring or attempting an abortion with the, without the exception of a medical advice for like the purpose of saving a mother's life, for example. So the case was argued in front of the Supreme Court and eventually the right to bodily autonomy and privacy was introduced after I think one arguing and another re-arguing of the, of the topic. And the article was introduced into the 14th Amendment. 
This article included Roe v. Wade, as I mentioned, and it was a landmark decision of the United States Supreme Court in which the court ruled that the Constitution of the United States conferred the right to have an abortion. Now, this was absolutely huge, of course. I mean, in a time, it was the early 70s, of course, there was a feminist wave, things were happening, movements were being made, but still the talk of sex, the talk of unwanted pregnancies, the talk of women's liberation was relatively taboo, especially when you were talking to a conservative government, a government that for many, many years to not take issues like this into consideration and would have never dreamed of having this type of legislation being passed. However, this right is being taken away from us in the gross representation of ignorance and religious inclination of Supreme Court justices. America has long since prided itself on establishing separation of church and state, yet many of the arguments fueling the ban of abortions are based on in religious, specifically Catholic and evangelical Christian beliefs, which is relatively similar to that of Ireland. Many states will start implementing strict abortion bans that lead to prison time and even death. One of the most jarring examples of this is that in Alabama, a rapist will get up to nine months of prison time Nothing. for attacking a girl behind a dumpster, for example, leaving her for dead and possibly impregnating her. And whereas the doctor who performs an abortion for that specific victim could get up to 99 years in prison. Another crazy example is that in Oklahoma, um, a woman was convicted of manslaughter for having a miscarriage. So this means that a rapist, for example, gets off the slap on the wrist, whereas pregnant people and doctors have to face absurd prison tense sentences or even have to get have to face death. Now, how can we look at Ireland and things like the film and love its story, other stories of women in, in this situation for advice? In the States, we are going backwards. In Ireland, it's the opposite. After so long and so much heartache and tragedy, rights are finally being given to women, which you'd think we're at this far, we're in the 21st century late into the 21st century, 20 years in, and now is when we're getting rights, but you know what, we're going to let them have it, and at least it's a step in the right direction. There has been a long history of dehumanization of women through their lack of rights, stripping women of their autonomy and human status by demanding that, that they give birth and leading a life of submission and obedience. The 41st Amendment of the Irish Constitution, for a while, even said that a woman's place is in the home, specifically, and in maybe not so blatant words, Article 41.1 on the family states, in particular, the state recognizes that by her life within the home, woman gives the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. The state shall, therefore, endeavor to ensure that mothers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labor for the neglect of their duties in the home. Now, if you read that between the lines, you know what it's saying. However, strides were being taken to abolish this because people knew that a political government stating such a fact was blasphemous and an impediment to women's freedom to half of a population's freedom. And without that, there can be no societal progression. The Constitutional Convention in 2013 recommended amending this article to make it gender neutral and recognizing the importance of care work and providing for a reasonable level of state support for carers. So in this sense, they're advocating not only for a gender neutral tone for changing up the the fact that it's a woman's place to take care of a family and making it so that it can be any gender, and also the fact that they are recognizing reproductive labor as an act of labor, um, which is huge for reproductive rights in general. You know, the, the, the act of raising a generation, taking care of them is major, and to have state support is a really valuable thing. So in my, in my opinion, I think this is a great way to go about this change. The Constitutional Convention now states that the state recognizes the home and family life gives, society, gives to society a support without which the common good cannot be achieved, so the family. Then the state shall endeavor to support persons caring for others within the home as may be determined by law. So a much more inclusive way of the saying what they were trying to say earlier. In the same breath and a few years later, Ireland started implementing even more progressive legislation, and in this case it required abortion. The Eighth Amendment in the Irish Constitution, which was approved in 1983, and what the film was based on, banned abortion in the country. In 2018, however, and pretty recently, the Irish public voted to repeal the Eighth by a resounding majority of 67%, which surprised everybody. Um, though repeal as a specific political process became known reflected distinctive local dynamics. It was not unconnected to the wider discussions now taking place around the world concerning gender, reproductive rights, the future of religion, church and state relationships, democracy, and social movements, which means that Ireland was seeing what was going on everywhere, seeing all the chaos, seeing how people were being affected by strict abortion laws, by unequal representation of the genders, etc., and decided to make a change. 
Ireland is taking note of its unequal, unfair, and harmful legislation that had led to so many tragic de deaths and stories. The United States likes to believe that it's very high and mighty. However, there is so much work that needs to be done. The land of the free is not really free unless active steps are taken to promote the equality of all marginalized individuals, along with accepting abortion as a healthcare procedure that must be protected under law. We should turn to these depictions of these tragic stories of women in Ireland, in the film of Anne Lovett and of all the other women that have faced these kinds of tragic stories and think to ourselves that that is not who we want to be. If we take some advice from the new legislation in Ireland, we could save thousands of lives. Here are some resources in America that will help you learn more about abortion, abortion legislation, help centers, and places you can donate to keep abortion care alive. You can donate to abortion funds that will help fund women who need to get an abortion that cannot afford one. You can help fund Planned Parenthood. You can donate to all these places so that they can stay alive and that we can keep providing health, healthy and safe abortions to the women and the pregnant people who need them. So thank you so much for listening. I hope that this inspires some sort of change within you and that you can see the real issue behind what's going on right now and that we can start a movement together to really, you know, take inspiration from what's happened before us and not let history repeat itself this time. Thank you for watching and stay informed. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. That was Anna Palazzi, who is a senior at Wake Forest University. She's a political science and women, gender, and sexuality studies double major. She is passionate about activism, feminism, and any form of equal rights advocacy, and very interested in advocating for legal, safe, and accessible abortions. She believes that abortions are a human right, and she is dedicating this project to bringing awareness to the consequences of abortion bans. If there are any questions or comments at this time, I ask that you direct them to the chat or Q&A so that we may pass them on to Anna. If there are no further questions, I'd like to move on to our final speaker today. Roxana Ray is a senior at Wake Forest University. She conducted this ethnography in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Dr. Clark, a professor of anthropology at Wake Forest was her instructor throughout this project. And she will be presenting her work, Synthesizing Cultural Competency and Reproductive Justice, a case study of Afghan refugee mothers. Welcome, Roxana. Roxy, we can't hear you, I think.
Okay, so uh, screen sharing is disabled somehow. Can um, it says, but it should be. William, can you do? No, it's already. Okay. It's um, it's already available to Roxy. Screen sharing is. You have a presentation, I suppose, uh, some slides that you want to share with us, because otherwise you could connect from the phone. Roxy, to ask a very simple question, are you sure that you're not muted? I like to ask the simple questions. <laughs> Unless it's weak downtown, because it disables, I think you're there. <laughs> I can see. Roxy's connecting with her phone. Thank you, yes. <clears throat> While we wait, perhaps Professor Boyce will tell us about his day. You know, I, um, I found myself at this incredibly interesting, uh, superbly done cutting edge research conference. Um, there have been just a host of exciting panels and uh, I think I heard the word fantastical earlier. I don't know if you're um, uh, following along, but uh, yeah. So anyway, I don't, I don't know, what, what have you been up to today? Well, oddly, I too have been at a simply fantastical um, symposium in women, gender, and sexuality studies, and I've really very much enjoyed it. What have you been up to today, Professor Balzano? I have been in the background <laughs> of a conference <laughs> behind the screen. <laughs> Thank you, you know, really the participants here are great, uh, patient, and let's thank them once more. Um, just I want to remind everyone that after this session, there's going to be the end note presentation by um, a Professor Angelica uh, Antonetti in Colombo, and uh, we will. No. Are you? Is it working? Yes. yes. Oh my gosh! Amazing. <laughs> okay, yeah. so it's still working. Yes. Oh my gosh! Okay, that's amazing. Hello, everybody. Um, I am going to share my screen because I have a presentation today. And I'm going to struggle with that as well. Okay. Um, can everybody see my presentation? Yes. Awesome. Okay. I'm so sorry for the delay and the issues with the audio, um, but I'm excited now because I can finally share with you my research. Um, my name is Roxy Ray, and for my research, I synthesize reproductive justice and cultural competency frameworks to construct a holistic model of the elements affecting Afghan refugee mothers' reproductive health. Um, so I'm just gonna start out by taking you through an outline of what you can expect in my presentation. First, I'll define reproductive health and cultural competency frameworks. Then I'll get into my methods, 
Then I'll start discussing the findings from my field work, um, starting with um, my findings on mental health, in which I identify how there are lasting effects from gender division of labor and gender inequity in Afghanistan on the mental health of refugees who are living in America. Then I will bridge mental health and reproductive health with my literature review. Um, I'll move to the second portion of my field work where I discuss the barriers to healthcare as per the cultural competency framework. Um, then I will discuss the success in my framework synergy. And lastly, I will use my research to make suggestions for public health initiatives. So what is cultural competency? What is reproductive justice? Oh, well, these are two frameworks that are used really often in anthropology, public health, um, women gender studies to talk about um, health care um, for um, health justice with minority people or women. So reproductive justice is a framework that identifies the dimensions of a woman's life that relate to well-being. This stems from physical and mental health to political health, social and economic well-being. It's useful in analyzing what factors in a woman's identity, condition, and society affect her ability, her ability to determine her reproductive destiny. It's also useful in that it centers individual narratives. However, it lacks an identifying nodes of cultural friction between patients and healthcare systems. Cultural competency, on the other hand, um, analyzes the dimensions of culture that can result in barriers to healthcare or create cultural friction within healthcare. It's useful for informing healthcare in the intersection of cultural pluralism and managing barriers to healthcare. However, it lacks an awareness of the health consequences arising from sociocultural positionality and circumstance. Also, as opposed to reproductive justice being more individual based, um, it's far more gener general and overarching. So you can hopefully kind of see why I thought bridging these two frameworks and look, using them in tandem um, is better than using one alone because they kind of make up for where the other one lacks. And I think that together they could provide a synthesized framework that's useful for public health initiatives. So moving on, the synthesis of these two frameworks rests on a bedrock understanding of health as um, a matrix of all these different dimensions which connect to each other and affect each other and are in actuality um, indistinguishable. There are no barriers between this thing. Where does social health begin and mental health end? Where does financial health begin and mental health end? Where does healthcare begin and physical health end? That sort of thing. So now that we've got kind of all the groundwork laid, um, we can get into my particular research. Um, so I conducted an ethnography. I'm an anthropologist, an anthropology major. And um, so um, for my methods, I conducted three participant observations and one focus group interview and an all intensive case study of a group of Afghan refugee mothers living in Winston-Salem. And I accompanied my fieldwork with a literature review. So for my participant observation, I uh, registered as a volunteer for an organization called World Relief, which operates here in Winston-Salem. Um, and the World Relief organizes meetings for a group of Afghan refugee mothers. And in these meetings, they discuss important topics and accomplish important steps in integration. For example, for one meeting, we helped the women sign up at our local community college for ESL classes. So these gave me a really excellent opportunity to know more about the day-to-day -day of these women and what barriers they might face. Um, for my summer structured focus group interview, I drew from this pool of women. Um, and I, in this interview, there were four Dari speakers and one Pashtu speaker, and I had translators translating for both. Um, in analyzing my fieldwork, I used the process of deductive and inductive coding and the setting for these um, meetings were with Salem, but also contextually within the organization World Relief. So we can move on to my results. Starting first, um, the greatest um, detriment to the well being of the women I identified was social isolation. Um, and this was especially interesting because I found that this issue of social isolation was actually a result of gender inequality and gender division of labor in Afghanistan. And I thought that was interesting because we kind of have this idea that when somebody immigrates to a new country, it's a fresh start and they've left everything behind. 
but that's not true as my research reveals. So in Afghanistan, there's a pretty stark division of labor. Um, the husbands generally work wage positions um, while the wives are either primarily domestic worker or they work in traditional female roles. One of the women I work with is a seamstress, for example. Um, in fact, um, during Taliban occupation, it was illegal for women with children to work um, a wage job. Also, there are cultural taboos and because of these occupational differences, um, women seldom drove or learned how to drive. And so any of these, um, this gender inequity in Afghanistan um, has caused a gender deficit and mobility deficit here in America. So getting to the language deficit, in Afghanistan, while the men were working, um, they were actually learning and practicing English. This, a lot of this has to do with the American occupation and a lot of the roles that men worked in um, required them to be able to communicate in English. Whereas obviously the women did not have these opportunities. So now that they're here in America, the men, their husbands are more proficient in English than they are, and they're able to join the workforce in the United States, but the women do not. Um, one of my participants said, because they know the language, it's much easier for them than for us, is much more challenging for us. This language deficit compounds with the mobility deficit. So as I said, in Afghanistan, it's very rare for women to drive. In fact, they could be the target of hate crimes if they're seen driving. Um, this was, did not affect their lives so much in Afghanistan because of its strong pedestrian culture. But anyone here has been to Winston-Salem, you know it's impossible to get around without a car. So now that they've moved to America, they are completely immobilized um, and entirely dependent on their husbands. Um, one of my participants said, because the way that people live here, they have to drive for the ladies and like themselves, because they don't drive, they're very, very dependent on their husbands. And so all of this is relevant because um, the language deficit and mobility deficit constitute a issue with social isolation and mental health. Um, despite leaving a country, Afghanistan, that's ranked 117th and the gender equality index for America, which is ranked 50. The women reported that they are more isolated and dependent on their husbands in the United States than they were in Afghanistan. And I thought that was pretty astounding. Um, this is relevant to reproductive justice because social isolation is associated with mental health issues like depression, anxiety, and suicide, but also physical health issues like cardiovascular disease and immune disease. And as we'll get into later, um, reproductive health issues. Okay, so here I've created kind of a diagram to illustrate the re these relationships I talked about in the last slide. I'm not sure if you can see this part up here or if this, oh, maybe I'll move it later. <laughs> um, so starting in Afghanistan, we have the gender division of labor and also cultural taboos regarding driving. Then we move here into America, and we can see that in America, we have now a gendered language deficit and a gendered mobility deficit. And these two are in relation with each other and they compound the other. Because they don't speak English, it's more difficult for them to get a driver's license because of lacking resources for drivers and material and Gari and Pashtu and restrictions on having translators um, for driver's exams um, yeah, having trailers present for the exams. Also, the lack of mobility prevents their ability to socialize and go out and work and go out um, to situations where they would be practicing learning and um, learning the language. Um, so they definitely compound each other. There's also this element here I discovered, which I thought was very interesting, and that is the responsibility of cultural preservation. So the families are worried that now that they're in America, um, they don't want their children to lose the ability to speak their native language. Um, but what this, so at home in the household, they want that to be a, a place where Dari or Pashtu is spoken and English isn't spoken. But the result is that the burden of the responsibility of cultural preservation falls onto the mothers because the husbands and the children are at school and at work where they're getting to learn English. Um, the women are, like I said, mobilized and stuck at home and they're not able to learn English at all. So moving down, all of these things contribute to a gender division of labor in America. 
Even the women who I spoke to who were able to work in Afghanistan are not able to work in America because of the gender deficit and mobility deficit. All of these factors contribute to um, a social health deficit, which impairs mental health, impairs physical health, and of course impairs enculturation. So what does any of this even have to do with reproductive health anyways? Well, we can link mental and social health to reproductive health with this hormone called cortisol. You'll hear about cortisol a lot when we're talking about reproductive justice or health justice in general, um, but cortisol, is a stress-induced hormone, and I'm using stress as a blanket term um, because it also um, encapsulates social isolation, trauma, and other sorts of things. All those things trigger cortisol release. So numerous studies um, found that minority women have higher levels of prenatal birth, miscarriage, um, and reproductive tract illness than non-minority women. And the reason is they have elevated levels of cortisol. So higher levels of cortisol and dysregulated hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access, which is called by chronic elevation of cortisol, um, creates an impaired immune, fun impaired immune functions, impaired metabolism, and impaired autonomic nervous system. And it also increases vulnerability to preterm birth, miscarriage, and um, reproductive tract illnesses. Um, so for these Afghani women, the social isolation which produces cortisol poses a reproductive threat. And I was even, even able to observe this with my own cohort because one of the women um, actually had a miscarriage after living um, in the United States. Pardon my interruption. You just sure. are almost at the end of your presentation. Okay, yeah, I'm, um, I only have a few slides left. Okay, perfect. Um, so moving to barriers to healthcare. Um, so the barriers I identified to healthcare are transportation, language, and gender division of labor. Sound familiar? They're the same agents that were causing issues with social health. Um, I think Hajira's testimony, one of the women I worked with, perfectly summarizes um, these issues. She was having some serious leg pain for a few weeks, but she was not able to go to the doctor because she had seven children she was solely responsible for taking care of and wasn't able to transport herself. Her caseworker wanted to take her to the emergency room because it got so bad, um, but she was still not able to go because she had no one to take care of her kids. Um, this is really important when talking about reproductive health. She um, had her seventh child in America, and if she were to have any complications after that, um, then she would not have been able to go to the doctor. Also, the gender of the provider is extremely important. When I asked the women if they would see a male gynecologist, it was a unanimous and emphatic no. Um, all the gynecologists in Afghanistan are women. And I think Hajir's testimony, again, um, really shows the seriousness of this uh, requirement. Um, I, as I said, she gave birth to her seventh child in America. And um, she said that they gave her the option to have an all women staff. And she said, yes. Um, and that's a really good example of cultural competency. Really. Um, but I asked her what would have happened if they weren't able to offer that and if some of the staff couldn't be women. And she said that she would have gone home and give birth alone in her house. And so I think the fact that she would rather do that and work with male staff shows the importance um, of cultural competency in healthcare. Okay, so moving on to success in my framework synergy. So the fact that the um, reproductive justice framework, which identified the detriments to mental and social health, and the cultural competency framework, which identified barriers to healthcare, um, showed the same three factors as being a detriment to the women's reproductive health. Again, those three factors are transportation, language, and gender division of labor. Um, shows that the synthesis of these um, frameworks it would be a really useful tool for public health initiatives because they can identify what points they can target specifically to make the most impact um, in improving health of these women. Um, so I move to my final slide, which are my suggestions for public health initiatives based off my research um, to offer childcare at hospitals. This is done, but it's very, very rare um, for, for childcare to be offered for patients. But there are numerous studies supporting this um, as something to alleviate um, health inequities for women. Um, also, increased transportation to hospitals, increased public transportation. 
um, ensuring the availability of female providers, and ensuring translation services in all healthcare facilities. Outside of the hospital setting, um, it would be worth it to have job training incorporated with ESL and driver's education incorporated with ESL. And that is the end. Thank you. I think we may have time for just a question here or two um, before we have to run to the next panel, which um, I'm told actually begins at, at 2.45. So we'll see everyone at 2.45. Um, but yeah, if there are questions from the audience, um, Claudia, if you have any questions you wanted to um, direct to Roxy, that would be, that would be great. Yeah, thank you so much, Roxy. There are still no new questions in the chat, so I'll give a minute or two to see if anyone submits anything, but thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you guys for having me. I'll take this minute to dehydrate. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let me see. Okay. <laughs> thank you for your presentation and also for uh, coping with the tech um issues uh, oh, yeah, I apologize. <laughs> to solve them um so there was a lot in your presentation and a lot of uh, things a lot of life and there's so much investment uh so i wanted to thank you for that and um what else and i, I it was so compact and so i just wanted to say what what else what what, what would you what else do you want to say that you want to stress if you have like you know a couple of things that really want to stress our focus our attention on what would you say and to sum up sure there was actually a lot that it's in my paper that i had to cut out um from the presentation um it's also important to think about um trauma um these women have experienced a lot of trauma at the hands of the taliban and um, that obviously affects your mental health and obviously causes elevated cortisol. And there are certain um, cultural factors that affect your uh, healthcare seeking behavior, especially mental health care. Um, and so that was something I wanted to touch on, um, but, but couldn't. Um, but in terms of maybe the most important takeaways, um, I think, Maybe my presentation can serve and is, as an example to thinking about health in a different way and not just thinking about health as what um, physical ailments might appear uh, on the body in you know, some sort of test, but as um, a function of somebody's life histories and experiences um, and as something that's dynamic and um, yeah. Thank you. And there is another question at the uh, I see. Claudia, do you want to see? Yes, okay. So the question is, did your multicultural background help with understanding these women? Yes, it, it did. Um, so I come from, um, a uh, half Persian, half American household. Um, and so I think it just primed me to be thinking about these sorts of questions. Um, how, um, when I was formulating my research question, it was initially far more broad. And I just wanted to look at um, barriers for Islamic women, like in general. Um, I think having a that background, um, the prime me to be thinking about how health can look different in healthcare um, can look different um, depending on your culture. And so, yeah, through my kind of stages and ideations of, of formulating my research, my question got more and more specific and specific, but yeah. Thank you so much. And I think just one final question, what do you see as the best ways to advocate for your recommendations? Do you recommend starting at the city council level, starting with the hospitals or doctors, a combination? And then along this question also asks, are there any examples of communities that are doing this really well already that Winston can look to as a guide? 
Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say city council is great. Um, I am not too familiar with how hospitals work in terms of how you would go about um, suggesting like establishing childcare. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have as much to speak on about that. Um, but also just having conversations and um, contributing to a, um, um, just like starting a discourse about these sorts of things. So what we're doing right now um, is a step in a positive direction. Um, and then in terms of examples, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but like I said, there are hospitals that do offer childcare, um, but I don't remember um, where they are or what their names are, um, but yeah. Okay, I think there's actually one more question, and that's, do you think it would be wise to incorporate more of an anthropological, sociological component to healthcare training, like in med school, et cetera, to improve professionals' abilities to help people of all backgrounds? Absolutely. I talk about this all the time. I feel like I'm gonna go crazy. I think, um, I think it absolutely should be a requirement. I myself am pre-medicine, so I'm like familiar with this whole process. And it's so frustrating to me that so much of the process is focused, focused on hard sciences and the pre-med prerequisites are all hard sciences basically. Um, but it should be a requirement to take a medical anthropology class and that training should con continue throughout your medical career because at the end of the day, you're working with people. And um, you have to realize the effects that your position as a healthcare provider um, you can either perpetuate inequity or alleviate inequity. And um, it's important to be aware um, of the more humanities aspect of medicine. I, I, like, I think medicine is a social science. Like, I really think it is. And I wish more people saw it that way. Um, but yeah, so definitely I think more anthropology should be incorporated in medicine. Thank you so much, Roxy. I think that just about concludes our panel today. I'd like to thank everyone for attending and a special thank you to all of our panelists again. Um, our next and final event is the EndNote presentation that I encourage everyone to attend. And I hope everyone has enjoyed these presentations and has a wonderful rest of your days. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have to sneeze. <laughs> <clears throat>
So Professor Angelica Antonetti in Colombo graduated in philosophy and obtained a master's degree in philosophy and a PhD in science and mathematics education. She is currently a full professor in the Department of Philosophy at Federal Institute of Paraná, Brazil, and a permanent professor of the professional master's degree in professional and technological education at the same institution. Additionally, she is the leader of the philosophy, history, and gender research group, and has experience in education, focusing on the subjects of bioethics and gender. She develops research on women's health, especially regarding sexual and reproductive rights in Brazil with feminist bioethics as the theoretical framework. So we are grateful for her presence and the paper she's going to present to us today is called <clears throat> No Going Back, Advancing Public Policies on Women's Reproductive Health and Sexual Education in Brazil through the lens of bioethics. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for all. Um, can I share my screen? Okay. <clears throat> um, Okay. I said, William, where is your grandmother now? I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Wait, she, okay. Hang on. Oh, there we are. Hello. Hello. Not working. Okay, not working. But I, I try to to um, uh, read my my presentations. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Angelica Antonetti Colombo. I'm from Brazil. And first of all, I want to thank you for Professor Bolzano to invite me to closing this symposium and to the department and to Wake Forest University. And I will talk about uh, No Going Back, Advanced Public Policies on he Women Reproductive Health and Sexual Education in Brazil through the lens of bioethics. So um, this project, this, this uh, work uh, started with a research question. And um, how can public policies on women's health and sexual sex education in Brazil be effective to, in protecting the reproductive health of women and adolescents? And to try to answer this question, I use a bioethic perspective, kind of a theoretical framework. So um, I, uh, in contrast to North America principle-based bioethics, uh, this work is based um, uh, on co the current Latin America bioeth bioethic perspective. Critics of North America bioethics reveal the need to address social and health issues related to justice, e equity, and state responsibility as raised by Latin American global, global South countries. Feminist Latin America bioethics which uh, focuses on the reality of developing countries becomes as important, important theoretical and critical instrument that propose to raise debates about the sexual and reproductive rights of women living in precarious uh, conditions and who are not assisted by state apparatuses responsible for uh, guaranteeing the rights for their, their women. So feminist bioethics offers possibilities for solving, alleviating uh, the problems that persist among the vulnerable 
and contribute, contribute to proposals for inter intervention measures that ensure respect for sexual and reproductive rights. And uh, to try to answer my research question, I uh, conducted uh, the documentary survey that uh, we found, I, I found the data about teenage pregnancy and matern maternal death rates in Brazil is well above the world average. Additionally, our, our findings uh, indicate a lack of recent public policy on sex, sex education, reproductive health, this uh, resulting in reproductive injustice in Brazil. So uh, our data show us that uh, first, uh, I talk. I will talk about the teenage pregnancy. Uh, we in Brazil, we have uh, forty-six adolescents give birth per day in Brazil. Also, this number is very high. But also, these numbers we have internationality problems. Uh, uh, these international internationality problems is about the um, uh, social inequity and uh, about race. So. Among the, the leaf birds from adolescent mothers in 2020, the highest concentration is in the North and Northeast regions. And uh, uh, the issue of race is also highlighted. In 2020, out of the total leaf birds from indigenous mothers, 28 were from adolescent mothers. And among bird, birds of black women, 13 were from uh, adolescent mothers. So, uh, we this is this data uh, affirm for us that we uh, pass through from reproductive injustice in Brazil. And uh, another data that I study my my project is about maternal death. So uh, we have 107 maternal death per 100,000 live births in Brazil. Is the cause of the, of this maternal death? Uh, uh, could be uh, uh, a morality fo followed follow by unsafe abortion. And a group of physicians that was concerned about this project, by this problem, about, about the issues, uh, said this in society, kind of Brazil, that see women as a second class citizens, little is investing in women's life. So these uh, affirm uh, affirmations. Um, um, that uh, show us that in Brazil we have we suffer about we suffer from reproductive injustice. So currently, uh, in in Brazil, we have uh, the for last four years a government that have had a conservative project and the um, public policy from sexual education, reproductive health in Brazil. Um, uh, it was related with this um, uh, conservative project. So uh, from sexual education, and I try to compare these data about teenage pregnancy and maternal death uh, with the effective of these public policies in Brazil. So I studied sexual, public policy, sexual education public policies and reproductive health public policies to analyze this, this um, uh, uh, public policies if the, they was uh, effective to protecting women and adolescents. So current, currently with the approval of the National Common Curricular Base, uh, this uh, like a uh, document that guides schools to work with different subjects with students. Uh, in this document, we don't, uh, we don't see any uh, suggest, any mention uh, for, about gender issues. And additionally, the document avoid include the words homophobia and the LGBT acronyms. So when also we saw that uh, document that um, uh, the, the schools used to guide uh, how the schools work with different objects, include a uh, sexual education subject. Um, we thought that uh, if these schools don't have uh, um, a guide to work about this subject with the students, these students don't have uh, right information to how they prevent themselves from 
uh, teenage pregnancy or STD. And we force um, uh, when this document doesn't mention LGBT, LGBT uh, issues or gender issues, we force uh, another problem that we have in Brazil that is uh, violence against LGBT people. So we saw that is not effective at all when the uh, a public policy uh, try to protect people, protecting teenagers. Uh, other, another um, uh, public policy that we uh, study in this project is about uh, reproductive health. In the last government, government we have a ministry that uh, also have a, a conservative project about uh, reproductive rights. And uh, we have some um, fact to uh, show us that in Brazil, we uh, maybe we have an effective uh, uh, public policies to protecting women and adolescents. And uh, uh, our last minister called Damaris Alves, uh, who took over the no called minister of women, family and women, women rights, made a statement at uh, United Nations Women Rights Council uh, that when uh, she speech, and in, in her speech, she endorsed her work in protecting children, adolescents, women, the elderly, and indigenous people. Present her proposal uh, to protect life from conception. And uh, uh, she present her proposal when she signed the Consensual Declaration of Geneva. That we know this declaration is very conservative uh, when, when we talk about reproductive rights. And uh, Minister Damaris, when uh, she speaks, she makes clear that her obje objective are to protect children and adolescents from sexual violence, but in contrast, uh, the minister removed from school sexual education. So that is a contradictory thing that we know, know and uh, thought, thought, thought in this uh, work that is not uh, related with uh, her proposal and we, when we saw uh, the data that I showed. So um, other public policies and programs that uh, this ministry uh, started in the last um, started in the last four years uh, was the creation of national secretariat of family. And uh, when do we um, uh, saw the data about the document of, of about sexual education that it's not mention mention uh, doesn't mention um, LGBT people. And we, when we saw the create of a secretary uh, that uh, protecting family, uh, we thought that related with a uh, uh, conservative project, uh, this last government, this family is a traditional family, like uh, with father, mother, and children. So LGBT family is uh, not protecting uh, from uh, uh, this um, secretary. And uh, other uh, uh, campaign that was started for Damaris is a campaign uh, to call adolescents first, pregnancy later, everything, everything has this time. So for the title, uh, we don't see any problem at all, but uh, this campaign, um, it's based uh, from uh, uh, idea that sexual abuse is also a contraception, contraceptional issue that the, the, the teenager can use to prevent uh, teenage pregnancy or STD. Uh, it is important to know that talking about sexual abuse is also talking about sexual health. However, it's not by suppressing and limiting the freedom of choice of young people to exercise their sexu sexuality that will result in reduced cases of teenage pregnancy, STD, or even maternal mortality uh, was uh, resulting from unsafe abortion. So if I don't choose uh, a sexual abuse, how I know prevent myself from um, teenage pregnancy? And this, this campaign, this document don't have any information about 
uh, other uh, uh, met contraceptive methods to um, information these teenagers, to these people to prevent uh, themselves of these situations. And another um, um, problem that was related, related to public policy in Brazil is the uh, last report that we discovered in the last January uh, about Yanomamis uh, people that was an uh, indigenous group in Brazil. That in the report, we saw that uh, this group um, needs help to, to um, solve the problems they pass through, uh, especially uh, sexual abuse. And uh, uh, these people don't have any any help of this government, any help of this minister, any help of the ministry that uh, uh, serves to protect these people. And uh, in this report, we saw a uh, high number, high rate that, that teenage pregnancy result from rape and sexual abuse. And um, <clears throat> uh, uh, it's very important to promote discussions uh, that bring valuable, valuable information about, about sexual and reproductive life in, in, in um, public policies that, that protecting people of these uh, issues kind of uh, Yanomamis people's pass through. Regarding Brazil, uh, uh, it's possible to infer. So I have a thesis that um, we, in Brazil, we, um, we have an a issue with reproductive injustice and uh, uh, analyzes this data from teenage pregnancy and maternal death with the effective or not the public policy to, to serve to protecting people, women, indigenous people, adolescents. And uh, I, I made a exploratory comparative analy analysis through the lens of feminist bioethics. So it's, pot, it's possible to infer that the lack or ineffectiveness of public policies for female sexual and reproductive health results in high rates of teenage pregnancy and maternal death, resulting from misinformation, socioeconomic inequalities, and the lack of responsibility and social, social, so solidarity of state apparatuses that serve, serve to offer protecting uh, uh, to citizens. So uh, we saw the data, we saw the um, public policies that exist in, in, in Brazil in the last four years, and we saw that maybe, uh, in fact, my hypothesis confirmed when I saw the, the ineffectiveness of public policies to protecting women, people, indigenous people. Therefore, the importance of critical debates, uh, debates based on feminist bioethics is evident, seeking to highlight the ineffective of such policies for protecting life and overcoming social and gender inequalities in Brazil. We, we call this uh, reproductive injustice. Uh, as an instrument of critique and intervention committed to ensure the right and protection of the most vulnerable feminist bioethics present ethical challenges uh, related to public health, especially in Latin American countries like Brazil. Feminist bioethics holds that institutions should promote uh, protection, education, and guidance on sexual health through the public policies. So public policies uh, are instruments that uh, uh, serve to protect and uh, uh, maybe if the, this public policies was effective, this number is not so high. Thus, the Wait a second and see. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Not sure what happened. Yeah. I don't know if it's an unstable network or some someone clicked something, but um, again, we've got the, there's a few people trickling in now. Um, okay. So hopefully we can continue where you were at. 
Okay, I mean, all, all I finished, just two minutes to finish my... No, take your time, take your time. Oh, yes. There's no rush. Okay. Okay, um, I'm continue. So uh, to conclude, um, I, I use feminist BOS kind of um, uh, critical instrument to analyze this data and compare this data with the effective of this public policy that we, we had uh, in the last four years. And the feminist bioethics Show, uh, uh, show that uh, uh, the uh, state apparatus uh, should to protecting and uh, uh, these women, the adolescents, indigenous people with effective public policies that uh, have campaigns and programs that uh, was concerned about these issues that we have in Brazil, kind of reproductive injustice, um, uh, inequity, so social inequity, uh, problem with, with uh, racism, of uh, homophobic. So uh, the feminist bioethics um, uh, helped me to understand this, this data and uh, create a debate and uh, uh, even uh, uh, criticize this situation in Brazil from a perspective that um, the state apparatus have responsible responsibility to protect the people. And uh, our, our uh, bioethics that it was bioethics uh, um, uh, that starts in Brazil that we call bioethics intervention or bioethics. And uh, I use the standpoint of feminists to approach to this bioethic perspective, perspective uh, so that it's important to intervene, to inter uh, make, make an intervention with uh, the state apparatus to uh, show this data, to show the importance and to uh, create these public policies, programs to protect these people that suffer with this situation, these issues. I think that's, that's it. <laughs> I thank you. Thank you again for the Wake Forest University, the department and the professor, Professor Bolzano to uh, Bolzano, sorry, to invite me. It's very important to Brazil to share uh, our work uh, with, with another countries and uh, um, show our situation. Uh, and um, I have, uh, I am honored to stay here in this symposium. That's very important, it's very interesting in the, uh, all the, the day. And um, also, again, also again, thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your patience. And I see that uh, it's still recording, so I apologize for, mm -hmm. I don't know what happened, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that's uh, the good thing is not to rely on technology, and it's always good that we are here resisting. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's <laughs> happened. It's happened. In the, in the, uh, uh, is it my first international uh, presentation? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that this for, for I, I'm uh, always remember these days. I, I am always remember this day, but situations uh, made this day very important. <laughs> so you, thank you. Also, I'm saying that with the recording, we uh, will be able to share it. I have a few students who were connected, and I'll share it with them um, because certainly, you know, I don't know if uh, there are other questions. I do have. So many things that I want to that I would like to ask. Maybe I'll start with some, and then we'll um, we'll see. Because um, I just um, was <clears throat> wondering. I mean, you touched on it's one problem, but there are so many uh, related problems to that. Yes, it's uh, <laughs> you know it's uh, it and what you've done is also to separate these issues and then to name them uh, and. And so it was really clear 
um, I mean, again, I don't know in, enough, but I do see the amount, the patience that one has to have to work, to try to work with the government, to try to see, okay, we are, you're, a, you formed a group. No, you, you know, there's a group that is formed in, uh, in Brazil. Maybe there are other groups as well. <clears throat> and it seems that when um, the government comes down with such, um, you know, a heavy, um hand on everything it seems that there's no room you know for progress and so it, it might be discouraging and yet keeping going um is the only way to do the only thing to do and the only way to to keep going to to to, to go ahead and not mm -hmm. turning back really um but um so how how much of you know, how much progress, I mean, it seems that even here in this country, we see that, uh, you know, almost like two, step, two steps um, ahead and one back, but that's part of the progress as well. Mm -hmm. So how big are, I mean, how big are these groups, are these move, you know, the, they're trying to resist and also, um, you know, what is the, um, what is the, the you're a professor and you're involved in this so i was wondering what are the sections of the population who are uh, particularly involved in resisting is there a stratification of the resistance or you know how are these groups of resistance formed and what are they yes, um, in brazil uh, we have uh, uh, the the major uh, people in brazil was christian and uh, this um, this guide guide is the the choices that people made, and I think uh, when we talk about reproductive health uh, uh, or sexual education, even the people have progressive uh, a view about uh, the life. Uh, this this moral uh, can be the bar barrier, the ob obstacle obstacle to to the the situations have effective or we um we uh have um result positive result of our our uh, fights but we have uh, groups we have a uh, um, professor that uh, uh sadly don't uh, stay in brazil anymore because uh, they suffer violence and death. Uh, um, um, people try to to um, how can I say that um, uh, murder her. <laughs> so yes, uh, they call Deborah Janice. That was my my references to to that I use uh, when I I studied bioethics and. Uh, um, she and the, another other group groups that we have a group of uh, uh, women's uh, Catholic Catholic women's that um, fight against this this conservative project, this conservative public policies, and this uh, 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 happening in the civil civil uh, uh, the people that is not uh, related to academic, uh, but. Uh, we um, also have um, difficult to access this this uh, institution, and uh, we have the, this group. But uh, we have we in Brazil the, because I think because the the, the Christian uh, moral that guide 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 people. Maybe I, I have a, a different point of view about the life. This group don't have access uh, access to. To, to, to places to show uh, 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 the fight the, the how how uh, how this this group uh, resists this progress, um, conservative uh, project because it, we have these barriers but in the last month we changed the government and uh, we um, uh, start a minister of women that was concerned with these issues, that was uh, work with the other ministry that uh, um, uh, think of LGBT issues or race issues. And I, I think that I have hope that 
maybe we uh, can change something now from uh, the future um, with this government uh, if they have um, uh, uh, they resist of this uh, any any group that against uh, this this government because we have a last uh, election that is very problematic election and uh, I have hope that this group this ministry this government uh, maybe can um, uh, make a difference today from future. I don't know if I answer your question. Sorry, I don't. Sorry, I was speaking it <laughs> up. <laughs> um, I have something else that um, I wanted to, uh, to ask you, but uh, I would like to ask some, you know, a, a question from the audience. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of SUS, SUS for women and reproductive policies? Yes, SUS uh, is our uh, health system that was uh, free from population in Brazil. And uh, also um, a system that is very important. If we have uh, uh, issues that is, uh, uh, I put uh, SUS or SUS in, a bad situation. We have uh, uh, a strong uh, health system. System, and from uh, women, from uh, protecting women, uh, women and reproductive rights, the uh, our um, health system help with uh, contracept contraception methods, and we have a program that uh, um, stay with a mother. Uh, since from con con conception uh, uh, until uh, giving birth, uh, until delivery, the uh, very important is the um, our old program that in the last um, government uh, this not is um, finished but uh, abandoned uh, from uh, uh, public uh, from the last government, and um, uh, we saw. Uh, some something that uh, something fight that we um, uh, we have victory kind of we have the last I think that it was about I don't know the name in English but uh, we call La Quiadura is kind of a, a, a contraception that was permanent for women and uh, 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 since. Uh, until uh, uh, yesterday, uh, women need to um, uh, approve of her, uh, uh, their husband or fathers to do this, this uh, uh, procedure. And uh, we, uh, today, we, uh, we can do that in the schools, in the hostels uh, for free. And uh, we also have, um, I think, uh, the last, the last that yes, what well, is about yesterday is uh, the this uh, judiciary system um, change the the rule that uh, physicians uh, in the past phys physicians can um, how can I say that. Um, uh, um, public or not? Uh, um, I sorry, my I don't know the the, the words, but uh, physicians could um, um, refer the people, the women that uh, was uh, uh, help uh, also because they uh, she they she made abortion. So uh, today, yesterday, or last week, this. This system, uh, system um, changed this situation. So, if if a woman made a abortion and uh, she uh, um, looking for a hospital to to uh, looking for treatment, the physicians don't uh, have any right to to. Um, hi, my I forgot the word. Sorry, uh, to not fight policies to this uh, uh, because this uh, situation. So the SUS, the our health system have uh, 
it's very strong to protecting women when we talk about reproductive rights. But in the last uh, four years, in the last government, these this public policies, this, these programs is kind of abandoned from government. And today uh, we, uh, uh, to say that um, we have hope that this uh, work again from, from women. Um, I think I think the audience is my my student Lisandra. <laughs> well, I, I propose students. I think this is an important question to ask, and I was curious to see. You know, you talk about se sexual education, but I was thinking about gender education, and particularly in an You know, you you teach philosophy. Yes. But then, you know, can easily make this part of uh, <laughs> of your. Um, <laughs> curriculum. So what's the situation for university, I mean, college education? Uh, are there gender studies departments? And, you know, what, um, what is, um, you know, is this subject, is this subject taught in, in the colleges? Yes, college, I mean, yes. LGBTQ, because... gender, sexuality, all of this. Yes, yes, we have a department or a research groups uh, that uh, study this subject. But um, mm, I think in the last eight, six, eight years, these people uh, uh, have fear to, to speak in, uh, in symposium because have a lot of cases of violence and uh, uh, people that have um, made um, intervention in this symposium. Kind of, if it, we we made a symposium like this in Brazil, we have a lot of uh, security methods to avoid this situation that happened a lot in Brazil. But we have a, a lot of people to study gender, LGBT, and uh, races, race issues, subject in Brazil, and uh, ha we have uh, people that have a strong research. But we, we suffer with this, this um, situation in Brazil. But in the school, it's an, it's, um, high school, other situation, but no other problem, because we need to um, work with fathers, uh, parents, but also uh, we have, uh, uh, we don't have high, uh, kind of uh, show, I don't have any document that uh, the school can use to guide this, this subject in for students, like uh, for gender, for sexual education, for LGBT. Uh, so uh, it's kind of a lack of uh, public policy or, or document that the schools can use to, to work with the subject. Okay, so, I mean inviting into the symposium you talked about the symposium and the threats and everything i mean it's a kind of a terrorism i mean it seems I mean, thank you so much for speaking oh, okay. in uh, our symposium but um you know we can offer our solidarity and thank you for the work that you're doing and also thank your students as well for uh being there and uh learning pass the words and the action on to others to try to change things. So thank you, really. I thank you. I thank you for inviting me again. So it's very, I'm very honored that speaking this symposium. And uh, I think uh, even we have this problem for me, it's very, very nice to stay here with you. Yeah, well, if there is anything that we can do <laughs> in uh, <laughs> collaboration, if there is any kind of a academic, virtual, online, solidarity yes, that we can for also sure, for sure. think of ways, digital yes. activism. Sorry, this connection is very important, yes. Yeah. <laughs> William, do you have? Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm so grateful for these um, connections and these possibilities and the way that um, you've offered a kind of insight into the situation, the context you're, you're coming from. And what that can inspire in the actions of similarly situated folks um, on this side uh, and kind of ways that those practices can be gleaned and um, honed and um, and and as you said, um, uh, you know, um, Wanda, the, the kind of solidaristic thinking that is possible because of 
um, these points of contact. So I just really, really appreciate your offering all of that to us under complex circumstances and making it available for kind of the ways that it could be taken up um, uh, here and, and beyond. So yeah, just really, really appreciated your, your, um, your expert insights today. Thank you. Thank you, William Wife. Thank you. Well, hopefully we'll be in touch maybe after this uh, yes, <laughs> please. this, this uh, symposium and uh, and then we I'd say that at this stage 328 we're probably ready to wrap um, the symposium and it was um, really a great ending and I think this year uh, in particular after <laughs> the you know reproductive issues have been at the center uh, also the idea of transnational as William was saying it's important for us to see yes. uh, that there are <clears throat> you know that there are things that we can um, uh, models that we can uh, uh, learn and compare and you know certainly uh, use um, you know over over here as well but um, so it's and that's why we you know that's why we have the symposium because I think often even in classrooms, the you know there's learning, but the idea that's you know when you have ten minutes, fifteen minutes, I mean to to share what what is it you want to say, and it's a fantastic um, platform for students and for everyone really to to have a window literally, <laughs> and actually again the silver lining of the pandemic that allowed us to connect in this way because we had thought of doing it but then the logistics are a problem obviously there are other types of um, <laughs> issues that happen with technology but ultimately we are here to resist we are here, we are here to fight on <laughs> not yeah. to go back only to no. go back to think about the work that has been done already and yes to, uh, to value that work and keep you know to, to keep going because it's you know we want to look back to understand but then we want to walk <laughs> the other direction with our yes. steps and yes. uh, and so this has been for me it's been a privilege and to have to to work with colleagues um william from the divinity school um has been an important um team player in, in this and um and it's beautiful to create a sense of community by doing this i i find so much pleasure and rewards in doing this as well because after all with all these issues that you know all the issues that are in the world that we hear about students fighting and then this is something that we need that solidarity and so i relish it and so thank you uh, Every thanks, many thanks, many thanks to the sponsors, to everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure. William, do you want to say <laughs> something? No, I, I I would just reiterate all of those points, so I so I won't step on it. But um, to say thank you to everyone, and now that these are uploaded on our end, that will be shortly, we'll be able to circulate them. So don't worry about the sort of disjointed. I maybe. Um, maybe there was just a, a connection issue there, but um, would be excited to pass along all of those comments to, to our networks here and look forward to many years to come. Yes. Yeah. Thank so. you. Thank you. <laughs> what, time is it there? what time is it there in Brazil now? Uh, uh, almost uh, five o'clock. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Not bad. Thank you, everyone, for, for being there, particularly those participants <laughs> were there. We uh, treasure you, and thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.